Judiciary Committee will please come to order, a quorum being present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Pursuant to Committee Rule 2 and House Rule 11, Clause 2, the chair may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment for which a recorded vote for the A's and A's are ordered. I'd like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating amendments, exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our markup today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your office, and we'll circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as possible. I would also ask all members, both those in person and those appearing remotely, to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. Pursuant to notice, I now, I now call up H.R. 6943, the Public Safety Officer Support Act of 2022, for purposes of markup and move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 6943, to amend the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Street. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. H.R. 6943, the Public Safety Officer Act of 2022 is bipartisan legislation that would expand eligibility for the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program to include stress and trauma-related injuries and death by suicide for law enforcement officers and their families. According to research from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, public safety officers are 25 times more likely to develop acute stress disorder post-traumatic stress disorder or other mental health conditions than the general public. Studies have shown that law enforcement officers could experience more traumatic events in six months than the average person will experience in a lifetime. The Public Safety Officers Benefits Program, or PSOB, provides death and education benefits to survivors of fallen law enforcement officers, firefighters, and other first responders, as well as disability benefits to officers catastrophically injured in the line of duty. Currently, the PSOB excludes from eligibility families of officers who die by suicide and does not deem PTSD and other trauma-related disorders to be line-of-duty injuries. This limitation not only fails to recognize that mental health is physical health, but it also prevents the federal government from providing support to officers who put their safety and well-being on the line every day for the communities they serve. The Public Safety Officer Support Act would right past wrongs and ensure that families of, dis of police officers and first responders receive critical financial assistance as they grieve the loss of their loved ones. It would also ensure that officers who are disabled as a result of traumatic events receive the support and care that they need. This legislation would also bring the PSOB program into alignment with the provision of federal military death benefits for the families of military service members who die by suicide. The need for this worthy and overdue change is even more apparent as we continue to grieve the tragic loss of four police officers who died by suicide after responding to the attacks on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. In addition to expanding eligibility for death and disability benefits to officers and their families, this bill would require GAO to study benefits provided under the expansion. This report will help us better understand the prevalence of traumatic events that law enforcement officers, first responders, and other public safety officers face, and the need to further support their mental health needs. I need to thank Representatives Trone and Reschenthaler for introducing this important bipartisan legislation and for their continued support for public safety officers serving communities across the country. This bill is broadly supported by both mental health and law enforcement groups, and I urge all of my colleagues to support it. Before I yield back, Without objection, I will enter letters of support into the record from the National Association of Police Organizations, the National Fraternal Order of Police, the National Association of Attorneys General, the Sergeant's Benevolent Association, and the Major Cities Chiefs Association. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our federal, state, and local public safety officers work tirelessly every day to protect us and keep our communities safe. Law enforcement officers, firefighters, emergency medical personnel, and corrections officers frequently respond to dangerous, stressful, and traumatic situations. Studies show that the public safety officers are over 25 times more likely to develop PTSD 
as compared to the general public. Tragically, more public safety officers die by suicide every year than those who lose their lives in the line of duty. The Justice Department runs the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program, which provides death, disability, and education benefits to public safety officers and their family members. The PSOB program provides financial assistance to the family members of public safety officers who die in the line of duty. The PSOB program also offers disability benefits to public safety officers who become totally and permanently disabled. However, the PSOB program doesn't currently offer death benefits to public safety officers who tragically take their lives as a result of PTSD, acute stress disorder, or other stress and trauma related disorders. PSOB program does not currently offer any disability benefits for public safety officers who are totally and permanently disabled as a result of attempted suicide, PTSD, acute stress disorder, or other types of stress and trauma-related disorders. This bill would improve the PSOB program to provide those meaningful benefits for our public service officers and officially recognize the toll these emotional injuries can have on our men and women in uniform. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back without objection. All other opening statements will be included in the record. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6943, offered by Mr. Nadler. Strike all after the enacting Without clause. objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will now recognize myself to explain the amendment. This amendment in the nature of a substitute makes several minor but important changes to the underlying bill. First, it improves the ability for the changes to the PSOB program to be implemented quickly without a lengthy regulatory process. Secondly, it includes changes requested by the Department of Justice to improve the, admi administra the administrability of the legislation and to align the bill text with the existing language of the PSOB statute. Lastly, the ANS defines additional terms and makes various technical and conforming changes. I urge all members to support the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Ms. German. Would, for what purpose does Ms. Jackson Lee seek recognition? To strike the last word. And ladies recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the ranking member. H.R. 6943, the Bipartisan Public Safety Officer Support Act, would expand the Public Safety Officer Benefits Program to include death benefits for the families of officers who die by suicide and disability benefits for officers suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and other trauma-related disorders. As we approach Police Week, in which we honor our police, and as we honor our public safety officers, firefighters, and others over the years, this is a very important initiative. As someone who went through 9-11 both in uh, this space in the United States Capitol, and also in my visits uh, to Ground Zero, uh, and knowing the stories of public safety officers, police, and fire, and the stress, uh, in the burden, and the violence that they saw in the loss of life. This is legislation long overdue. The Public Safety Officer Benefits Program is an important initiative within the Department of Justice that provides financial support to officers who are injured while serving their communities in line of duty and to families of officers killed in the line of duty, all of whom we offer our deepest sympathy. In 2017, the Department of Justice approved 481 PSOB claims, but not a single claim for over 240 public safety officers who died by suicide. Unfortunately, the PSOB program does not currently cover injury or death caused by trauma and or mental illness, although public safety officers are disproportionately ex exposed to dramatic events. Research shows that law enforcement officers are called to the scene of roughly 140 traumatic incidents over the course of their careers. The resulting rates of PTSD and depression among police officers and firefighters are unsurprisingly five times higher than among the civilian population. While we have known for some time that law enforcement officers are more likely to die by suicide than by traffic accidents and shootings combined, Officer suicides have increased over the last two years. Sadly, several examples come to mind, including Amanda Crota, a Harris County deputy with the Harris County Sheriff's Office in Houston, who died in January after shooting herself. Two deputies in St. Lucie County, Florida, who both died by suicide days apart, leaving behind their one-month-old son and four police officers of the Capitol Police and Washington Metropolitan Police Departments 
who died by suicide after fighting valiantly to protect members of Congress and preserve the rule of law from January 6, 2021. The death of Washington Metropolitan Police Officer Jeffrey Smith, who died by suicide nine days after confronting the mob on January 6, was the direct result of an injury he sustained during the riot as determined by the Police and Firefighters Retirement uh, and Relief Board. Although Officer Smith's widow can recover 100% of her husband's salary instead of just 33%, she is likely barred from receiving any benefit from the PSOB program under current law, as is the widow of Capitol Police Officer Howard Liebengood, who also died by suicide following the January 6th attack. The failure to provide PSOB benefits to officers and their families, like the widows of Officers Smith and Liebengood, is a deeply troubling limitation on federal support for first responders and their families that must be rectified. I would also point out that the exclusion of suicide and mental illness from the PSOB program is drastically different from the United States military policy, where suicides are presumed to be line of duty death caused by post-traumatic stress, brain injuries, and other deployment hazards. This presumption has yielded full military benefits for families in upwards of 90% of military deaths by suicide. It is time for the federal government to similarly support public safety officers suffering from trauma-related injuries and their families. Uh, expansion of the PSOB program would provide crucial financial support to families grieving the devastating loss of a loved one, including the families of the four police officers who died by suicide after responding to the attack on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. H.R. 6943 would correct a historic wrong by recognizing the impact of PTSD and other stress disorders on our public safety officers and expanding the eligibility of the PSOB program to include trauma-related injuries and death by suicide. I thank Representative David Trone uh, and Guy Rushenthaler for introducing this thoughtful bipartisan legislation. I'm glad to be a co-sponsor, and I urge my colleagues to join me in support of this bill. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. The lady yields back for purposes. The gentleman from Ohio seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. I reserve the point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 6943. Would, would that objection, the amendment is considered as read. And the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I support the underlying bill. Um, I do believe that uh, this amendment would make it a better bill. Um, being a police officer is a difficult and dangerous job, I think, as we all know. Uh, and it's also essential to maintaining a civil society a fact that's long been recognized by this committee and by Congress. Back in 1968, Congress authorized the creation of the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program that we're discussing uh, relative to this bill, uh, which provides death and education benefits to police officers and their families when an officer is injured or killed in the line of duty. Over the years, this program has provided over $2 billion in benefits to disabled or fallen officers or their families. It's a great program that recognizes how valuable and essential our police officers are to our society. However, as our population ages, more and more police officers are obviously retiring with many years left uh, in many cases to contribute uh, to society. Oftentimes, those retired officers continue to serve their communities in a similar capacity as they had as a police officer. They may not be on the the same police force they were, but they're still in essentially a law enforcement uh, capacity. They work as school resource officers. Uh, they provide uh, security at hospitals and office buildings, uh, other places of employment and neighborhoods, apartment buildings, uh, and sometimes they protect our nation's uh, small businesses. Um, and we were all tragically reminded uh, of this and how dangerous it can be, whether you're uh, on an official police department or whether you're in essentially private security, having retired as a police officer. Uh, we were re reminded of this when retired police officer, uh, Captain uh, David Dorn, uh, whose uh, photograph uh, so here is behind me, uh, was murdered uh, in St. Louis during the riots that followed uh, George Floyd's murder uh, back in 2020. So this was only uh, two years ago or so. Uh, Captain Dorn uh, was 77 years old at the time. Um, he had served as a police officer for 38 years, and he was responding to a tripped alarm 
uh, when he was shot and killed. He also, a father of five children, uh, 10 grandchildren, and is truly missed. According to his family and colleagues, he dedicated his professional career to helping at-risk youth and trying to mentor and steer them in a positive direction. By all accounts, Captain Dorn was exactly the type of person that we want to be in law enforcement and that we'd like to have keeping us safe after they were retired in another law enforcement capacity, as he was doing. And yet, even though he died serving the community he loved, Captain Dorn's family was not entitled to benefits under the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program because, as I said, he had retired from the police force and was working uh, in the private sector and in security, essentially law enforcement, when he was killed. Mr. Chairman, precluding Captain Doran's family from receiving such benefits doesn't seem fair or equitable. It just doesn't seem right. Uh, we have the power, this committee, this Congress, and frankly, I believe the responsibility to change the law and make other families of deceased police officers receive help, have them eligible for it. My amendment is fairly straightforward. It would amend the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program to make eligible for benefits retired officers who are killed in public or private security roles. To be eligible, the retired officer must have left the police service in good standing, uh, and he must also have been injured or killed while actively protecting a community, a business, a school, a neighborhood, or some similar entity in a paid security role. Look, we have thousands of dedicated police officers who are near retirement or have recently retired. And those officers have been trained with taxpayer dollars and many want to continue to serve those communities all across the country that we love. Uh, making the common sense change that my amendment proposes will encourage more dedicated and properly trained police officers to do just that, which will ultimately make our communities safer. I would urge my colleagues to support this common sense and even-handed amendment, and uh, with that, I yield back. Will the gentleman yield to a quick question? Yes, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, thank, I thank the gentleman. Um, so I, I understand the uh, example you use, and it, I understand the intention of this, but if, if in Section 2, it says, was engaged in a public or private security employment obligation at such time, so that would require a, a coverage of, I presume, thousands of people employed by private security agencies. I just wonder if you have any sense of what that number is, what the cost is. You know, there are some private security agencies that are very careful about the way they train people and hire them, and there are others that aren't. So I, I just wondered, you know, how big is this exemption? Well, my time has expired, but re reclaiming what time I don't have left, um, we can obviously, before we get to the floor, determine exactly what that number uh, would be. Um, these people do have to have been in good standing and, and that sort of thing when they uh, retire. Uh, they can't have a spotted record, et cetera, and it's pretty clear in the, uh, leg in the uh, amendment that I've offered. But I think the gentleman makes a good point, and I think that's something, uh, before we get to the floor, that we could determine exactly what the number is. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. Point of order is withdrawn. Uh, l l let, me, let me just say that uh, this, this amendment seems to... Uh, uh, in, in, to, to um, implicate a substantial expansion of the program, uh, no longer just to uh, uh, peace officers, but to private citizens who were peace officers. And while that seems to be a worthy objective, uh, uh, we, have to study, we have to study it further to see if, we, if this is doable. So if the gentleman will withdraw the uh, amendment, we'll work with him with a view toward um, seeing if we can do this uh, before the floor. I, I'd be willing, uh, the gentleman assures me that we'll work before we get to the Absolutely. floor. Absolutely. If so, I'd be happy to withdraw with that understanding. Thank you. The amendment is withdrawn. Does anyone? Does, the amendment is withdrawn. For what purpose does Ms. Dean seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. General ladies recognized. I will be brief to say uh, I rise in support of the Public Safety Officer Support Act of 2022, and I thank Representatives Trone and Rushenthaler for bringing it forward. Uh, and I just want to mention uh, that we need to be sure that we layer this support for police and safety officers with other support that we've had the chance uh, to work on uh, in this committee, which I thank you for, uh, and pass. Just last session, 
uh, we passed the Stoic Act, which was signed into law by the previous uh, administration, by the previous president. Uh, I worked on that with uh, Guy Rushenthaler. And the Stoic Act is for grants to police departments to deal with uh, the trauma uh, that is uh, suffered by uh, police officers. So I thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this up. I look forward to this passing so that we can continue to support public safety officers, police and safety officers, uh, as Congress should. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back for what purposes, Mr. Buxy recognition. Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. M Mr. Uh, Chairman, I wish uh, to ask a couple questions about this, if I may, um, in good faith. I'm not trying to be obstructive at all, and I absolutely uh, support law enforcement and, and support the idea behind this bill. I'm just wondering what the federal nexus is for legislation that assists local police departments with issues such as PTSD and uh, other very serious uh, issues like that. Well, we, uh, the gentleman will yield? Yeah, I yield, yes. We, we uh, have uh, grant programs to assist uh, local agencies uh, with all sorts of things, including, uh, including public safety and including police right now. And this is just a, this is this this seems to be a, a just an amendment of, uh, of of existing programs in effect. Uh, I, reclaiming my time and asking, I guess, another question: Is is there a, a finding out there that there is a lack of funding in local police departments to cover this kind of uh, issue? Yeah, I, you might be talking about uh, another bill. This has been in place since uh, since 1975. Since 1975? Uh, 76. This program has been in effect since 1976. And it's given out nearly two billion dollars. So I, I don't understand the. Okay, so this is this is an existing program. Yes. And and what are we doing to the existing program with this bill? Well, if the gentleman would yield, we're expanding. We're expanding it. Uh, we're, expa we're, we're, we're expanding eligibility to officers who have committed uh, suicide or suffer from uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Okay, I, I would yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. Uh, I thank the gentleman, and it does I, it it does sort of put a fine point on this. I, some have made reference to the January 6 uh, mob and the uh, handful of officers that suffered, uh, or that uh, one in particular who I, I know committed. Suicide. Subsequently, uh, I, I, I've got in front of me uh, articles from <clears throat> Minnesota journals who say that um, that there's a just a massive increase in uh, disability retirement based on uh, applications based on PTSD in Minnesota. Uh, in fact, the number of Minnesota police officers and firefighters applying for disability retirement tripled in the past fiscal year. So that's three times. And we're seeing a, a, a um, you know a tremendous amount of this, uh, and I, I don't think we have any choice, frankly, but to support the the amendment being offered. But it is a massive expansion of the program, and in fact, the what is most interesting about it, from the point of view of sort of the workers' compensation system uh, typical regime, is this expansion has a couple layers of presumptions of compensability. Usually there's a requirement for any kind of condition that is compensated under a workers' compensation type program to have, um, a, you know, a showing that the, the condition and the consequence were in the course and scope of employment. It was, you know, they, that has to be proved by the claimant. Here, if there's a, if there's... Would the gentleman yes, yield? I, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll yield back. I, let me just, just say, Just Mr. for Chair. one second. What you just said is exactly what's contained in this bill. Yes, sir. I, well, no, I, they're, 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 they're presumed compensable here. They're, they're very, and, they're, and that's, it's going to be a, a, a tremendous potential financial impact. Um, I think we, again, I think we have to do it because I think a lot of this flows from the advocacy of defunding police and the disorder that's resulted and all the violence that's resulted from that. But it is an, an enormous cost for citizens to bear. And I think Mr. Buck's question is, is correct. And we ought to have some discussion about how expansive this change is to the pre-existing program, which was limited previously to uh, officers killed in the line of duty, state and federal, and, uh, and more recently, a, a uh, 
a disability, per, total and permanent disability resulting from such a catastrophic physical injury. Going out to PTSD and, a, and ASD from uh, disturbing events and then presuming the compensability thereof without showing that it, that it you know, without proof that it resulted from the, the, uh, a triggering event in law enforcement activity uh, or, or that the disability resulted from the PTSD. Both of those are presumed. Uh, Gentlemen, you? Yes, I yield back to Mr. Buck. It does say that uh, uh, it says it, it re relies on a presumption. If you look at page uh, 7, uh, starting at line 7, a public safety officer shall be presumed to have died or become per permanently and totally disabled uh, within the meaning of subsection A or B as the direct and proximate result of a personal injury sustained in the line of duty. Y yes, Mr. Chairman. The point is they are being presumed, they are not, not being shown to have been the result, the direct and proximate result. They don't have to prove that for their claim, which is the basic workers' compensation approach. It is now presumed that they are compensable. And in order not to uh, fund the claim, the authority, the, the board has to prove by clear and convincing evidence that it was not connected. I simply say that the U.S. Uh, military has this, ex this, this system in place already. Who else seek, who's, for what purpose does, Ms., uh, does the gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? I, I yield to, back. I move to strike the last word. G gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this important bipartisan bill to markup today. We all know that public uh, safety officers like police officers, EMTs, and firefighters are often exposed to extremely traumatic and dangerous events in their lines of work and face serious physical and mental health consequences as a result. Their work is essential to our country, and these public servants deserve compensation and support when their work exposes them to traumatic and difficult situations that take a toll on their mental health. And their families, in the tragic case of their deaths, do not deserve to be left behind. This bipartisan legislation would expand the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program to include coverage for public safety officers who die by suicide or are disabled due to the result of traumatic experiences and their families in the case of their deaths. I support this important legislation. Thank uh, the lead sponsors, Guy Rosenthal and David Trone. I'm happy to be a co-sponsor and urge my colleagues all to support this measure today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes does Mr. Big seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Uh, with that, uh, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I appreciate it. I, I, I want to avoid talking about the next bill, too. So I'm going to kind of marry them because they both have the same thematic uh, to it. And I'm going to marry them if they consented. <laughs> 6943 and 2992. So, so my question is on both of these uh, is, is really simple. I, I mean, I get what we're trying to do here. We're trying to expand benefits to, to uh, officers who've, who've suffered PTSD or, or, com or commit suicide uh, as, as a result um, of PTSD suffered in the line of, of their service. Um, my, my question uh, is, is this, and, and I appreciate the, the comments of, of Mr. Buck and, and um, Mr. Bishop, but my, my question is this, are we doing anything more to, to, to prevent or to, um, to prevent suicide or to, or to treat PTSD? And, and this federalization of this is, is interesting to me, but, but uh, for instance, with regard to veterans, we know that there, there are real world studies, uh, extensive studies that, for instance, on, on traumatic brain injury, which we're gonna talk about in 2992 uh, coming up, that uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is extremely helpful in healing uh, not only not only TBI but also PTSD, um, and yet our our veterans. The gentleman will yield. Y yeah, I yield, Mr. Chairman. Well, this bill has a uh, provision for a study of PTSD and other uh, uh, trauma-related. Um, right, and uh, and reclaiming my time, I appreciate that. But will you have studied this to death, literally to death? There are real studies out there. The Veterans Administration still considers HBOT to be a, an experimental uh, and requires exceptional uh, approval. And, and I, my point is, we should not be studying that. It's been studied, it's been proven to be effective in both PTSD and uh, TBI uh, uh, injuries, related injuries. We should be saying, well, we, we encourage HBOT 
treatment to be funded both uh, at the state and local level, and where necessary, perhaps the federal government uh, can assist. We should be doing that not just for for veterans, but also for first responders. That's that's my point here. Is we we're, we're, we are treating us we're, we're treating a symptom where what we should should be doing is trying to uh, fix this ahead of time, and that's that's part of the problem with this entire bill. The the other thing is um, we we don't have actual numbers, in my opinion, from CBO. I'd like to know what this looks like. I mean, just like with with Mr. Shabbat's uh, proposed amendment, it would be interesting to see how this expansive uh, his amendment would do, uh, what it would, the impacts that would have on us as well. Um, I would also point out, uh, or, or I would, I guess I'll query this, uh, Mr. Chairman. Does this include border patrol agents? Does this include border patrol agents? I, I would assume so. I mean, I, I'm, I've got the definition of public safety. Is the gentleman officer. yield? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it does include the Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Because recently uh, in, in our Border Patrol, the, we've seen a spike in, in um, suicides, including one suicide where the uh, rationale given by uh, the, the, the agent who committed suicide was that um, they could not take the lack of support any, any, any further and feeling absolutely over, overrun and devalued both as an agent and a human being because of the condition on the border. I think we need to maybe look at some of those aspects of this as well to say, what can we do to, to facilitate and support um, our, our uh, police officers as well as our, you know, in this Is the gentleman real? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the extent that you're talking about um, how to aid those police officers, that's the subject of this bill. Uh, to the extent you're talking about the, the, the causes of, of their uh, trauma, that's not within the jurisdiction so, of this committee. So reclaiming my time, that's my point. Um, you're, you're, you're providing post relief, and I'm suggesting we need to be providing um, some kind of uh, prophylactic to, to stop this, both on a policy policy point of view, but also in and providing and su mm -hmm. providing support, counseling, etc. That would be uh, beneficial to these these uh, first responders. There are, we, if the gentleman would yield, I, well, I, I'm expired. My time is expired. If well, you I'll, I'll answer the question anyway. <laughs> um, uh, we agree, and there are many uh, Department of Justice grants uh, that are available for this purpose. Uh, who else seeks recognition? I do, Mr. Chairman. Who? For what purpose does Mr. McClintock seek the recognition? Uh, to speak on the motion. Strike the, the gentleman's recognition. Motion. Which uh, motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I certainly support the bill. I think the stunningly disproportionate number of suicides uh, among law enforcement officials speaks for itself. But I do want to raise one concern that we might want to consider as this bill progresses. Life insurance policies uh, normally do not include suicide for a very simple reason. Someone in desperate circumstances might be tipped to commit suicide in order to uh, secure benefits for his family. I do think we need to give some consideration to the possibility that we're creating a perverse incentive that, uh, that might end up producing more suicides. I think Mr. Biggs' uh, suggestion that perhaps we ought to consider at the same time enhanced psychological counseling um, it might be something to pursue. I think also uh, Mr. Buck raises an important point. Law enforcement is uniquely and quintessentially a local concern, and at some point I think we need to reconsider how much the federal government should be underwriting and managing local law enforcement agencies. Uh, but with that said, I, I certainly support the bill, but we do need to consider some of the unintended consequences it may be producing. Does the gentleman yield back? Who else seeks recognition? I do, Mr. Chairman. Move to strike the last word. Mr. Bishop seek recognition? Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And not to put too fine a point on it, but just to make sure, and again, support the bill, I think we have to, but uh, there is 
a side to this that's uh, troubling in terms of uh, the expansiveness of the financial obligation undertaken and what and, and maybe a moral hazard that is to say um, what we may be creating and have created some about the uh, the politics of some that have uh, facilitated or given license to a far more disorderly environment on our streets that's seeing a rise in crime we've talked about that before uh, 30% increase in homicides. It's, it's part of the same phenomenon. Uh, and I'm going to ask a unanimous consent at the end to, to submit a couple of articles that I've got in front of me, but one from the Minneapolis Star Tribune from uh, uh, April 2 begins this way. Hundreds of police officers in Min Minnesota diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder have severed ties with their departments in the last two years, resulting in millions of dollars in payouts through workers' compensation settlements and state disability pensions. The issue is most acute in Minneapolis, where the city has paid out more than $22 million in workers' comp to about 130 officers for PTSD-related claims since the police murder of George Floyd in 2020, according to a Star Tribune review of City Council minutes. Um, the bill that we have before us, to the point about the presumptions, um, if someone has a diagnosed condition of PTSD, the, there, uh, any suicide that occurs or any alleged total and permanent disability, both are presumed to result from the PTSD. But if they have a PTSD condition that is not diagnosed, for which they've reached out to an employee assistance program or, um, or uh, sought uh, help from, or treatment or diagnosis, so if they've, basically if they've communicated to anybody thinking they may have PTSD, they're whatever they claim to suffer is going to be presumed covered here. Consider the fact that we've seen a wave of police retirement, police force retirements under the conditions that law enforcement officers are now required to face. Recognize that if you have a presumed, and in fact this article goes on that I was making reference to, talking about the fact that it is this, this system would be susceptible to for, uh, claims that are not well grounded. Uh, in, very readily, uh, and so that we're unfortunately created. There's a creation of a problem to which we must respond for the legitimate claims that are multiplying, but there also is an, an open-ended expansion that will extend to claims that are not particularly legitimate, cannot be legitimate or uh, well contested, that may result really from the conditions that law enforcement officers are placed under to have nothing to do with the a stress-causing or, or PTSD-causing event, but the, the fact that they're systematically not respected and not protected in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in carrying out their duties. So we are going to see it. It's going to be a massive yawning liability now for the federal government on top of the state and local exposures that you're seeing in these articles. So I'd finish by asking for unanimous consent, uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, submit the article I referred to from the Minneapolis Star Tribune, as well as, bear with me just one second, as well as uh, another article from the Minnesota Reformer on the same subject matter titled, City Save Police, PTSD Disability Claims Are Fiscally Unsustainable, dated August 17, 2021. Without objection. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does any, who else seeks recognition? For what purpose does Mr. Gomez seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, and I, I really appreciate the spirit in which uh, this bill is proposed and uh, the, the kind of things about law enforcement said on both sides of the aisle. Um, this is more of, and I know it's not the intent, but more of federalized creep into state and local law enforcement control. We saw during the Obama administration uh, a lot of lawsuits against uh, local police departments uh, with the sue and settle technique of, you know, having them subjugate control to the federal government. And so with, with this bill that uh, really seeks to deal with a problem that has been faced uh, in so many state and law enforcement uh, and local law enforcement. Uh, here again, uh, it, I just 
in my 17 and a half years in Congress have not seen us provide money that doesn't eventually, if not already, have strings that uh, you have to meet in order to be part of the payouts that would come from the federal government. And uh, uh, Mr. Bishop brings up a, a very important point, especially from Minneapolis with all the troubles and, and the um, screaming anger that came at uh, police in that area. Uh, that is something that needs to be looked at and what role can we play in calming people's attacks uh, verbally and physically on law enforcement and the efforts that were made to defund the police around the country. Uh, so there's a lot at stake here and I do think it's worth looking at uh, maybe having a legislative hearing so that we make sure we're not going to incentivize problems instead of helping people deal with them before they get to the ultimate, um, not solution, but termination in suicide. Um, the, the chair makes a point that uh, we do this for the military, and of course the military is uh, our national military, and as we should, but then again, I know it's not our jurisdiction, but uh, that is something that ought to be looked at as well. What is bringing about the massive number of suicides by our military and our uh, veterans and law enforcement now uh, heading that direction? So I, I wish there were more research that's done so that we don't, with the best of intentions, end up incentivizing the ultimate solution that's not a solution at all. It creates more problems than it could ever solve. So, uh, I, again, I, I really like it when we can get along and uh, have similar concerns, but I, I just feel like perhaps this may be premature till we look at the effects that this bill might have and get testimony from people that could could give that and provide that. And so anyway, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the um, mentality and the grace with which it's brought. Just wish we could uh, look further into it and yield back. Gentleman yields back for our purposes, Mr. Jones, seek recognition. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, this has been a very illuminating discussion this morning. Uh, to summarize, I think what we've heard from our Republican colleagues uh, is that they do not actually want to support this legislation, but they are concerned that their supporters in law enforcement would be upset if they didn't vote for it. Uh, will the gentleman yield? No. Well, I, you didn't I, hear that I, from I, me. I, I will not. I will not, sir. Uh, it is disappointing to me that some of my Republican colleagues are standing in the way of this common sense, critical, bipartisan legislation to support first responders who struggle with the mental health consequences of their sacrifices. They talk a big game about support for law enforcement, but when it comes time to put their money where their mouths are, they suddenly find an excuse to raise issue. It is the same story we heard after January 6th when Republicans abandoned and even demonized the law enforcement officers to jeopardize their lives just to save ours. So again, I'm proud to support this legislation and I hope that my Republican colleagues can find the courage and the compassion to find a way to join my Democratic colleagues. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. If, if no one seeks recognition, the question occurs on the- Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Uh, Deming seeks recognition. For what purpose does, uh, does Ms. Deming seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, for your support of the Public Safety Officers Supplement Act. Um, colleagues and Mr. Chairman, this is one of those opportunities, although we have many, where we can come together uh, on behalf of those who protect and serve us. Um, this is one of those opportunities that I am sure that we all should be proud of to support. No, the legislation is not perfect, it never is. But today we can come together and get this legislation done. This week um, is police week. Uh, when we come together to honor the men and women all over our great nation who have paid the ultimate uh, sacrifice. Uh, as members of Congress, we give some every day but these men and women, as you all know, have given their all. There's a total of roughly 22,000 names on our law enforcement wall. The first was added, uh, history indicates, in 1786. Our officers have always needed our support. It didn't just start this year or last year or, or a decade ago. They have always needed us to help them have the tools to keep them safe mentally, physically, and keep them whole spiritually. Uh, the stress, the dangers of the job running towards things that we have the luxury of running away from. Uh, my colleagues, I thank you uh, so much for uh, working to make sure that we get this legislation done, to give the tools to our officers to help them uh, survive. Public safety, I've heard it said, is a local issue. Well, that's not the whole truth. Um, public safety is a local, state, and national issue. And when we look at police departments all over our nation, some are as little as 10, 10 persons. We know some have tens of thousands of officers. And so it, it is incumbent on us as the federal government to many times step in for the agencies that cannot do it on their own or by themselves to help to them to be able to protect us as we work together to protect them. So Mr. Chairman and my colleagues who are supporting this legislation without a uh, reservation, I want to thank you as we recognize um, Police Week uh, this week. Thank you for your support. I'm proud to support this legislation. And I thank those of you who are proud to support it as well. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? If not, uh, the question occurs on the amendment the nature of a substitute. Uh, this will be followed immediately by a vote on final, final passage of the bill. All those in favor respond by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment the nature of a substitute is agreed to. Reporting quorum being present, the question is on the motion to report the bill H.R. 6943 is, uh, favorably to the House, as amended favorably to the House. Those in favor respond by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, aye. no. Aye. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered to report it favorably. Uh, the clerk, uh, the ayes, uh, the ayes have it, and the bill is reported favorably, is ordered reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute, including uh, incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 2992, the Traumatic Brain Injury and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Law Enforcement Training Act for purposes of markup, and move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 2992 to, to direct the Attorney General to develop. That objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I will begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. H.R. 2992, the TBI and PTSD Law Enforcement Training Act, is bipartisan legislation that would require the Department of Justice to develop crisis intervention training tools for law enforcement agencies so that they can better equip officers to respond to individuals with traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress disorder. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, between 3.2 million and 5.3 million people live with a TBI-related disability in the United States. 
and the approximately 7% of Americans will experience post-traumatic stress disorder at some point in their lives. TBI and PTSD are especially common among veterans and service members. Despite the prevalence of TBI and PTSD, many law enforcement officers and other first responders are not adequately trained on how to identify their symptoms. Since many symptoms of TBI and PTSD can be mistaken for intoxication or even aggression, such as confusion, impaired thinking, or irritability, law enforcement can misinterpret the behavior of someone exhibiting these symptoms with sometimes deadly consequences for first responders and the people they encounter. This legislation would help ensure that officers are trained to identify symptoms of TBI and PTSD in order to respond appropriately to crisis calls and to divert individuals towards mental health care and treatment and away from the criminal justice system. Through the Bureau of Justice Assistance, agencies have access to training and resources from the Police Mental Health Collaboration Toolkit. H.R. 2992 would enhance the existing program to include crisis intervention training on recognizing the signs of TBI and PTSD and responding to individuals in crisis. The bill also requires the CDC to study occurrences of concussion and TBI among law enforcement officers and first responders. I thank Re Representatives Pascrell, Bacon, and Rutherford, along with our colleague Representative Demings, for their decision to law enforce for their dedication to law enforcement, first responders, and the citizens they serve. This important bipartisan legislation is broadly supported by numerous law enforcement and mental health organizations and would help protect the lives of first responders and the people they, can, they encounter. I urge all of my colleagues to support it. Before I yield back, without objection, I will enter letters of support into the record from the National Association of Police Organizations, the National Fraternal Order of Police, the Sergeants Benevolent Association, and the Major Cities Chiefs Association. I now recognize the, general, the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Law enforcement officers are under immense pressure as they face more and more criminal activity with fewer and fewer resources. Officers are called on to respond to high-stress situations involving people who are in extreme emotional or altered mental states. This bill will help law enforcement to better understand and interact with individuals experiencing traumatic brain injuries or post-traumatic stress disorder. While traumatic brain injuries affect people of all ages and backgrounds, data suggests that there is a higher prevalence among certain groups, including veterans, the homeless, and those who have been incarcerated. Individuals in these groups are more likely to have encounters with law enforcement. Studies have shown that it is often difficult for law enforcement officers to differentiate between those suffering from brain injuries or PTSD and those who are intoxicated by alcohol or drugs. For example, common signs of intoxication, such as slurred speech, outbursts of anger, slow response times, and forgetfulness, can also be signs of traumatic brain injury. Training officers to recognize the difference between traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress in, uh, disorder and intoxication can lead to more favorable outcomes for the officers and the individuals they encounter. This bill will require the Bureau of Justice Assistance to develop training that will help officers on what type of treatment and resources the individual may need. For individuals suffering from uh, traumatic brain injury, medical referrals may also uh, may be most appropriate. For intoxicated individuals, referral to substance abuse professionals may also be the most appropriate course. This training will promote the safety of our men and women in uniform and improve public safety in our communities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is good legislation. I yield back. The gentleman yields back without objection. All other opening statements will be included in the record. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2992, offered by Mr. That objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will recognize myself to explain the amendment. This amendment in the nature of a substitute makes minor technical and conforming changes to the original bill text as introduced and extends the appropriations authorization period to four years. It also ensures that this important training program can be, can be carried out upon enactment. Otherwise, it does not change the substance of the bill in any way. I urge members, all members to support the amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? For what purpose does the gentlelady from uh, Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. This is a very important bill, and it is a very important recognition of a tragic uh, set of circumstances uh, that are 
facing our very brave law enforcement across America. As I've indicated, uh, as we approach uh, police week, we honor our police officers across the nation. Uh, it is important uh, to likewise recognize uh, what they face. H.R. 2992, the Bipartisan TBI and PTSD Law Enforcement Training Act, we require the Bureau of Justice Assistance to develop training for law enforcement officers on how best to respond to crisis calls involving individuals suffering from the effects of traumatic brain injuries and post-traumatic stress disorder. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, there were approximately 2.9 million TBI-related emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths in the United States in 2014, and TBIs were identified in 25% of all injury-related deaths in 2017. More than 430,000 U.S. service members were diagnosed with a TBI between the year 2000 and 2020. With the pre uh, prevalence of TBI and PTSD among the general population, and particularly among uh, military service members, there is a need to increase training for law enforcement officers to recognize the unique challenges of TBI, PTSD, and more effectively respond to crisis calls. We want to save lives, save lives of those young military officers and others who are facing challenging mental health concerns, and save the lives of our law enforcement. Some of the most devastating calls of those where our officers may be untrained have to deal with these very tragic cases, of course. We know that when we were working on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, this was very much a part of that effort to help police officers. TBI and PTSD can have a significant impact on an individual's ability to make decisions, control impulses, or think clearly. Many of the symptoms of TBI and PTSD, such as confusion, inability to follow directions, and impaired thinking or memory can be misinterpreted or mistaken for intoxication. Any individuals uh, who suffer from TBI or PTSD may also appear agitated or exhibit impaired emotional functioning, which can be misunderstood as aggression. These impairments can impede proper communication and cause interactions between law enforcement and civilians to escalate posing potential safety risks to both parties, as I said, when officers are not trained to recognize the signs and symptoms. Take, for instance, Army veteran Irene Chavez, who died by suicide in December of last year while in the custody of Chicago police officers after repeatedly telling officers she was experiencing the effects of PTSD and needed to see a therapist. Or uh, Stephen Haskins, a veteran of the war in Iraq, being treated for PTSD, who was shot by Orlando police officers when they responded to a call that Mr. Haskins was causing a disturbance at his apartment complex. Thankfully, Mr. Haskins survived. Both instances could have led to better outcomes if the officers involved had known, one, how to recognize these individuals were in crisis and suffering from the effects of traumatic events, the best forms of interaction with them, and how to maximize officer and subject safety. Let it be known, as I speak to my police departments, uh, in my community, that families call police persons uh, when there are no additional resources to come and help. This training will be crucial and life-saving for those officers making those calls. H.R. 2992 will require DOJ through the Bureau of Justice Assistance to solicit best practices related to recognizing and responding to individuals with TBI and PTSD and to develop crisis intervention training tools for law enforcement agencies to better respond to these potentially catastrophic encounters. This legislation would incorporate TBI and PTSD training once developed into the existing police mental health collaboration toolkit, a proven no-cost online resource for law enforcement agencies made available by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. A subcommittee on crime, terrorism, homeland security views these uh, cases as deserving attention. It would further require the Centers for Disease Control uh, and prevention to study and understand the prevalence of concussions, traumatic brain injury, specifically among law enforcement officers and first responders. Recognizing that crisis intervention training programs have yielded significant benefits for law enforcement agencies, including limiting the need for high levels of police intervention, reducing officer injuries, and redirecting uh, people in a crisis away from the criminal justice system and toward mental health services. This legislation will also build upon existing best practices to provide uh, officers through law enforcement mental health learning sites, additional tools they need to continue to save lives. I commend Representative Bill Prescrell, Don Bacon, John Rutherford, and our colleague led uh, Representative Val Demings for her leadership for introducing this critical bipartisan legislation. Glad to be a co-sponsor and urge my colleagues 
to join me in support of this legislation. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back as support of this legislation. The gentlelady yields back, uh, who seeks recognition. For our purposes, Ms. Ross seek recognition. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, traumatic brain injuries, injuries and post-traumatic stress disorder are serious conditions that can have lifelong consequences. These conditions are particularly common among members of the US military who put their lives on the line to protect our country. Between 2000 and 2014, over 40, 430 members of our military sustained TBIs. I represent a military state, North Carolina, where our communities have set, stepped up to support service members returning from conflict zones with a variety of injuries, both physical and psychological. However, symptoms of TBI, including confusion, inability to follow directions, and impaired thinking are not always easy to identify for what they are. We need to ensure that law enforcement in military states like North Carolina are prepared to recognize signs of TBI and respond accordingly. The last thing our service members need is overly harsh treatment by law enforcement officers who have not, do not have the specialized training necessary to respond to serious medical conditions like TBI. This bill will direct DOJ to develop crisis intervention training tools for law enforcement and first responders, including information on TBI and PTSD. Armed with this training and information, police officers will be better able to respond to individuals in crisis and to keep them and our communities safe. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and I yield back. <coughs> the gentlelady yields back for what purpose of Mr. Gates seek recognition. I'm I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman, the clerk will report the amendment. I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Am I recognized to explain my amendment, Mr. Chairman? Clerk will report the amendment first. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is, is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the States Act, and I'm glad that we have appropriate focus on TBI for members of law enforcement, but what I have certainly noticed is that medical application of cannabis has helped in a variety of circumstances for people with TBI. And I offer this amendment fully aware of its, of its ultimate fate in the graveyards of Germanity, but, but, but Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, years ago- France, not Germany? <laughs> Germanity, I believe. Uh, Germain is not just a member of the Jackson 5. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, years ago when we brought up the Moore Act and I joined the majority in supporting it, I posited that it would never become law because it did not enjoy sufficient support in the Senate, despite Mr. McClintock's support and, and my support here. We are now in a circumstance where one of the easiest, fastest, most capable ways to ad advance healthcare outcomes for people with traumatic brain injuries would be to unlock the great research potential that exists throughout our country. And the States Act would pass the United States Senate. It should pass the House of Representatives under democratic control. Unfortunately, I think we heard some witnesses before this committee that said that the States Act would be a whitewashing of cannabis law. And uh, that leaves people with traumatic brain injury, some of the very people who are advocates of the underlying bill left without the full suite of medical services uh, that might otherwise be available. I noticed that just yesterday, President Biden uh, put out a Twitter video that identified me. And he talked about his plan to lower prescription drug prices. And then he showed a picture of me and indicated that I had no plan on health care. Well, at least my plan on health care involves modernizing the country's cannabis laws. And I'm wondering where President Biden is on that. If President Biden is the, the 
the true great Woketopian that you've all been waiting for, why doesn't he remove cannabis from the list of Schedule One drugs? And if we really care about the people with traumatic brain injury, with a number of other ailments that could be helped with the application of medical cannabis, why wouldn't we pass the States Act as a recognition that those people deserve better out of their government, and the Moore Act is not going to become law despite the best efforts of the members of this committee over multiple years. I mean, we, we've done the Moore Act thing year after year, and it's not going anywhere. Moore gives us less. States would give us better law. This bill would provide an opportunity to do it, and uh, it's with that spirit that I offer my amendment and, and await uh, a germanity ruling. Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady insists on a point of order. Uh, I do. Recognizing the gentleman from Florida's enthusiasm for marijuana, the amendment is still beyond the scope of the underlying bill. It deals with controlled substances, which is not uh, within the underlying bill, and I do. Um, it's not your main. Uh, I, I am prepared to, I, what? Does the gentleman wish to be heard on the point of order? Uh, I do. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's enthusiasm lashed to a sincere connection to the millions of people who can benefit from the medical application of cannabis. I yield back. Um, I'm prepared, the chair is prepared to rule on the point of order. Uh, and let me say that although I thoroughly agree, as the gentleman knows, with the gentleman on the subject of marijuana, and I'm the chief sponsor of the Moore Act, which may or may not pass the Senate, uh, one can hope. And nonetheless, this amendment is um, uh, uh, not germane. It is way beyond the, uh, uh, the, 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 the scope of the bill in that it uh, uh, deals with criminal penalties, which the, this bill has nothing to do with. So I'm constrained to uh, uh, rule that the amendment is out of order. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does Ms. Deming seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. General Lee is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to say it won't be long that I'm proud to join my colleagues um, and the my brothers and sisters in blue in support of this very uh, important legislation, the Traumatic Brain Injury and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Law Enforcement Training Act. Uh, we do know that training is the greatest tool that we can give our law enforcement officers uh, I believe they say they know that if they train today, they do win tomorrow. Um, we do want to help people, uh, members of law enforcement, as well as members of this body. We do want to save lives, uh, the lives of those in crisis, but also let me be clear that we do want to save the lives of those who are trying to handle or solve uh, the problems of those in crisis. So I'm proud to uh, support this legislation, be the sponsor of this legislation. I'm very grateful for the members on both sides of the aisle who are serious today on both sides of the aisle about ensuring that law enforcement has the tools, inc including training, to be able to effectively do their job. And thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I do yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Who seeks recognition? For what, for what purpose does Mr. Issa seek recognition? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> for what purpose does Mr. Cohen seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I would just firstly like to say that uh, I understand the chairman's ruling that what Mr. Gates suggested was not germane, but I did like his idea and support him on that. And I also liked him saying that Jermaine was not just another Jackson. Um, I caught that. Uh, this is an important bill. We need to support our police. I started my career as the attorney for the police in Memphis and spent three and a half years in, with the police department. A lot of policemen do have difficulties with difficult situations. And this, this bill will help them with that and we need to support our police to have better societies, and the rule of law cannot exist without proper law enforcement. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Who else seeks recognition? If, if, if not, the, um, the uh, question occurs on the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, all in favor of the amendment in the nature of a substitute will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Aye. 
The ayes have it, and the amendment nature of a substitute is adopted. Uh, the question occurs uh, on the bill. Uh, reporting quorum being present, the question is on the motion to report the bill H.R. 2992 as amended favorably to the House. Those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Aye. The ayes obviously have it, and the bill is ordered reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute, uh, incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Mr. Chairman. For what purposes, Ms. Isis, Mr. Mr. Chairman, under extraordinary circumstances, I move that we, uh, unanimous consent, that we move H.R. 7705, the Supreme Court Police Priority Act, today, even though it is not on the agenda, because of the imminent threat to our Supreme Court justices by potentially private, uh, private parties who have been in intimidating and protesting in an inappropriate manner and endanger the justices' ability to make an independent decision. The bill has, a similar bill has already been passed out of the Senate by unanimous consent, uh, but in order to expedite it and to show our unity for the third branch of government, I ask that we immediately consider the bill. Uh, I, I'll, uh, I object. Uh, we'll have to take a look at this bill, but uh, we cannot consider it now. I thank Pursuant the gentleman, and uh, the copy is being handed to you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 7647, the Supreme Court Ethics, Recusal, and Transparency Act of 2022, for purposes of markup, and move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 7647 to amend Title 28, United States Code, to provide for a code of conduct for justices of the Supreme Without Court. Without objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. H.R. 7647, the Supreme Court Ethics, Recusal, and Transparency Act of 2022, would address the growing and persistent ethics crisis at our nation's highest court. The Supreme Court is one of the nation's most vital institutions. Its fidelity to equal and impartial justice, as well as the public's faith in the integrity of the judiciary, are foundational to maintaining the rule of law. But the institution of the court has been undermined in recent years by the actions of the justices themselves. Justice is appointed by presidents at both ends of the ideological spectrum. We expect the justices of our nation's highest court to hold themselves to the highest standards of ethical conduct. But in fact, their conduct too often falls below the standards that most other government officials are required to follow. People are justifiably shocked when they learn that there is no code of conduct for the Supreme Court. Not only is there no code of conduct for the Supreme Court, but that the justices have steadfastly opposed the creation of one. Every member of Congress is subject to a code of conduct, as is every other federal judge, every district judge, every circuit judge. Even entry-level employees in the executive branch are subject to more stringent ethics requirements than the justices of the Supreme Court. Recent events, whether it be the unprecedented leak of a draft opinion, speeches given at closed-door events with parties to ongoing cases in front of the court, or public appearances with political figures, all call out for scrutiny under a defined code of ethics. H.R. 7647 would require the Supreme Court to promulgate an express code of conduct that would apply to both the justices and their employees. No longer would each justice get to pick and choose their ethical obligations without being bound by a single uniform code. Recent years have also seen the justices' repeated and worsening failures to abide by the existing federal recusal statute. Last year, for example, one justice refused to recuse from a case involving a group whose affiliate had spent more than a million dollars supporting her appointment to the bench. Two justices refused to recuse from a case involving their publisher, who had given them six- and seven-digit book deals. We also now know that one justice failed to recuse from at least one case <coughs> involving the attempted overthrow of our democratically elected government, despite his wife's apparent direct and active involvement in that effort. To be clear, I do not expect Justice Thomas to recuse himself from cases because his spouse holds a particular point of view. I expect him to recuse when he knows, or even reasonably suspects, that his wife's communications would appear in the records that President Trump sought to withhold from Congress. To make matters worse, because the court's practice is that each justice's recusal decisions are not subject to any form of review, each justice sim currently simply decides for themselves whether recusal is warranted. 
This legislation would ensure that the justices recuse themselves from cases where their impartiality could reasonably be questioned by delineating additional instances where recusal is clearly required. This bill would also inject impartiality into the recusal process by allowing the full Supreme Court, rather than each individual justice, to consider certain recusal motions. The bill would also provide much needed transparency into the filing of amicus briefs, which has increasingly become the equivalent of judicial lobbying and is often used in a coordinated fashion by dark money groups. To address this issue, H.R. 7647 would require the parties and amicus filers in a case to disclose the gifts and payments they have given to the justices, as well as whether they lobbied to get any of the justices their jobs. This bill also requires amicus filers to disclose the sources of dark money funding their efforts to influence the court. Finally, these disclosure problems ex extend to the justices themselves. <coughs> they do not need to disclose the value of the reimbursements they receive for the junkets they take at the sponsor's expense. And in some cases, they use a loophole to completely conceal lavish gifts like flights on private jets and trips given to them by people with interest before the court. To address these problems, this legislation requires the justices to disclose the gifts, travel, and money they have received from outside entities. The appearance of impropriety and disregard for the law can have devastating impacts on the public's trust in the judiciary. Our constitutional system suffers when it looks like the justices of the Supreme Court, the very people we entrust to maintain the rule of law, think that they themselves are above the law. The Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act is tailored to protect the judicial process from hidden conflicts of interest, safeguard litigants' rights to equal justice under law, and ensure that the justices of the Supreme Court are not above the laws they are entrusted to enforce. I want to thank the distinguished chair of the court subcommittee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for introducing this legislation, and I urge all members to support it. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chairman just used the term judicial lobbying. Last year, the chairman and two other members of this committee introduced legislation to pack the United States Supreme Court. Last week, for the first time in history, we have a decision leaked from the court. Next week, they've already, they just noticed it now. Next week, they're having a hearing on the Dobbs case. And as we speak, people are protesting in front of justices' homes. That's not judicial lobbying, that's intimidation. That is what's going on right now. Guess how many Democrats on this committee, guess how many? I don't know of one, but guess, take a guess. I don't know of one Democrat on this committee, I'll say it this way. I don't know of one Democrat on this committee who's condemned the leak last week. Not one. This is the committee entrusted by the American people with making sure Article Three of the Constitution works. This is the committee that's supposed to stand up for the rule of law, for separate and equal branches of government. The biggest breach of the Supreme Court in living memory, the Democrats on this committee won't condemn it. Not only will they not condemn the leak, but they won't condemn what's happened in the aftermath of the leak. As I just said, last week, a left-wing group by the name of, quote, Ruth Senas published the private residences of the court's six conservative justices and called on those individuals to be harassed and picketed and protested at their home. Abortion activists have held, have held loud, disruptive protests outside the homes of Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Leto, Justice Kavanaugh, where protesters could be heard chanting all kinds of, all kinds of things. The White House initially didn't condemn any of this. In fact, Jin Psaki's only comments were to remark on the passion of these protesters. Only days later did the White House offer a weak statement. The editor-in-chief of a publication for another left-wing group, Demand Justice, tweeted that he was, quote, counting on the court never recovering from the leak. That is not, that's dangerous talk. That is, that, that, that is just wrong. Democrats today can't even seem to support the fundamental idea that the most important value in the American legal system is our embrace of the rule of law. Just two weeks ago, Democrats held a hearing to target Justice Thomas and mused in the press about potential plans to impeach him. As I said, last week we had the leak. Today we have notice of a hearing on the very subject that's in front of the court as we speak. And the protests are going on, as I said, this is, in my mind, an intimidation effort of the court. It's not gonna work. Of course, the ultimate plan is to pack the court, something that has not been contemplated since before World War II. And when the court packing was last considered, the Democrat controlled, Democrat controlled. 
Democrat-controlled Senate Judiciary Committee said it was, quote, an invasion of judicial power that violates every sacred tradition of American democracy. That's just how radical today's left has become. None of this should surprise us. This has been the playbook all along. Remember when Senator Schumer said this, March of 2020, quote, I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. You won't know what hit you if you go forward with these awful decisions. Today, the Democrats are trying to move legislation that burdens the Supreme Court with layers of bureaucracy. Don't let them fool you. This isn't about ethics. This is an insurance policy for them. When things don't go their way, they want to have the tools at their disposal to make life hard for the justices, whether that means seeking recusals, seeking impeachment, or just showing up at their house and protesting. They are trying to move this legislation just one week after the leak of the Dobbs decision, and while left-wing activists are protesting, as I said, at the homes of these justices. Does anyone really think that the Supreme Court the administrative office of the courts or the judicial conference has a time right now the bandwidth to provide feedback or technical assistance on legislation in the middle of this threat to Supreme Court security. We're gonna put new ethical obligations on a separate branch of government. We should do this in a, on a consensus basis. This is not something to jam through during, during a crisis. I urge opposition to the legislation, Mr. Chairman, and yield back our time. I would simply point out that uh, in my opening statement, I pointed out that uh, recent events, whether the unprecedented leak of an opinion, call out for scrutiny under defined code of ethics. So we're not supporting that leak. We're, we're saying it needs uh, uh, scrutiny under defined code of ethics like other things. Who else? Um, who, without objection, the amendment, I'm sorry. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a, subst with, in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7647. That objection the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I recognize myself to explain the amendment. This amendment in the nature of a substitute addresses a number of minor technical changes to the underlying text of the bill. It also amends section two of the bill to make clear that the Supreme Court must promulgate a code of ethics for the court's employees as well as the justices and that the judicial conference must do the same for lower court employees. It amends section three to make explicitly clear that the minimum disclosure standards for the justices apply to travel. Finally, it adds a new section nine that would require a set of studies to gauge compliance with this bill. I urge all members to support the amendment. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? What purpose does Mr. Johnson seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this. Uh, Markup is about a bill that imposes upon the United States Supreme Court um, the obligation to promulgate for itself a code of conduct. And it also um, puts into place some recusal standards for the court and for other uh, judges, other federal judges, and also some reporting requirements. So it's not about uh, Justice Thomas. It's not about peaceful protesters outside of uh, uh, justices' homes where they are peacefully protesting on uh, public property. It's not about that. And uh, it's not about uh, failing to condemn a uh, leak of Justice Alito's draft opinion. Uh, we don't know who's responsible for the leak of that draft opinion in the Dobbs case, but we do know that if it was done or directed to be done by a member of the court, including a conservative member, that justice would likely face no consequences. And that's because unlike every other court in the land, all being bound by a code of conduct, the United States Supreme Court has failed and refused to bind itself to a code of ethics governing the conduct of its members. And that omission is something that we can correct today, ladies and gentlemen, by moving this bill forward out of this committee and onto the House floor. The Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act of 2022 would take meaningful steps to ensure that the court polices itself in a transparent and accountable manner. And it would do that by first uh, 
First, by requiring the court to draft and issue its own code of conduct for the justices and the court's employees after hearings from experts and the public about what that code should contain. It would also strengthen judicial recusal rules, adding to the number of circumstances in which justices must recuse themselves and giving parties to cases additional tools to make sure that those recusals actually happen according to the law. Equally important, the bill would strengthen disclosure rules for justices and others. It would require justices to adhere at a minimum to the same level of gift and income disclosures as we members of Congress. What's wrong with that? So that the parties to cases and members of the public and the press can see when justices or their spouses are receiving gifts of travel or uh, exclusive accommodations from parties, lawyers, or those filing friend of court briefs who seek to influence judicial decision making. It would also help to ensure those uh, friends of the court, uh, amicus curiae, aren't getting too friendly with the justices by requiring disclosure of every person or entity that is paid for the drafting and preparation of friend of court briefs and whether they have given anything of value to the justices or their families. And this bill, uh, my colleagues, my dear colleagues, is a long time coming. Many of these changes have been put before this body in one form or another for the past decade or more. We're seeing the effects of our inaction now. The word unprecedented is starting to lose its meaning as we see more and more questionable behavior from justices. And the public trust and confidence in the Supreme Court is at an all-time low. By mandating that the Supreme Court develop and adopt a code of ethics, this bill would help restore the court's reputation and reinforce that none of us, not even Supreme Court justices, are above the law. So I urge you all to uh, support this important legislation and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your support of this bill and thank you all uh, to the co-sponsors of it. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back for the purposes of Mr. Shabbat seek recognition. Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I uh, mentioned during the hearing on this particular uh, matter, um, the American people, I think, are really tired of what's going on here, and I oppose this uh, legislation very strongly. I think the people of this country, they want us to address uh, problems that they face every day, like rising gasoline prices, soaring crime rates, uh, increased costs of just about everything nowadays, no matter if they're at the grocery store or wherever, everything's going up. Instead, they get yet another partisan piece of legislation designed to distract them from the Biden administration's policies that have failed them again and again. Today, the Democrats on this committee are targeting the United States Supreme Court, the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, we're not discussing what should be done about the biggest security breach in the history of the Supreme Court, a leak that could dramatically undermine the operations of that court well into the future. That's an issue we ought to be examining. After all, this committee has direct jurisdiction over the federal courts. But that's not the threat that we're discussing today. No, instead, this committee is considering whether or not a respected Supreme Court justice who has served on the court with distinction for over three decades now is suddenly unable to make his own decisions regarding the law without consulting his wife. The whole premise of this legislation is absurd on its face. And as Mr. Jordan said, it's been one attack on this court after another. But unfortunately, this isn't the first attempt by congressional Democrats to smear a Republican-nominated Supreme Court justice by referencing the opinions of his or her spouse. Uh, back in 2020, during her confirmation hearings in the Senate, opponents of Justice Amy Coney Barrett's nomination attempted to distract the American people from her long and distinguished career as a lawyer, as a scholar, as a judge, 
by suggesting that she would somehow be subservient to her husband when it came to matters of the law. Fortunately, most reasonable Americans knew that was absurd as well. When taken together, these smear campaigns have a couple things in common. One, it appears that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have an issue with strong, assertive women when those women don't agree with them, a position that's frankly indefensible. The strength of this nation is that we have long respected freedom of speech. If you don't agree with someone's position on a particular issue, you can engage them in a debate on that issue. That's one of the things that makes this country great. Yes, we have free speech. Unfortunately, we've seen a coordinated effort by the left to undermine the opinions uh, of these people that I just mentioned by attacking their motives um, and questioning their independence from their spouses. It's frankly something hard to believe uh, in 2022. Uh, another issue uh, that these two attacks have in common, which I believe is the real motivation, as Mr. Jordan previously mentioned, is abortion. Justice Thomas uh, and Justice Barrett don't support the leftist policy of abortion on demand. Abortion right up to the point of birth. That's what we're talking about. That's what abortion on demand is. And right up to the point of birth. Thus, the left feels that these justices must be undermined by whatever means necessary, even when those means are as disturbing as suggesting that two prominent intelligent women, Justice Thomas's wife, and Justice Barrett herself are incapable of thinking for themselves independent of their spouses, which we all know is absolutely patently ridiculous. It's a bizarre accusation, an insulting line of attack, uh, and this really marks a new low, I believe, in the history of this committee, one that I've served on for 26 uh, years now. Um, I think this committee is better uh, than that, Mr. Chairman, and uh, we ought to be taking up something else. Uh, with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back for what purpose is the gentleman from Rhode, from Rhode Island seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing up this long overdue uh, piece of legislation for markup today. You know, the Supreme Court makes important decisions that impact the lives of the American people. And, you know, it's very important uh, to the American people that they continue to have confidence in the court and have some confidence that we are going to see a court that continues to advance toward more freedom in this country and to meet the founding ideals of America. And one of the bedrocks of the confidence the American people have in the court is to, a sense that, that the court operates under the rule of law and not because of outside influence or improper influence by people who have interests before the court. And so this bill is about the impartiality and independence of the court. And it seems like every week there's a new story of how the court's impartiality and independence has been compromised. Justices aren't recusing themselves when there's clearly a conflict of interest. They're receiving massively expensive gifts and travel benefits without needing to disclose this information to the public. And dark money is influencing briefs and arguments. And the list goes on and on and on. And so I'm very proud to be co-leading this effort with Mr. Johnson and, and Mr. Jones and others that will bring a code of ethics to the Supreme Court. It will strengthen disclosure requirements, strengthen recusal requirements in situations where there are conflicts of interest, and prevent dark money from secretly infiltrating am amicus briefs. I'm also proud that provisions from my bill, the Judicial Travel Accountability Act, are also included in this package. These provisions will ensure that federal judges and justices of the court are required to disclose travel and lodging benefits they receive in the same way as members of Congress. This is a common sense bill that will address the very real problems we're dealing with every single day, problems that impact people's lives with gener uh, for generations. And as Mr. Shabbat is right, of course we have to address inflation and food and gas prices, and we have to continue to do that work. I will compliment the administration for the work they're doing to drive down the costs of both food and energy. But that doesn't uh, uh, relieve us of our responsibility to address this issue as well. We can do two things at once. And the notion that the single greatest threat we face is a leaked Supreme Court document is an absurdity. Of course the leak was inappropriate. It ought to be investigated, and whoever did it ought to be held accountable. But what's at stake in the, this issue is the impartiality of the court and whether or not they're gonna continue to enjoy the confidence of the American people. And they, it, it's insane that the Supreme Court of the United States is not governed by a code of ethics. People all over the world would find that impossible to imagine. And it's also very important, 
when we hear our Republican colleagues talk about packing the court, I mean, that's rich. This is the party that refused to give Merrick Garland a hearing, who stole a Supreme Court seat of President Obama's, then jammed through two other justices on the court despite serious allegations of misconduct. So this ocean of packing the court? And don't bring up Ginny Thomas. Let's remember, we now know Ginny Thomas in those text messages was strategizing with the president's chief of staff on ways he could overturn the election results and keep Donald Trump in office though he lost the election. And just as Thomas didn't think it was appropriate, despite his wife's active participation in that, to recuse himself from a case that involves an effort to compel the former president to produce documents to the January 6th commission investigating his, his participation or involvement in this? Hmm, curious. He was the only justice who sided with the president against the entire balance of the court, who said he was required to produce those documents. Does that create some appearance of, I don't know, I don't know, does it present, suggest confidence in the impartiality of the court? I mean, these are the questions the American people are asking. And they expect us to ensure that the court operates with integrity, with transparency, free from conflicts of interest, at a bare minimum. That's what this bill does. So let's set aside all the theatrics about the leak and about, you know, peaceful protests, which last time I checked are as American as anything. And let's instead focus on our responsibility to ensure that the court conducts itself in a way that it can continue to enjoy the respect of the American people. This court makes decisions that impact our lives in so many ways. And if the American people lose confidence that this court has integrity, has operated with impartiality, free from outside interference, the court will lose its legitimacy. That's dangerous for our country, it's dangerous for our democracy, and it's dangerous for the court. And I yield back. The gentleman, uh, the gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? For what purpose does, this, does Mr. Jones seek recognition? For what purpose does Ms. For what purpose does Mr. Jones seek recognition? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Gen Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Any day now, five or six members of the most unrepresentative and unaccountable institution in our society, the United States Supreme Court, could end the fundamental constitutional right to an abortion. That very day, their Republican accomplices in the states will seize control over the bodies of tens of millions of women across America. In the eyes of the law, women will cease to be free and equal members of our nation. The court's far-right supermajority won't stop there. As the leaked opinion in Dobbs outlines, the court has set its sights on other fundamental rights, like the right to contraception, and even the right to marry someone of the same gender and the right to marry someone of a different race. This imminent ruling overturning Roe v. Wade is a travesty, but it should be no surprise. It is the culmination of an open, aggressive, decades-long crusade by the Republican Party to destroy our democracy and capture the Supreme Court for the purpose of denying every woman in America an equal right to pursue her own happiness. And my Republican colleagues wonder why the court is facing a legitimacy crisis. Well, let's get a few things straight about this debate. The problem is not that Justice Alito's opinion leaked. The problem is that his leaked opinion would subjugate millions of women across America. The problem is not the peaceful, lawful protests outside of Justice Kavanaugh's home. The problem is the injustice that they are protesting against. The problem is not that the American people are losing respect for the court. The problem is that the court's far-right justices have lost respect for the American people. I am proud to co-lead the bill before us today because the American people have good reason to question the legitimacy of this unrepresentative, unaccountable institution. 
Three of the justices poised to overrule Roe were appointed by a president, imposed on the nation by a minority of voters, and confirmed by senators representing a minority of the American people. Two of the justices backing the gravest assault on gender equality in decades, Justices Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh, have been credibly accused of sexual harassment and assault themselves, and they were never properly investigated. Two others sit in stolen seats, shamelessly seized by Mitch McConnell. Those justices, of course, are Neil Gorsuch and Amy Coney Barrett. At least four justices deceived their way onto the Supreme Court, assuring the Senate under oath, under oath, that they recognize Roe as precedent. And the ideological leader of the far right faction, the justice who in all likelihood assigned the opinion in Dobbs, Justice Clarence Thomas, violated the existing recusal statute by voting to deny the January 6th Select Committee access to White House records about the insurrection that his wife helped plan. Where millions of Americans once saw an impartial institution worthy of their respect, they now see six unelected Republicans in black robes under the sway of special interests, seated by a dwindling minority faction within the American electorate imposing by fiat a radical partisan agenda that the GOP could never persuade a majority of Americans to vote for on the merits. The Supreme Court has to earn its legitimacy. This is not a radical proposition. I'm just quoting three brave Republican-appointed justices who resisted overturning Roe v. Wade in a 1992 Supreme Court decision called Casey. When they reaffirmed the right to an abortion in that case, they wrote, and I quote, a decision to overrule Roe's essential holding would come at the cost of both profound and unnecessary damage to the court's legitimacy and to the nation's commitment to the rule of law. It is therefore imperative to adhere to the essence of Roe's original decision. That's the end of the quote. Clearly, the only way to restore the court's legitimacy is to restore a court worthy of legitimacy. Ethics reform is essential. But let's not kid ourselves by thinking that ethics reform is enough. Nothing will be enough to protect our democracy and our fundamental rights short of sending this far right majority on the court to its rightful place in the minority and into the dustbin of history by expanding the Supreme Court. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back for purposes of Mr. Issa seek recognition. Move the last, or to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I don't, I don't want to be doing tit for tat with my, my colleague on the other side of the aisle, but I do believe I should respond that the Supreme Court for 240 plus years has earned again and again the respect of the American people. Uh, the notwithstanding uh, failures to recuse, failures to disclose, and other items that this committee is legitimately taking up, I first of all want to reiterate, I'm sorry the gentleman left rather than listening, the Supreme Court has made, during your and my tenure, has made an, a, a tremendous amount of decisions, and repeatedly they have disappointed one or the other of us almost alternately, but that's what their job is. The court is required to look at the Constitution and to make decisions, and they periodically, I, I'll never forget when they uh, made the decision, uh, as they did uh, in the, uh, 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 the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, and I thought it was a bad decision, and they made it, and I disagreed with it, and then they made several decisions over the coming years that have actually moderated it to where between the first decision and the second decision, we all live under a system that is very different than if they, uh, uh, if they had simply considered one and rejected it or the other. That's the way the court works. But most importantly, our Supreme Court and all of our courts must work without the threat of violence and without intimidation. I offered earlier the identical language to the Senate's version under H.R. 7705, which is a bipartisan 
uh, bill that would allow us to more expeditiously provide aid and relief to a Supreme Court that is now being intimidated. I make, make no mistake, I do care about the, the ethics of the courts, the Supreme Court and all of its lesser courts, but I also know this, we will not improve the court by, in fact, intimidating the court. We will not have judges in the United States able to and willing to make those independent decisions to call not just balls and strikes, but life and death if, in fact, we allow the intimidation. Now, that intimidation uh, includes, unfortunately, members of this body who have encouraged the, basically, there will be a day of reckoning for this court and encourage that you go down and yell at them. That should not be allowed. The important thing about this committee is just as we do have a responsibility to oversee the integrity of the court and the legitimacy of the court and, in fact, impeach a judge who does not live up to that standard as you and I have done over the years, we also have an obligation to ensure that they and their families are protected. So I would ask you as quickly as possible to look again at uh, uh, H.R. 7705. It does nothing more than give authority to protect the, fam the, the members and their families and to do so at a time in which the threat is real and it is current and it is clearly in, in uh, intimidation and is meant to do just that. As to the need for the legislation today that, it, that we're considering, Mr. Chairman, I have been supportive and will be, continue to be supportive of holding the court accountable and to hold it transparent. But I would hope that going forward, that members on both sides of the aisle would not make the assumption that a justice or a judge has in fact been uh, unfaithful to the Constitution or to his, his oath if in fact that has not been adjudicated. I think we do so to our own detriment. Particularly, I want to note the attacks on Justice Clarence Thomas. I have known him for my 22 years. I have known him to be somebody who thoughtfully makes decisions. If anything, he is usually thought of as somebody who quote, listen to Justice Scalia too much until Justice Scalia was gone. Now they want you to believe that he listens to his, his wife rather than in fact make those decisions he makes without speaking to it. I will say this, Mr. Mr. Chairman, we should stop making accusations about these individuals. It only leads to the mob's intended attempt to intimidate the court, and I would ask that we stop doing that. And, the gentleman yields back. I yield back. Uh, who else seeks recognition? What purpose does uh, the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to strike the last word. The, the gentlelady is recognized. For four years, under a cloak of false patriotism, Republicans missed no opportunity to erode public trust in our government's institutions. For four years, the former president tainted the highest office in our nation with extremist rhetoric conspiracy, and incitation of violence. This body was morally compelled to impeach not once, but twice, the President of the United States. On January 6th, the Republican insurrectionist mob disgraced this House, the People's House, in the name of lies and false claims of voter fraud. The current administration and this Congress have relentlessly worked to restore decorum, respectability, and honor to the Oval Office, the House of Congress, and our highest court. As a former lower jurisdiction court judge, it is simply beyond me how I was subject to a stringent and wide-ranging set of ethics rules while the justices of the United States Supreme Court, the highest court of our nation, go simply unchecked. The concept of self-policing the court has leaned on to justify the lack of transparency and accountability contradicts our republic's fundamental principle of checks and balances. In Texas, we even have a commission on judicial conduct where the average person who has contact in a courtroom 
or with a judge can file complaints. It's independent oversight. That may be too much to do today, but what we're doing today is a good first start. Another thing that we might consider is cameras in the courtroom. There's nothing better for accountability and transparency for us to be able to watch and listen for ourselves. The legitimacy of the United States Supreme Court has never, never been more frail. As a former judge, I have the utmost respect for the entire judiciary in its role in a republic form of government. That is why now, as a member of Congress, I am proud to join my colleagues as an original co-sponsor in this, this legislation. And I may want to respond also to a comment that Mr. Jordan made. I do not think that anything that increases transparency and accountability and makes things more open, like financial disclosures, forms about recusal, is burdensome. I found it no burden to fill out my financial disclosure form and comply with any ethics rules that were required by me by the state of Texas or my jurisdiction. It is simply, simply silly to suggest that it's burdensome. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm really, really troubled by this whole notion of trying to distract us from the real issue here, which is transparency and accountability and making sure that every judge from the lowest jurisdiction court to the highest of all, the United States Supreme Court, is open and fair, independent, and is not doing anything in contradiction to our law. Because in the end, it is, as Mr. Johnson said, the sponsor. It is about the rule of law, and no one, no one is above the law, even a justice of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentleman, uh, the gentlelady yields back for what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Democrats brought us FDR's inflation. They brought us FDR's recessions, and now they're trying to bring us FDR's attacks on the court, FDR's court packing strategy. This isn't about judicial ethics or transparency. The American people know that. Democrats don't like the fact that Republicans, while in power, put folks on the court who are now ruling in adherence with the strict text of the Constitution rather than their desire to engage in an anti-democratic process. And the other reason we know that this isn't about ethics, that this bill is just gaslighting to justify packing the Supreme Court, is because the gentleman from New York, Mr. Jones, told us. I said the quiet part out loud, that, that really the goal here is to pack the court and attack an institution that has been valued in America, certainly in our jurisprudence. And it's quite rich because I've heard my colleagues for quite some time accuse President Trump and House Republicans for attacking institutions, damaging them irreparably. This is the most egregious attack on the institution of the court one could imagine, except maybe violence. And we have that too. And we still see a lot of leaders on the left unwilling to condemn that violence and unwilling to condemn the direct effort to try to intimidate judges who seem to be poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. But this bill draws a specific bead on Justice Clarence Thomas. I wonder why. I wonder why it was Justice Thomas that seems to get all this attention. Is it because he's a black conservative? Well, I asked the panel that we brought before us. It was made up of folks that the Democrats invited, folks that the Republicans invited, made up of white people, black people, men, women. And I asked the panel about a charge that House January 6th Committee Chairman, House Homeland Security Chairman Benny Thompson had made against Justice Thomas. He called him an Uncle Tom. And since maybe I don't fully understand what was meant by that, I asked the panel, is there anyone who believes that calling a black person an um Uncle Tom could be not racist? Is there any world in which that is not a racist attack? And to a person, the men and the women, the Republicans and the Democrats, the white and the black, not one of them would posit the theory that that was not racist. So we now sit in a circumstance where, according to the witnesses before the Judiciary Committee, a House Democrat chairman 
did something that was explicitly and undeniably racist. And I view this legislation as an extension of that effort to attack the court, to delegitimize our institutions, and to use Clarence Thomas as a vessel because they don't like how the outcomes are going with this current court. And it's, it's quite shameful. I yield back. The gentleman yields back for what purpose does Ms. Dean seek recognition? I move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. And ladies recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The behavior of sitting justices in recent months have Americans across our country understandably unsettled, afraid. And we have the ability to address some of their concerns today. But I want to point out that the Representative Johnson has been at this uh, passion for ethical standards for our Supreme Court, the highest court of the land, for more than just recent months. He understands, we understand, uh, that the highest court in the land must have a code of conduct that it abides by. Uh, many of us on this, uh, on this uh, committee are lawyers. We remember studying the code of conduct that we are subject to. Uh, and in that code, uh, particularly for federal judges, is the notion that judges must av avoid not just impropriety, but also the appearance of impropriety. So I don't understand arguments around this is an intimidation of the Supreme Court. Not at all. I would think the Supreme Court would embrace where this legislation goes, that they should be held to the highest standards of ethical conduct, that they should welcome it. We have the chance here today. How, do, how can we be sure to hold judges and justices accountable to rigorous, enforceable ethical standards? The three-part answer is right here in the name of Represent Representative Johnson's bill. Ethics, recusal, transparency. What's intimidating about that? I don't know. I am proud to lend my strong support as a co-sponsor of H.R. 7647, the Supreme Court Ethics, Recusal, and Transparency Act. Our third branch of government impacts the lives of every single person in this country. Think Roe v. Wade, Obergefell, Loving versus Virginia, Brown versus Board of Education, Griswold, and so many others. Some of these cases have been, become synonymous with laws, importantly with rights, but recent actions from our federal courts should remind us the decisions of the courts are not all codified. Without a code of ethics, the courts will act with impunity, creating or destroying laws, destroying rights, taking away rights without oversight. And Congress has the oversight role to play. Establishing a code of ethics for the highest court on our land should happen without partisan fervor. Lest we forget, it was four years ago that my colleagues across the aisle introduced a bill that would have required the judiciary's policymaking arm to issue a code of conduct that applied to the justices. It should not be partisan for a sitting judge to recuse his or herself when appropriate. It should not be partisan for federal judges to maintain a level of transparency regarding their personal interests in a case. Establishing a code of ethics will provide an additional safeguard in protecting the integrity of the federal bench, therefore protecting the rights of the American people. And so I'll end by thanking Representative Johnson for his tireless effort on this bill and in leading efforts to establish oversight of our federal courts and encourage the passage of the bill. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back for what purposes Mr. Roy seek recognition. Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. The, uh, our colleagues, and particularly uh, Mr. Jones, uh, made the case and when he said, let's not pretend that this is enough, he said nothing will be enough, but relegating the current members of the majority into the minority by packing the court. This isn't about ethics <coughs> and transparency and recusal. Everyone watching gets the joke. That's not what this is about. This is about raw politics a disdain for the current majority, a disdain for specific members of the court, and in particular, Justice Thomas. And I think in particular, 
because he's a conservative black man. And I think everybody gets the joke. There's a, yeah, they said it, exactly. As my colleague from Florida made, made very abundantly clear. Let's not forget that when appropriate questions of recusal were being raised about Justice Kagan for having served as Solicitor General in the administration and then sitting on the court during Obamacare litigation, reasonable questions about recusal, that the immediate effort by the left was to do what? Attack Justice Thomas because his wife offered public opinions stating her opposition to Obamacare. In other words, this is not the first time. This is not the first time that we've had this conversation. It's not the first time that Jenny Thomas has been attacked personally or Justice Thomas has been attacked. And of course, this president, having been the chairman of the Judiciary Committee and having sat over the absurdity that was the hearing for Justice Thomas, knows full well exactly what they're doing. That's what this is about. And, and, and we all know that. I would also note that as we're looking here about the, what we're gonna deal with next week with the hearing and talking about the leaked opinion and talking about Roe versus Wade, that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle sure as hell weren't bothered by uh, uh, this leak, but were when there were leaks that showed a disdain for conservative Hispanic Miguel Estrada in 2003, when there were memos outlining specific opposition by my Democratic colleagues, Democrats in the Senate, trying to take down, tear down, and destroy Miguel Estrada, specifically black and white language, because he's a conservative Hispanic. Oh man, can't talk about that memo because that was a leak of an internal Democrat memo. No, no, that was a horror that we couldn't talk about, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. But crickets, now that the Supreme Court has had a leak of an opinion coming from SCOTUS. I listened to some amusement about uh, talking about how the court um, was missing out on having Merrick Garland on the court that paragon of moderation, don't you recall, from all of those talking points of the left that he was, he was the moderate, right? The moderate who just ruled that mental health must be considered for known criminals applying for asylum coming into the United States. That paragon of moderation targeting parents in coordination with the National School Board Association. Everyone understands what this is all about, and it's all always come back down to row, and we'll have more to talk about that next week when it, with respect to that case. I've heard enough from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, talking about how that is going to, uh, because we couldn't, I think the quote from somebody on the other side of the aisle, we can't win that issue. We can't win that issue in public debate and discourse. Well then, if that's the case, what the hell are you worried about? If we can't win the argument on abortion in the democratic debates, supposedly, then what's the concern? We know what the concern is. You want the court to put its thumb on the democratic process, and that's what this is about. I yield back. Time, the gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Maryland seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Yeah, who's recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, I want to rise in favor of the Supreme Court Ethics, Recusal, and Transparency Act of 2022. This is long overdue and urgently important legislation. But it follows from the essential and time-honored principle of our government, which James Madison articulated in Federalist Number 10, and I quote, no man is allowed to be a judge in his own cause. And here I'll just say parenthet parenthetically, that means case. No man is allowed to be a judge in his own case because his interest would certainly bias his judgment 
and not improbably corrupt his integrity. Nobody can be a judge in their own case, and yet this is precisely the rule on the Supreme Court today. Every justice is invited to be a judge in his or her own case when someone raises a conflict of interest on the judge's part. That's ludicrous, unless you think that being on the Supreme Court confers upon you superhuman powers and that you have no interests and no bias and no prejudice. And I would hope that every member of the United States House of Representatives Judiciary Committee would recognize that that system doesn't work and we need a real code of ethics that binds every federal judge, including U.S. Supreme Court justices, because nobody is above the law and nobody is perfect. Ask James Madison. So now our colleagues are in a panic because like the dog who caught the car after demanding for decades the destruction of the constitutional right to privacy, they have packed and gerrymandered the Supreme Court and created a majority that is hell-bent on doing just that, destroying the constitutional right to privacy, a right that every public opinion poll shows commanding majorities of the American people across the country support. So now that there's a leak of this long-running and obvious campaign to assault the rights of tens of millions of American women, they want everyone to focus on the leak and not the decision. It's as if somebody had leaked Plessy versus Ferguson or someone had leaked the Dred Scott decision, and instead of talking about the substance of the matter, they want to talk to us about the leak. Well, let's talk about the leak. First of all, I don't like the leak. I, I take umbrage at anybody's imputation that we support the leak. It's ridiculous. And since we're being invited to guess as to its provenance, I would guess it's a member of the five justice majority or a clerk or someone who's in their employ because they're hell bent on destroying the constitutional right to privacy. And why would I say it comes from that side? Well, they have a clear and obvious motive to try to lock in the presumed anti Roe versus Wade majority that was reflected in the leaked papers to keep Chief Justice Roberts from being able to pull away any of those members who had signed on with Justice Alito to establish a different point of view, something more well, like what Justice O'Connor had uh, advanced in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Would the gentleman yield briefly? I, I will in just a moment. Let me just get through my points and then I'm happy to come back to you. So I don't. And in general, I want to be very clear about this. I don't like the leak because right now what we've got is a six to three right wing Supreme Court. And if they begin to make leaks a habit, then they will be leaking out decisions that will help overwhelmingly right wing corporate uh, litigants before the Supreme Court make a deal before the actual judgment or decision of the court is rendered. So, I, you know, I understand the strategy of trying to distract everybody by pointing fingers about the leak, but everything, to my mind, indicates the leak comes from the side of the people who've got the votes in order to lock in that majority. Now, what's a bigger deal? Well, the gentleman yield just to a point on that real sure. quickly. By all means. Aren't you engaged in rank speculation? Just as you were. Just as the, well, just I, as I the members. And I, and I started by saying it was rank speculation because there were members on that, saying, on that side saying we don't care about the leak. Then I say you don't care about the leak. Well, I mean, you're, you're just talking about the source of the leak. Are Republicans the only people allowed to invent facts? I mean, my God. Well, I, I guess what I'm asking, sir, is you're saying you're speculating about the source of the leak on the court. I mean, isn't you're yes, talking about just protecting as you our democracy? Were, just as the members on that I, side. I'm were. sorry, I, don't, I did not speculate okay. in public. Well, about let's it. take it back. I, if we're being asked to guess, I would say that the purpose and the function of that leak is to lock in a five justice majority to overturn Roe versus Wade. And, I, and there's only three liberal justices on the court. E Their time, clerks, I imagine. The time of the gentleman. Has expired. For what purpose does Mr. Big seek recognition? Move to strike last word. Gentlemen, the gentleman is uh, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in 2017, in the Senate Judiciary Committee, legal experts considered and took up what we're doing today. And there was, there was a split. Some of those legal experts said a, a bill kind of like what we're considering today violates the separation of powers. Why do they say that? 
What makes the U.S. Supreme Court very different than all other federal courts? Well, Article 3, Section 1 basically creates in the Constitution the U.S. Supreme Court. We create the other courts. Thus, we have much more direct oversight. We establish rules and canons of ethics. All judges, however, they're not lifetime appointees. You hear that all the time, they're lifetime appointees. They're lifetime appointees because we don't do anything about them. However, the Constitution says they serve during good behavior. That, that's, that's the criterion. That makes the U.S. Supreme Court very different than, than lower, lower federal courts. And they actually make it very different than us regulating our own ethics. Would the gentleman yield? Just, just a second. I, I want to get through a few more points than, I, than I'm happy to. I, I, I really find it interesting and intriguing to, to ponder the real question here for me as we consider this bill. What would you do if the Supreme Court said, screw you, thanks for coming, we're not playing by your rule. You cre you've, you've created this, they may say, they may consider it in court or something and, and say, well, we, we think that uh, you, you, this, there's a separation of powers issue. I don't know what they would do. But I would think it'd be very interesting and very likely that they would ignore any legislation that came out that attempted to regulate their ethical conduct at the Supreme Court level. Why? Because we can't bring them in unless we're going to do what? Impeachment. That is what the founders gave us. They gave us two things. They gave us the purse and they gave us impeachment. That's how you regulate or balance or check their power. That's, when you read James Madison, that's, and he's talking about, a, when he's talking about the horizontal separation, that, those are the two checks on the judiciary he mentions in the Federalist Papers and beyond that in the writings of James Madison and his correspondence to others. Will, will the gentleman yield? Who's asking? This, this is Mr. Jones from New York. I know I'm not everyone's favorite member today, but. Um, again, just, just give me, give me another, another sure. second here. So, so that, that becomes an, a very interesting thing. How are you going to enforce this? I don't think it's enforceable. So I, I, I'm gonna, I, I wanna make two, two more points before I, I'm gonna yield to Mr. Raskin and, and then, and then to, to Mr. Jones. I also view this, the timing is curious. It's corresponding to public out, uh, attacks on Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny, who is a, 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 an outspoken community activist. I don't think there's a problem there. The, the, but the reality is, as we watch this, and I ask that question, how in the world are you going to, uh, to enforce this unless you're going to impeach? I say that the real, the, the, the real point here, and this was, was, was uttered by Mr. Jones, who I'm gonna to yield to in a second if we got time, is to pack the court. That, that is the other remedy that would be left to you. And that is to say, we don't, like, we don't like the outcome of this particular Supreme Court. We're not going to impeach them. But what we are going to do is we're going to put them into the minority and, and, and not let them go forward. And that, that becomes your other alternative remedy, right? That becomes the alternative remedy. In fact, I think I would say, having listened to your comments today, that is your remedy of choice. Mr. Raskin, you wanted to, uh, to make a comment. A question. The, the, thanks so much for the, those thoughtful remarks. Um, the, you know, the, there are other things available, of course, to Congress, including control over the jurisdiction of the appellate jurisdiction. That's correct. Of the court. That's correct. But, yeah. but beyond that, I, I guess I would really want to go to the point about good behavior. Do you think that good behavior includes acting in an ethical manner and not violating general standards of conflict of interest that govern everybody else in the government? And, and I would say that, that that is something we could adjudicate if we so sought to do. But we can't do it by legislation, in my opinion, because you violate the separation of powers unless you bring them in and hold them to the impeachment level. Okay, and I guess if, if you'd permit me just one more comment on it. Well, I, I'm out of time, but if, oh, if the chairman's gonna, gonna time, give me more time. The time of the gentleman has expired. <laughs> uh, what, what purpose does the gentlelady from Washington seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. 
And the is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing H.R. 7647, the Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act of 2022, before the committee today. I think the question for the American people who are watching is, do you want your Supreme Court justices to have a clear code of conduct? Do you want these justices to be able to make impartial decisions that are free of conflicts of interest, whether those come from family members or from lobbyists who pay for fancy trips or big speeches? I think this is the core question that we're considering today, and I think that this bill would improve disclosure and require justices of the Supreme Court of the United States to follow a code of conduct and provide additional guidelines for recusal from judicial proceedings, and that's a critically important first step. I'm curious that my colleagues keep talking about uh, Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny Thomas, as if it's somehow off bounds. I don't understand why this would be off bounds. We all understand because we're governed by a code of conduct and ethics and transparency standards that perception is incredibly important. So let's just talk about Ginny Thomas and what happened here and why this is an issue that has sparked interest in this code of conduct and uh, in transparency and, and written recusals, a standard of recusals for Supreme Court justices when they have a conflict of interest. Ginny Thomas is a conservative activist. She is the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, and she has been involved in a number of efforts to persuade then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows to overturn the 2020 elections. Following the election, Ms. Thomas used her access to Trump's inner circle, sending at least 29 text messages to Mr. Meadows, promoting false theories and urging the previous administration to reverse the outcome of the 2020 election. In one message that was sent on November 6th, she said, quote, do not concede. It takes time for the army who is gathering for his back. In another message, she urged Mr. Meadows to stand by Sidney Powell, whose false claims about voting machines were so outrageous that even Fox News host Tucker Carlson advised his viewers that she had no evidence and stopped inviting her on his show. Following the insurrection, Ms. Thomas did not stop with her efforts to support the insurrection. She signed a letter addressed to House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy asking him to publish, punish Republicans serving on the Select Committee on January 6th. Now, all of this is extremely disturbing and it's shocking in and of itself to many of us and many Americans across the country. But add to that the fact that Ms. Thomas is married to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and Justice Thomas neither disclosed his wife's proximity to these matters, nor did he recuse himself from cases related to the insurrection. In fact, when President Trump appealed the decision of a lower court to release documents related to the insurrection, stunningly, Justice Thomas was the only justice to dissent in a decision to reject President Trump's request to keep these documents secret. Why? It is clear now that blocking these disclosures could have prevented the disclosure of evidence indicating that his wife, Ginny Thomas, was part of the effort to overturn the results of the 2020 election. How can the American people trust the impartiality of any justice, and in this case of Justice Thomas, when presiding over cases related to January 6th election, insurrection and the 2020 election, when his wife was a part of those efforts? The Supreme Court has not addressed or reprimanded Justice Thomas's clear conflicts of interest. And let's be clear, it's not just Justice Thomas. We can look across the history. I don't think that it's an argument to not put in place a standard of ethics and code of conduct because other justices on, appointed by presidents on both sides of the aisle may have violated those requirements. We need to bring this right now. And this past March, I and several of my colleagues in the House and Senate sent a letter to Chief Justice John Roberts calling for the court to create a binding code of conduct and for Justice Thomas's prompt recusal from future 2020 election and January 6th proceedings. As the Supreme Court struggles to hold itself accountable, faith in the American judicial system steadily declines. It's long overdue for a legislative mandate to abide by a stricter 
ethical code of conduct, and I'm grateful to Representative Johnson for his work on this bill. I do want to say I have another bill that I have introduced and uh, called the Judicial Ethics and Anti-Corruption Act to overhaul our nation's ethics laws and restore public faith in the court system, and I hope we can bring that bill to, to, this, uh, to the, this committee as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back for what purposes of Ms. Sparks seek recognition. I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Uh, I was listening to uh, the debate, and um, you know, and it's um, sad for me to see how the Supreme Court is getting politicized. It's unfortunate, you know, uh, Congressman Ruskin, we, we have a, different views very far apart. We have to go very far in history to Thomas Paine to find common ground. <laughs> and I really think, you know, we can use a lot more common sense. And I think, you know, Thomas Paine was talking about the law is king. And we, we didn't want to have a king, we didn't want to have a pure democracy, but the law was ultimate guidance and decision done by the Supreme Court. So I think what we're doing right now, it's very dangerous politicizing and putting pressure and doing all these things to really try to really intervene with Supreme Court. I think this is not something that we should be doing. I think um, all the leaks and everything else, it's all very disturbing and undermine our institution, you know, and I think we have to be on a bipartisan basis concerned about these issues and have a productive debate and reason but we also need to make sure that we do keep our republic strong, an institution that was set up, you know, for a reason to protect, you know, protect rights of everyone, not just, uh, you know, majority, but also in the minority are there. And I think Supreme Court is a very important institution. And I, I you know, just to um, kind of uh, wanted to, um, you know, uh, have us, in this committee and have a vibrant debate, but not a political debate. And I kind of want us to remind, since we talk about Thomas Paine, he, you know, that we don't forget, he said that society in every state is a blessing, but government, even its best state, is but a necessary evil, and its uh, worst state is an intolerable one. So hopefully we're not moving in that direction, and we have a productive debate, and I think a lot of the things are not healthy our constitutional republic, and I hope we can get to better productive because our republic has to be strong. Our republic is very important to be strong, and uh, I think our committee is very important to protect these views and values of our constitutional republic and protect the independence of Supreme Court as an ultimate authority. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back to what purposes is for seek recognition. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. General ladies recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm in strong support of this legislation. It is only appropriate that the highest court in our judicial system be held to the highest judicial standards. However, for years, we have seen Supreme Court justices evade recusals, affecting their ability to interpret law impartially and without influence. These are justices who have lifetime appointments. They do not face the same checks as members of the legislative and executive branches who have to face the voters. And we must maintain an ethical standard that voters find acceptable or risk losing election campaigns. It is fundamentally unjust that these justices, nine of the most powerful people in the country, are held to lower ethical standards than those of us in Congress. I'm incredibly proud of the work that this committee has already done to hold our federal judges accountable. Last year, this committee marked up and passed the bipartisan Courthouse Ethics and Transparency Act. And I'm thrilled that the bipartisan Senate version of this bill passed this house again last month and now awaits President Biden's signature. However, we must do much more to ensure that the Supreme Court operates in a way in which it was designed to without influence and free from external influences that place 
unbiased interpretation of the law into question. This means putting mechanisms in place to guarantee justices recuse themselves properly from cases and are held accountable when they do not. The current apparatus that justices rely on to make ethical decisions, which is disjointed, unclear, and subject to interpretation is wholly inadequate. Because the court has refused to police itself, Congress can and should codify an ethical standard that follows each and every justice through his or her tenure. Doing so will ensure that decisions are made fairly and will bolster Americans' confidence in how justices came to make their interpretations of the law. This would apply regardless of who appointed the justice and regardless of their political persuasion. I urge my colleagues to support this common sense bill and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? What purpose does Mr. Gomert seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, this uh, is really profound and disturbing. Uh, for so long, uh, we have been listening to people talk about the wisdom of all those old white guys on the Supreme Court in 1973. Now we have a more diverse court, a younger court. And yet we hear from the other side, no, no, they, they, they think we ought to go with what the old white men said and not the more diverse court that we have now. Um, and I've been here 17 and a half years. I didn't hear anybody on the other side of the aisle the least bit concerned about liberal family members, people in extremely liberal groups, even when they signed a brief that went before the Supreme Court. No, no, they're liberals, so it's okay that their family members are trying to actually affect the court and have a role to play in trying to affect the court because you can't judge a liberal justice on the Supreme Court by someone in their family that you that's no they're independent people they th they think their own way and now that we have um, actually indication from the leak is a majority uh, voting and let's be clear about what was in the leaked opinion these justices are saying, look, in 1973, this was not a reading that the court did from the U.S. Constitution. Somehow, they were able to look at the shadow of a penumbra to read language that wasn't there didn't exist. They made it up. Will the gentleman yield? No. Nope. They made up language and said, see, it's right there in the Constitution in the shadow of the penumbra that apparently you had to have some kind of secret decoder ring or something in order to figure out that that non-existent language was there. And now what you have from the leaked opinion is a very clear reading of the Constitution that says, look, 
bunch of people in black robes should not be making the decision. We've heard already in this hearing about how important it is to protect this democracy. Well, it's a democratic republic. We have elected representatives. The Greek democracy didn't work out as well as one might have hoped. But the justices in the leaked opinion are saying, Let's do this the way the Constitution anticipated. As the Tenth Amendment says, if the power is not specifically enumerated for the federal government, it's reserved to the states and people. That's there. It's not in a shadow. It's not a penumbra. This is there. So let's send it back to the states and the people and let them have a majority rule within the, their representative government. And yet we're hearing, look, we still should go by what all those old white guys did in 73, even though the court now is much more diverse and is actually, as I understand, one-tenth of a year younger than the average age for the court was back in 1973. So I, I don't buy that the leak came from a conservative because they had the opinion, they had the majority. So it seemed that the best motive would have been exactly what we've seen. It was leaked, and then the pressure is being brought to bear against the, the justices. The time of the gentleman has expired. Thank you. We seek I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose is Mr. Lucy recognition? I seek to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Nadler. Every executive branch employee has to follow ethical rules and laws. There's an entire Office of Government Ethics that deals with ethical issues among executive branch employees. In Congress, we have to follow ethical rules. We have an ethics committee that deals with ethical issues. In the judiciary, federal district court judges and federal appellate court judges follow a code of conduct and ethical rules. The only people in the entire federal government that have no ethical constraints on them are the nine people in the U.S. Supreme Court. Who do they think they are? They don't get to operate without any ethical constraints. And now more than ever, we have to place ethical constraints on them because a number of them made misleading statements to get confirmed. The draft opinion that came out was an extreme opinion that overruled Roe v. Wade, and it's going to result in government-mandated pregnancies and the criminalization of abortion. And it contains this statement. Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. Is that what these conservative justices said in their confirmation hearings? Not at all. They conveyed the exact opposite sentiment. Samuel Alito, in 2006, in his confirmation hearing under oath, stated, Roe v. Wade is an important precedent of the Supreme Court. It is a precedent that has now been on the books for several decades. It has been challenged. It has been reaffirmed. Neil Gorsuch, in 2017, it's been publicly reported that he said to Senator Lindsey Graham he would have walked out the door had the former president asked him to overturn Roe. And under oath in his confirmation hearing, Neil Gorsuch said the following. I will tell you that Roe v. Wade, decided in 1973, is a president of the United States Supreme Court. It has been reaffirmed. A good judge will consider it as president of the U.S. Supreme Court worthy as treatment of president like any other. Did he say that Roe was egregiously wrong from the start? No, he did not. What did Brett Kavanaugh say in his 2018 confirmation hearing? First of all, it's been publicly reported that he misled Senator Susan Collins and that he considered Roe to be settled law. And in his confirmation hearing, he stated the following. It is settled as a president of the Supreme Court entitled to respect under principles of stare decisis. The Supreme Court has recognized the right to abortion since the 1970 Roe v. Wade case. It has been reaffirmed many times. Did Brett Kavanaugh say Roe was egregiously wrong from the start? No, he did not. 
These three justices misled the American people under oath. They need to apologize to the American people for doing so. And why did they not tell the truth? Why did they not say what they believed, which was Roe was egregiously wrong from the start? Because if they said that, they would not have been confirmed. We need an ethical code of conduct on these Supreme Court justices. They should not be able to mislead the American people in order to get into power. Now, let's talk a little bit about this leak. The conservative founder of the conservative magazine, The Weekly Standard, states that he believed the leak came from the conservative side of the U.S. Supreme Court. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. What purpose does Mr. Johnson of Louisiana seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, look, judicial ethics is worthy of examination, and sure, it's within our jurisdiction, but the Democrats' goal here today with this legislation is, is, is abundantly clear. It's been stated, maybe not intentionally, but this is not really about judicial ethics. Uh, this is about what's happening at the court right now, and this is another attempt by them to bully the court and to usurp its judicial independence, which is a foundational principle of our entire system. Look, Democrats have engaged in a consistent and recurrent pattern of attempting to malign and unduly influence the justices of the court. And there's a reason for that, because they want them to be reluctant to strike down their radical progressive agenda that they're trying to push on the American people. In March of 2020, everybody knows Senator Schumer, he stood out on the steps of the Supreme Court and he threatened, openly threatened the conservative justices on the court. It was, it was an incredible thing. And I, it, in, a, in a moment of candor, many of you would probably agree that that was so far over the line and he said, quote, I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you'll pay the price. You won't know what hits you if you go forward with these awful decisions. The day he was there, he was talking about a Louisiana pro-life law that was being litigated, being argued before the court. I was actually the, the attorney who argued that court in the district court many years prior. Nothing radical about that at all. It was to protect women, this health and safety of women. But Senate Democrats have also in, uh, attempted to intimidate the court through amicus briefs. Uh, they, they have hinted that the Senate would, quote, restructure the court if it did not reach the Democrats' favorite outcome in these cases. And you heard it plainly and bluntly here today. They, they've openly admitted. I mean, the whole deal is that we're going to pack the court. They want to add justices to the court because they're well, concerned the about yield. this. I will not yield. No, I will not. And, and, and now, on, on May 2nd, there's been this, this shocking and unprecedented leak of the uh, uh, Alito's draft opinion in the Dobbs case. And uh, much has been said about it because it should. Now, we don't know the identity of, of the, the individual who leaked this, uh, but, but we need to find out because it's unleashed a fury and an outcry that is aimed directly at the conservative justices that Senate Democrats and House Democrats have openly threatened in the public square. This is dangerous, not only to the individuals involved, but also to our entire system. Now, why the outrage? Why the, why the public outcry? Why all of these desperate measures? Because they know what that Dobbs opinion is about and what it apparently may ultimately do. After 50 years, almost 50 years, the most anticipated, most important Supreme Court decision. Why is that? Because let's put it bluntly, and you can shake your heads, you can look at your phones, but this is the facts, okay? Roe v. Wade gave constitutional cover to the elective killing of unborn children in America, period. Think about it, let it settle on you. As a result, the lives of more than 63 million American children have been lost. Think about the staggering implications of that. I was born in January 1972. I'm just a year older, almost exactly a year older than Roe. If you look at the stats, I want you to think about this. 63 million represents somewhere between one half and one third of my entire generation. My high school class should have been almost twice as large as it was. And all of you, if you're under the age of 50, your class should have been twice as large or maybe a third larger than it was. Your classmates were not allowed to be born. You think about the implications of that on the economy. We're all struggling here to, to cover the bases of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and all the rest. If we had all those able-bodied workers in the economy, we wouldn't be going upside down and toppling over like this. Listen, the gentleman I yield. will not yield, I will not. Roe was a terrible corruption of America's constitutional jurisprudence, period. Elective abortion does not appear anywhere in the Constitution, not in its text, its structure, or its original meaning. And because of that, in our system, the decision is supposed to be left to the states, to the people. That's where it will be restored when the Dobbs decisions come down. We hope, we pray, but the, the whole purpose of this, no pretense here, the whole purpose is to try to intimidate those five conservative justices, possibly six, 
who have at least implied or indicated that they may actually finally acknowledge the absurdity of the road opinion. It has no foundation in the law. They invented the right to abortion out of thin air, period. And that's what the state of Mississippi is arguing in Dobbs. And finally, hopefully, common sense will prevail. We will return this decision to the people where it belonged in the beginning, and that will be a great day in America. So listen, jump up and down, scream, do it under the guise of judicial ethics, try everything you're going to. The gentleman yield? I will not yield, Mr. Chairman. This is too important. The American people are gonna let their voices be heard in November. The justices may do the right thing prior to that, and we can't wait. That day can't come soon enough. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Uh, move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I uh, thank the distinguished chairman for uh, your leadership, and certainly thank my colleague from Georgia, uh, Chairman Johnson, for uh, his advocacy and for moving this important legislation forward. I respect my colleague from the great state of Louisiana, strongly disagree with his conclusions, jurisprudentially, uh, about Roe v. Wade. It was a sound judicial decision. It's 49 years of precedent that Supreme Court justices, when they were before the Senate, said was precedent that should be respected. And of course, there's reason to believe that they misrepresented their position solely so that they could get confirmation and then do exactly the opposite. I'm also shocked at my colleagues' sudden interest, not my specific colleague from Louisiana, but all of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, their sudden interest in decorum. What happened to your interest in decorum as it relates to the January 6th violent insurrection that you called a peaceful protest, that you called legitimate political discourse, a normal tourist visit, what happened to your interest in decorum then? I find it ironic also that there's this defense, this reflexive defense of Justice Clarence Thomas. Justice Thomas is not above the law. Justice Thomas is not above public scrutiny. Justice Thomas is not above public accountability. He's a public servant, an Article III judge. He's not above scrutiny. A few days ago, Justice Thomas had the nerve to accuse others of trying to bully him and the Supreme Court, and also express concern for people in America increasingly being unwilling to accept outcomes that they don't like. Are you kidding me? No one is trying to bully Clarence Thomas and this runaway Supreme Court majority. This runaway Supreme Court majority and Clarence Thomas are trying to abuse and bully the American people, particularly. I would ask that the gentleman's words be taken down. The gentleman should understand that the personality's rule does not apply to Supreme Court justices. Just, just the ethics rules, but not the decorum rules. <laughs> that is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for correctly understanding the rules. <laughs> Nobody is trying to bully the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is trying to bully the American people by taking away the rights of women to make their own health care decisions, their freedom to make their own health care decisions, and instead impose government-mandated pregnancies, even in the case of rape or incest. That's extreme, that's cruel, that's bullying. And if Justice Thomas really wants to deal with bullying in America or this problem of people supposedly unwilling to accept outcomes that they don't like, I've got some advice for Justice Thomas. Start in your own home. Have a conversation with Jeannie Thomas. She refused to accept the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election. Why? Because she didn't like the outcome. And so instead, she tried to steal the election, overthrow the United States government, and install a tyrant. That's bullying. That's being unwilling to accept 
an outcome because you don't like the results, because the former twice impeached so-called president of the United States of America lost legitimately to Joe Biden. How did she respond? Instead, she said, the Bidens should face a military tribunal in Guantanamo Bay on trumped up charges of sedition. You've got to be kidding me. And lastly, let me ask this question of Brother Thomas. Why are you such a hater? Hate on civil rights, hate on women's rights, hate on reproductive rights, hate on voting rights, hate on marital rights, hate on equal protection under the law, hate on liberty and justice for all, hate on free and fair elections. Why are you such a hater? And you think you can get away with it, escape public scrutiny, because you think that shamelessness is your superpower? Uh, Mr. Chairman, a point well, of here's, order. Here's a news flash Mr. Chairman, straight from the House Judiciary a Committee. Point of order. Truth Time crust the to the ground will rise Time. again, and truth will Time. be your kryptonite. Point of Time order. of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman, Mr. Chairman, point, point of order. The state is point of order. The gentleman appeared to just call Justice Thomas a hater. I do not believe that that is permitted under the House's rules of debate and decorum. The rule against personalities does not apply outside this institution or the President of the United Mr. States. Mr. Chairman. Read the rules. Mr. Chairman. Uh, who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. For what purpose does Mr. Jordan seek recognition? To speak on the, whatever we're speaking on, the bill or amendment. I don't know where I had to step over and vote in the other committee. Strike the last word. Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Not bullying the court. One year ago, actually 13 months ago, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives introduced a bill to pack the court. The President of the United States set up a commission to look into packing the court. Last week, we had for the first time in my lifetime someone leak an opinion of the court. Next week, while we're still wanting to know if that opinion, if opinion is gonna be the actual opinion or not this draft opinion, this committee is having a hearing on the subject of that leaked opinion. And the last speaker just called a Supreme Court justice all kinds of terrible things. And they say they're not trying to bully the court. I think the American people can look at that set of facts over the last 13 months and conclude that's exactly what they're trying to do. It doesn't take a genius to figure out you're trying to intimidate the court. We're going to pack the court. We're going to protest in front of your house. We're going to leak opinions. We're going to, in the Judiciary Committee, call you names. The chairman of the Judiciary Committee is going to introduce the legislation to pack the court. But oh, no, no, no. We're not trying to bully the court. You got to be kidding me. Anyone can figure it out what you're all doing. Anyone can figure, anyone with common sense can figure it out. That's what, that's exactly what's going on. Will the gentleman yield? I'm going to yield to my colleague from Louisiana. Mr. Chairman. I'll take it, and I appreciate that very much. Look, it's been said they're maligning the court here and, and, and actually having quite a bit of fun with it. How, how great that the rules don't apply, that we can attack their character. Like they're not here to defend themselves. Uh, but, but what they've said, I mean, Mr. Liu and others are quoting uh, Justices Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch in their confirmation hearings as if they said something that was false or misleading in any way. They described Roe as settled precedent. Well, yeah. Roe is settled precedent. That's common sense. You learned that in your first uh, week of law school, what precedent is, right? What, there's nothing earth shattering or, or uh, uh, revealing about that at all. Uh, they, they said, uh, you know, Justice, uh, I believe it was Gorsuch, they asked him, is it, uh, is it super precedent, sir? And he declined to respond because it's an amorphous term and no one knows what that means. None of the conservative justices, not a one of them, Go to factcheck.org. If you're watching at home on C-SPAN, go to factcheck.org and check out what these guys are trying to argue over here. It's not true. None of these justices misled the, the Senate. They spoke clearly and concisely about the position. This was settled precedent, but it was precedent that was wrong, has always been wrong, and the court has overturned settled precedent before. That's what's happening here. It's Did outrageous. It is outrageous. Does the gentleman yield? Sure, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield. Um, you know, we can all have our views of uh, settling precedent and of our of Ginny Thomas's conduct and Justice Thomas's conduct, and I think someone m mentioned um, uh, Justice former G Justice Ginsburg before, and packing the court and um, 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 uh, Roe v. Wade and all this. It's very interesting, and we have strong disagreements. But show me in this bill where any of this is talked about. 
Mr. Chairman. Show me in this bill where any of this is talked about. It. Mr. Chairman. Here it is. All this bill does is impose a, uh, 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 a code of conduct, a code of ethics on the Supreme Court. Yes. As, as and, is on, as rec is on reclaim my time, Mr. Chairman. Yes. And we acknowledge that judicial ethics is an important topic of debate and conversation and, and discussion. What's your problem? Because that's not the impetus for this hearing, and everybody knows it, and the comments of our colleagues on the other side confirm what this is about. The reason that we are here today, the reason that we are spending time on this subject is because you guys are uncomfortable with what is deemed to be a pending decision of the court on what may be the most important precedent uh, in, in, in most important decision in 50 years. Will, you, will the gentleman yield? I, I will not yield. Listen, this is a this is a ruse. This is a guise. This wasn't a big uh, a big agenda item. Why didn't we do this? If this is such a pressing matter, why didn't we do it earlier in the in the in the Congress? You're using this as an occasion to come in here and grandstand about Dobbs for your base. Period. I'm, look, we're just talking about facts and truth today. That is the facts. And sometimes facts are stubborn things, as John Adams said. I, I'll, I'll yield back the remainder of my time. Ms. Will the gentleman yield? The gentleman yields back. A no, no, it's my time. It's my time. Oh, I'm sorry. The gentleman. April 15th, they introduced legislation to pack the court. Last week, we have a leak. Next week, we're having a hearing. The last speech called the Supreme Court, just one of our Supreme Court justices, all kinds of names, as they're being, these same justices are being uh, protested at their homes. That is bullying the court. Plain Will the gentleman and yield? Simple. That is bullying the court. I, I, I got a couple seconds. I'd be happy to yield. Yeah, look, you know, Mr. Johnson of Louisiana previously described this as an effort to intimidate the majority. Je the time of the gentleman has expired. Who seeks recognition? For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Let's strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. If I have time, Mr. Jones, I'll, I'll yield. I appreciate I, your I courtesy. To, I need to um, just uh, proceed for a moment. Um, and maybe in the middle of it, I'll yield you a minute, I mean, uh, some seconds. <laughs> um, let, me, um, let me join with my colleagues who sensibly recognize that this is not out of the ordinary. Now, we are dealing with a Trump court uh, that uh, many of these individuals have come out of the Federalist Society, but uh, obviously, uh, someone has said, uh, to the victor goes the spoils. But many of us, law students and lawyers, held the Supreme Court in the highest of esteem. We are products by study or by knowledge of the likes of Justice Warren, uh, Justice Marshall, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and many of the court's decisions that came out in the Roosevelt courts, some many people disagreed with, but they were decisions that enhanced the American people. How absurd is it that the sensible legislation that I'm original co-sponsor that Congressman Hakeem Jeffries have offered, sensible, practical, non-threatening, that simply would require the Supreme Court after notice and public comment to itself develop and issue a binding code of conduct applicable to the justices, not written by Congress, not written by the president, self-oversight. The court writes its ethics, dealing with matters of recusal, when their family members, closely held businesses, and others close to them. Do the American people not deserve this kind of integrity in the highest court in the land? Do they not deserve truth? Do they not deserve that when I go before the court as a pauper, I will be heard without bias? When my case goes before the court on a death penalty case, I will be heard without bias. I don't have that confidence anymore. In law school, I received the Earl Warren Training Scholarship. How honored I was. A Republican, appointed by a Republican president, who held up the integrity of the Constitution. 
But I begin to wonder about a Trump court. And I wonder about the advice and consent of the Senate that I watched closely. I disagreed with Gorsuch's confirmation, Kavanaugh's confirmation, Amy Barrett, Amy Coleman Barrett's confirmation. Yes, uh, we have difference of opinion. They are conservative jurists. But I still held the court in the esteem that decisions would be made and that the oath that they took before the Senate when they were in confirmation, where they distinctly all said they agreed in settled law. Brown versus the Board of Education is a settled law. That we don't segregate in education. I have no confidence whatsoever that me, my daughter, my grandchildren will be safe with this court or any court thereof that they have now breached not only the question of settled law, but they breach the confirmation process, which is a sacred process. As I watched what happened to Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, how they pierced into every line of her decisions and wanted her over and over again to reject the notion of any idea that she supported porn to the extent of absurdity, and she answered truthfully under oath someone that President Biden nominated, and yet this court has not seen fit to carry that forward. Yes, I believe it is timely for this ethics legislation. It is not pointed. It has nothing to do with threats. It has something to do with the self-oversight that is long overdue. The Constitution begs for a court with integrity. I mean, my good friend is not in the rule. I take issue with you charging any African-American chairperson with racism. They're not in the room. That may be a statement of someone's philosophy when that term is used, yeah. that they're not advocating for the greater good of people who were enslaved. The time of the, the time so of I the, ask, forgive me, Mr. Jones, I ask to have this legislation supported, Mr. Chairman, and ask that the integrity to the Supreme Court be restored on behalf of the American people. Time of the I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose is Mr. Bensey recognition? I'll strike the last word, Mr. Chair. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me begin by saying that I join in the remarks uh, previously made by the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I thought this was going to be a discussion about this bill, uh, but of course, as has been indicated, uh, it's, the bill is, is, a, is a mere pretext, a device, a means of raising uh, the issue of Roe versus Wade and the uncomfortable uh, feelings that, the, that the, my Democrat colleagues have with that possible outcome. I also, I wanna take this opportunity to to condemn in the strongest possible way the uh, leak of the, of the uh, so-called uh, draft opinion. We don't know that. And the fact that uh, we're having this hearing, of course, just illustrates the importance of this issue to so many people. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I am struck by the failure of my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle to condemn as strongly as they've been condemning, condemning January 6th, the fire bombings of two right to life facilities, one in Oregon and one in Madison, Wisconsin, on Mother's Day just a few days ago. Where's the outrage? Where's the, where's the statements of, of uh, condemnation that we hear about January 6th? Why aren't those who have raised that issue over and over and over again, the one about January 6th, why aren't they standing up and saying, don't rise up and try to burn things down. Why aren't they saying that, Mr. Chair? And in fact, it was spray painted on the, this was spray painted on the building in Madison, Wisconsin. If abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either. Where's the outrage? Where, why aren't people standing up and saying, no, don't? You certainly have said it often enough about January 6th. Now I had in my own words, condemned what I thought in the, most, the strongest possible terms of the events of January 6th. I'm kind of waiting to hear you guys do the same thing regarding what happened on Mother's Day when two right-to-life clinics were firebombed. Molotov cocktails thrown at both of them. 
It's a wonder nobody was hurt. Where's the outrage? Where's the condemnation? Mr. Chair, I wanna just briefly say why I see the bill today as a, as a, as a sham. It's, it's, it's simple because if you do the briefest of research, you will find that in all probability that which is suggested in this bill is unconstitutional. And in fact, I have had time, of course, to scribble down some quotes as I've listened to what's been going on. Professor Morgan from George Washington University says, one might imagine some members of the current Congress wanting to use what they might call ethic standards, for example, to reduce the court's power of judicial review. Congress has wisely not tested those limits for the last couple hundred years. Wisely not tested those limits. It has been said by other constitutional scholars that the reason this won't work constitutionally is that Congress did not create the Supreme Court. The Constitution did, and thus, since we didn't create it, we can't change it. So this is a pretext, this is a device. We have separate branches of government for a really good reason. I can only imagine that if the members of the Supreme Court are watching right now, how they reflect upon the wisdom of the separate nature of our branches of government because they certainly must find it amusing as they watch this exercise today. Share with that, I yield um, to, uh, yes, uh, yeah, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, um, thank you. Uh, one point to be made uh, along the same lines about the very bill before us is that the final section provides that in the event, it is a change in practice for recusal, extending to the United States Supreme Court, not only to lower courts, but that it allows then a party to bring a recusal motion against one of the sitting justices, and then to allow um, th that to be decided, not by the justice, but by the full court. Consider what the change in the balance and how power is distributed on the Supreme Court would be as a result of that. Assume there's a, a moderate uh, wing of the court and a conservative and a liberal uh, wing. It would then give rise to new power struggles on the court if it were followed for a member of a moderate uh, faction to, to take out of power, to prevent from participating, either one of the judges on the left or on the right, in a way that the Constitution doesn't envision and would be imposed by this legislation. It, I mean, this, that's just one example. I'm going to come back with more, but the uh, legislation is unwise. Uh, thank you. Will, will the gentleman yield? The time of the gentleman uh, has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion here today, and it's kind of amazing that all we're talking about is having some ethics laws for the highest court in the land. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody, I think, should agree that they should have a code of ethics and recuse themselves when they have conflicts, and they don't have such and they don't do such. Uh, Mr. Issa, my good friend from California, said there's been 240 years of the court and there's never been a problem. <laughs> there's never been a problem. Um, Chief Justice Taney was an outright racist and issued the opinion that uh, Dred Scott decision, slavery was fine and dandy. Uh, that was about uh, the first 80 years of the court. We were fine with slavery and that was okay. And then we had a bunch of other, we didn't have much transparency and we didn't know what the court was doing. Uh, we've learned a lot more about what Congress does and what presidents do. Before Watergate, there was a whole a lot of laws we didn't have either, but because of the abuses of Nixon and that administration, we got some ethics laws that are, are improved to government. We've learned some things the court's done that were wrong and it's been brought out how Ms. Thomas was involved in trying to overthrow the government and Clarence Thomas didn't recuse himself. If that wasn't enough, Dianu, they had trips that they were spent a lot of money on and by groups that had interest before the court. They didn't disclose that. Dianu, they had situations where they had uh, um, the Federal Society met with them and apparently three of the justices did what is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate sin. They lied to Congress when they were under oath. They said that Roe was the law of the land, it was settled, it was not disputed, and precedent mattered, and it had been the law for 50 years. Three of them did that, they lied. 
under oath. Testifying before the Senate in a confirmation hearing is not about slip and slide. It's not about a wink and like, oh, okay, it was political. He, they did that to get in. It, they lied. Perjury. That's the worst thing a justice could do because they're supposed to be honest, above board, and justice is blind. Diana, if that wasn't enough. They stopped President Obama from even having a nomination that this Constitution said the president nominates. They would not have Merrick Garland a hearing. Mr. Bishop said something about what if there's a moderate? That was a moderate. They wouldn't even give a moderate a hearing. Dianu. And then it comes up where Justice Ginsburg dies and it's just about a month to go before the election and the McConnell rule is no longer important. It's not necessary that they have to wait because it's an election process and the people should vote on this justice. They rushed Amy Coney Barrett through. Dianu. And with Kavanaugh, the FBI didn't even do an investigation. Would Senator the gentleman yield? Yes. What does Dianu mean? I'm going to send you back to, to Sunday school. Well, for many people here may not know. Well, it means if that's not enough and, and, and more, et cetera. I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Matt Gates would have got it. He got Jermaine is not just a Jackson. Will, will, will the gentleman yield? I will, but I was on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> I th I'm going to continue rolling. Uh, the fact is, they, they have embarrassed the court with the process, with the lies and the answers at their hearings, and not allowing Merrick Garland to have a hearing, and getting Barrett through at the last minute, and Kavanaugh, the FBI didn't follow up. We know what happened on the second floor. Yeah, he was young. He still abused and assaulted that woman, and he lied about it. And they're all kind of, there's issues about who paid his debts. He had tremendous debts, tremendous debts, baseball ticket debts, all kind of debts. All of a sudden, they disappeared. And we don't know because there's no requirement that somebody who gave, might have paid off his debts or gave him some money have, it has to be disclosed. That's why this law is important. This bill has been along a long time before Clarence Thomas came around. The discussion two weeks ago or a week ago wasn't about Clarence Thomas. It was about ethics in the Supreme Court. Those are all good reasons to pass this bill, independent of Clarence Thomas, who disgraces the memory of Thurgood Marshall. And with that, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back for what purpose does Mr. McClintock seek recognition? To uh, speak on the motion. Gentleman is recognized to strike the last word, I assume. Mr. Chairman, what's the motion? The, the motion strike is the, last the, word. the chairman's motion to um, to adopt the ANS. Is which there is not is recognized. under the five minute rule. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. In, in Federalist 51, Alexander Hamilton addressed the very subject that, that we're now discussing. In his words, whether the Supreme Court ought to be a distinct body or a branch of the legislature. He went on to argue forcefully for a distinct body. Uh, he, he dismissed the anti-federalist arguments that, uh, by noting, as Mr. Biggs did earlier in this discussion, uh, that the impeachment check was, quote, an, a, a, a complete, uh, is alone a complete security. If a justice accepts a bribe or commits treason or commits some other high crime or misdemeanor, impeach them. But beyond this, the Supreme Court cannot be made a branch of the legislature subject to the rules and edicts imposed upon them by the legislative branch. If the legislative branch can impose or, or delegate to some other body the power to impose rules and regulations upon the Supreme Court, it has become a branch of the legislature. If we can do that, then why can we not require the court to hold all of its deliberations and votes in public? Why can we not require all drafts of decisions to be circulated in public? Why can we not require judges to report any conversations they have with their spouses? The court itself is presumed to have the greatest stake in its reputation as an institution, just by the way as the Congress is presumed to do so in its deliberations and, and, and conduct. That's why Congress establishes its own code of ethics 
and it polices and enforces that code, just as the court cannot impose its standards on an independent Congress, neither can the Congress impose its standards on an independent Supreme Court. Will the gentleman yield? Is, no, I will not. That is what defines a distinct body, uh, as both the Supreme Court and the Congress were designed to be. Uh, constitutional scholars appearing before this committee and our counterpart in the Senate have repeatedly told us so. Uh, uh, this year, uh, uh, Thomas H. Dupree told the Senate Judiciary Committee that ordering the justices to adopt a code of conduct with 100, uh, within 180 days offends the separation of powers. And he went on to say, it is the Supreme Court, not the Congress, that has the prerogative under our constitutional structure to decide whether to adopt a code of conduct governing the justices themselves. And J Justice Roberts made this report, uh, this, this point um, in his year-end report last year. Uh, he said the judiciary's power to manage its internal affairs insulates courts from inappropriate political influence, and it is crucial to preserving public trust in its work as a separate and co-equal branch of government. We have had a ponderous dose of inappropriate political influence uh, expressed here today. What the Democrats really object to is the decisions that this court may make, particularly the, the Dobbs case. Well, I sympathize with you. I truly do. Uh, Republicans have objected to the decision of the court under Roe for the last 50 years. But you know, that's our process. As Churchill said, democracy is the occasional necessity of deferring to the opinions of others. When we object to any decision, whether by the Congress or the President or the court, we don't attack the fundamental foundations of our Constitution in a free society. And let me pause here and note that no one that I know defends the disgraceful disruption of Congress's counting of ballots on January 6th. That's not the way we behave in a free society in a republic such as ours. Instead, we muster argument and reason in the faith that sounder opinions and principles and policies will ultimately triumph. In the case of Dobbs, if, by the way, this leaked document is the decision in the Dobbs case, nothing in it bans abortion. It rightly notes that the Constitution is silent on this question, and therefore it doesn't belong to the court, but rather to the people through our democratic process. The, uh, the Democrats object to um, allowing our democracy to decide this question. And that's rather curious, considering their constant refrain that democracy is under attack whenever they don't get their way. I yield Would back. the gentleman yield? No, I yield back. The gentleman yields, gentleman yields back for our purpose. Does Ms. Bush seek recognition? For what purpose does Ms. Bush seek recognition? Uh, I think your mic is muted, Ms. Bush. Mr. Keller, Mr. Keller, Mr. Keller uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Ladies recognized. Yes, we did. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to make clear that uh, what we're discussing um, and why we're discussing Clarence Thomas today is not because he's a black man. Let's just be clear not discussing him because he's a black man. We're discussing Clarence Thomas because he is corrupt. In fact, on the former point, we all just saw how difficult it was to get a black woman on the court, the first in 233 years. This is not a discussion about any one justice. I was proud to support the nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson and will continue to support the nomination of moral justices. But what we're talking about cannot be solved with just one justice alone. We need to fundamentally change how the court operates. I am strongly supportive of HR 7647 because the Supreme Court lacks credibility. It's also why I support HR 2584, the Judiciary Act to expand the Supreme Court. Each and every day, this court is allowed to operate in the way that it currently does. It loses credibility. Simply put, the court has never been and is not reflective of the rich diversity of America. It does not reflect this country, both in the justices that make up the majority on the bench and in the decisions those justices render. 
decisions that affect people like me, millions of people who've been unhoused or faced housing insecurity, people who have decided to have abortions and those who rely on access to it, who face barriers to voting or been denied health care. As a nurse, I understand the role ethics have in my job every day um, as I worked as a nurse. And as a member of Congress, I understand it there too. So there's no reason for the Supreme Court to not also have a code of ethics guiding justices in their work. Thank you. And I yield, with the, the, remainder lady Leo. I yield the, the remainder of my time. I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Jones. Thank you to the gentlelady from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, so much has been said today, and I don't have enough time to respond to all of it, but I just wanted to make a few quick points. Uh, my friend, Mr. Johnson of Louisiana, described common sense, broadly popular ethics reforms at the Supreme Court, which is to say, to create ethics that apply to the Supreme Court justices at all, because they just don't exist right now as some effort to impose a progressive agenda, to intimidate the justices to allow the imposition of a progressive agenda. And I just can't help but think in my confusion by Mr. Johnson's point that Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973 by a majority of Republican appointed justices. And so is, is, is Roe v. Wade, which was the, decided by a majority of Republican justices on the Supreme Court, the progressive agenda that he has in mind? Or, or is he talking about the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is the greatest legislative achievement of the civil rights movement, something that was reauthorized unanimously in the Senate in 2006 and nearly unanimously in this body, in the House of Representatives in 2006, but yet was, was gutted by the Roberts Court beginning in 2013 in a decision called Shelley v. Holder. And of course, that was followed up uh, in July of last year in, in the evisceration of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, of the original Voting Rights Act of 1965. Was the, the Voting Rights Act, which was unanimously reauthorized or nearly unanimously reauthorized in the House in 2006, was that the progressive agenda that Mr. Johnson has in mind, I think more realistically, what we are seeing is an effort by my Republican colleagues to distract from the assault, the unprecedented assault on fundamental rights by this rogue far right majority on the Supreme Court of the United States. We've seen it in the form of uh, so much intense focus on the leak uh, and of course on the peaceful lawful protest outside of the home of Brett Kavanaugh. This is meant to distract the attention of the American people from the fact that it's not just going to be the fundamental right to abortion, which has been enjoyed for nearly 50 years in this country and was settled law, distinction on the word settled. It's not just precedent, but settled precedent is what these Supreme Court justices said in their confirmation hearings, which means they're not going to change it but it's also other unenumerated rights. You heard reference to a penumbra of unenumerated rights by Mr. Gomer. They're talking now about coming for contraception and the ability of people to marry people of the same gender and of course of, the diff of a different race uh, yeah. as was described in the Loving decision. So there's a lot on the line here. The time uh, and of it's the important general, that the American people the, know about it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The time of the gentle the gentlelady has expired. For what purpose does Mr. Fitzgerald seek recognition? Right, the last word. Gentleman is recognized. You my time to Mr. Roy. I, I thank the gentleman. Um, there's been a number of things here that 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 merit um, response. I mean, first of all, I've, I've been hearing a lot here about oh, that we need to get back to the underlying purpose of the of the uh, uh, bill in question. Great. I align myself to the remarks of Mr. McClintock from California. We're talking about imposing rules on the court. There is a debate here that we ought to have a robust debate uh, rather than pushing this through. Uh, without having that robust debate about imposing rules on the court and separation of powers. But the fact is, and the reason we're having this uh, more broad discussion, is that it was very clear that that's not what this is about. With all due respect to the gentleman, as I quoted earlier in your opening remarks, right, the very words you used was, let's not pretend this is enough. Nothing will be enough unless we expand the court. That, that was in the gentleman's statement, which tells you what this is about. 
And that's what everything that, that I think is driving the conversation when my colleagues say, well, why are you talking about these other things? It's because that's what the gentleman said. I, I'll try to yield a minute if I, get, if I can get to it. And, and that, I think, is, is, is setting the stage for what we're talking about. I've heard a lot here and a lot of disparaging comments being directed at members of the court for what they allegedly said in their uh, hearings and to members in the Senate. Most of this has been laid to bear if you go back and look at what they actually said. For exam example, Justice Gorsuch in his 2017 confirmation hearing said that Roe is, quote, a president of the United States Supreme Court, a president of the United States Supreme Court. It was reaffirmed in Casey in 1992 and in several other cases. So a good judge will consider it as president of the U.S. Supreme Court worthy as treatment of precedent like any other. In another exchange, Gorsuch said he would have, quote, walked out the door if President Trump had asked him to commit to overturning Roe. That's not what judges do. Justice Kavanaugh, during the 2018 spectacle that passed as his confirmation hearings, noted that Roe had been reaffirmed many times. He also declined to prejudge cases. You have an open mind. You get the briefs and arguments, and some arguments are better than others. Precedent is critically important. It is the foundation of our system. But you listen to all arguments. That's what he said. Justice Barrett, uh, and, and feature a discussion about the academic concept of a, quote, super president, essentially whether a matter is, no, is so settled no one challenges it. Quote, she said, I'm answering a lot of questions about Roe, she said, which I think indicates that Roe doesn't fall into that category. There, there was nothing here that matches what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are throwing as disparaging remarks about these particular justices committing one way or the other. In the words of Justice Roberts, calling balls and strikes, making a determination on what they believe the law is. I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle don't believe the court should have blindly adhered to Plessy, right? We, we don't accept that we should have blindly adhered to Plessy as binding precedent. Yet there was a conversation that I think really important from Elena Kagan's uh, confirmation hearing in 2009, I think that was when it was, when she said, First, uh, in, in paraphrasing, that there were two ways to amend the Constitution. One was under Article 5. The second, and this is my words, judicial activism. What she said was she embarked on a description of school segregation and that it was acknowledged and accepted by the 14th Amendment drafters and or ratifiers, then set in stone by Plessy v. Ferguson. Senator Cornyn then engaged in questioning of her, pretty open questioning about saying, wait a minute, uh, 19th century Senator Charles Sumner had suggested that the ratifiers understood the 14th Amendment to condemn separate but equal. Then Elena Kagan backed away and said, well, I did not say that Brown changed the Constitution, rather that Brown interpreted it differently. Now we can go through and play the tape and all that. All I'm saying is she was dancing around the activism of the court that she was putting forward in much of the way of Justice Thurgood Marshall to do what you think is right and let the law catch up. Classic activism. So we can have a debate about that, about whether did she abuse the process in sort of playing a game about what is or is not activism. But the justices are answering questions, or the, or the possible justices are answering the questions, all about what is settled law. And this is what is at the core of this debate, and we're talking about Roe, and we'll debate that and talk about it next week, and we'll see what the court does in offering an opinion. But when we say we're going to blindly just adhere to some opinion, right, as settled law, that would have been exactly the case with Plessy, and of course, that would have been the wrong approach. Whether you believe they just simply got Plessy wrong, because that's not what the ratifiers meant, and then, or whether you believe, as Kagan said, we're just gonna make up the law, because that's basically what she said. I think that would be the wrong approach. I think it's saying the actual Plessy decision was wrong. But this is what we're talking about, is justices, and I'm not gonna sit here and just let these justices on the court get absolutely disparaged as having lied under oath, as my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are saying. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bishop. For what purposes does Mr. Bishop seek recognition? Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will report the amendment. I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Am I recognized, Mr. Chairman? Oh, she's reading. She's reading. I'm sorry. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 76. That objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, early in the, in the markup, uh, in response, I think, to Mr. Jordan's comments or someone's, the chairman made the point that you had said in the opening that, uh, and I don't remember precisely the words, that, uh, that, the, that the leak of the draft opinion from the Supreme Court in, in, in an unprecedented 
exposure of its internal deliberations was a, a matter of considerable concern. And, and I appreciate that sentiment, although there's been obviously a grave division here in the discussion or the debate today so far on the bill. But, uh, but given that acknowledgement, uh, this amendment would seek to do something about it. That is, uh, what is before the body is a, is a, a, a bill to uh, require uh, an ethical co ethics code and so forth at the Supreme Court. I've spoken to one part that I think is gravely concerning, the notion that the Supreme Court will decide recusal motions as a whole. I think that would be ill-advised. Ill but this amendment uh, does something very simple. It says that uh, in addition to the provisions already there about um, uh, establishing rules concerning the disclosure of gifts, travel, and so forth, that there all, the, the rules will also govern the disclosure of non-public court documents, including draft opinions and other court documents reflecting the confidential deliberations of the court by any justice and any law clerk to a justice, uh, and, and will provide procedures to address and prevent the unauthorized disclosure of non-public court documents. So we have, by virtue of this unprecedented attack on the court as an institution, which is what that represents, and um, I, I have heard some members uh, here today on the other side of the aisle have suggested, suggested they don't not concerned about that attack. We should all be concerned about it, and it is certainly of equal moment to the notion uh, brought up as it is and under the timing that it is, that, there's, that this body ought to be attempting, uh, perhaps in conflict with the Constitution, to establish an ethical code for the court. So at the very least, if we're doing that, uh, let's uh, require, uh, to the extent of our ability, the uh, court also to, to take steps so that these attacks, now that they've been sprung, now that they are in vogue, uh, they, they be acted upon and prevented in the future. And uh, I wonder if anybody wants uh, failing. I, well, I guess before I yield back, given I'll, the availability I'll, of time, do you, I will. Uh, if the gentleman I, will yield. Uh, well, let me let me take the time myself because I, I wanted to to put a finer point or, or, or further extend uh, the comments of Mr. Roy about what the rhetoric has been on an, on this notion that over and over again the Supreme Court justices lied. Somebody said. Uh, engaged in deceit and, uh, and so forth. That's simply not true. And, the, and to, to the point about what much of what is going on here, these, when, when it is understood, I mean, the folks who've made the accusation understand what is meant in the confirmation proceedings when justices talk about what is settled law. It means that the principle of stare decisis applies the court has to follow principles when, but it's always subject to reevaluation under the under the doctrine of stare decisis, and there's never been any misleading about that. But um, you know, just to recount everybody on this body, this committee of the of the House of Representatives on the judiciary, Mr. Jones said that the uh, justices um, are. Uh, uh, deceived their way onto the court, four justices, because they acknowledged Roe as, as precedent. Mr. Liu said that the justice, four justices made misleading statements in their confirmation. Ms. Jackson Lee said uh, they breached the confirmation process. She said, she, she gave the example, she said Brown versus Board of Education is settled law, but Brown overturned settled law. Plessy versus Ferguson. Mr. Cohen said they lied. I mean, Mr. Roy has been through it about what it means, but everybody knows it. That's the problem. So when we're talking about what we're engaged in here, we're following one week after a, an attack on the United States Supreme Court as an institution by the leak from its deliberations. This body has multiple members attacking the Supreme Court <coughs> by purporting to characterize as deceitful conduct and lies and so forth something that is entirely understood and understandable and established in the law. That is what the, what the principle of stare decisis is and when and under what circumstances the time of the gentleman precedents are subject to reconsideration. I yield time back. of the gentleman has expired. Does the gentlelady insist on a point of order? I do, Mr. Chairman. Putting aside uh, disagreements with one, many of the points, um, there are no findings in the underlying bill. And so the addition of findings is not germane to the underlying 
bill and the amendment is not germane. Uh, I will, I'm, the chair is prepared to rule. Does the gentleman wish to be heard on the, on the, on the, uh, on the point of order? No, Mr. Chairman. Then I'm prepared to rule on the point of order. The gentlelady is correct. There are no findings in the bill. The amendment contains findings, findings, and, and since the, and that is beyond the scope of the bill. Therefore, the amendment is out of order. Are there any further amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? I got. For what purpose does the gentleman from Louisiana seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the, the clerk will report the amendment. I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7647, offered by Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Page 2, line 10. Without objection, uh, the amendment is considered as read. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Before I explain my amendment, I just want to... Um, Correct the record, there's been a lot said here today, and we've all engaged in, I think, it's at times a thoughtful discussion, but there have been many things um, said about the current conservative justices on the court, and in particular, the justices that were nominated by the, the, the previous administration and President Trump. And I just want to, for, to set this record straight, I'm just going to take this moment to tell you exactly what Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, my friend Amy, said in their confirmation hearings. Start with the most recent, Justice Amy Coney Barrett said in the hearings that she shared Justice Scalia's judicial philosophy of originalism and textualism, but she declined to give an opinion on Roe or Casey. She said, quote, I think in an area where precedent continues to be pressed and litigated, as is true of Casey, it would actually be wrong and a violation of the canons for me to do that as a sitting judge. So if I express a view on a precedent one way or another, whether I say I love it or I hate it, it signals to litigants that I might tilt one way or another in a pending case, unquote. She was pressed again by Senator Feinstein on whether she, quote, agreed with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided. Justice Barrett again declined to answer. She said, Senator, quote, I completely understand why you're asking the question, but again, I cannot pre-commit or say, yes, I'm going in with some agenda because I'm not. I don't have any, any agenda. I have no agenda to try to overrule Casey. I have an agenda to stick to the rule of law and decide cases as they come, unquote. Justice Kavanaugh, he said, uh, he called Road, quote, an, an important precedent that has been reaffirmed many times, unquote. But he also said in the hearing that he would be open to hearing arguments if a particular case is needed to be revisited. Of course, he said, I listen to all arguments. You have an open mind. You get the briefs and arguments, and some arguments are better than others. Precedent is critically important. It's the foundation of our system, but you listen to all arguments, unquote. Justice Gorsuch, I said earlier, he said Roe was indeed a precedent, but he declined to call it a super precedent because that's a loosely defined term that no one can, can acknowledge. Don't say, do not say that these justices misled the Senate. They did not. They spoke with clarity and conviction and consistency, and it is wrong to malign their well, the character. The gentleman yield. I will not yield. Let me tell you about my amendment. I will not well, yield. You're misleading. Oh, give me a oh, break. Okay. Give me a break. The, 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 the kings of misleading over here are telling me that I'm, I just read you the exact quotes of these justices in their well, hearings. The gentleman yield. I will not yield. None of them no. said Roe no, was I'm here, no, wrong I'm, I'm reclaiming my time because I'm going to tell you about my amendment because this is equally important. This amendment to the legislation is very simple. It says the applicable codes of conduct under this section shall require the termination of any employee of the court who releases confidential court information, including draft opinions, final opinions before release of the opinion has been authorized, confidential communications of any judge or justice or the employee of any justice or judge on matters within the scope of their office or employment. Okay, look, we need to clarify this because the, the, this unprecedented leak has called all, caused all sorts of chaos and has enraged the left, and they're going to the homes of these justices and trying to intimidate them, which is a blatant violation of federal statutes, of course, and, and most state laws. Never mind that the DOJ is looking the other way. Merrick Garland will never pay attention to this. It's, it's absurd. But, but listen, if we're going to do this, we're going to get on the ethics, let's just clarify what a, hopefully all of us should agree with, because the leak undermines the institution of the court itself, the independence of the judiciary, which is a foundational principle upon which our republic rests. 
And, and I can't imagine that any of you would disagree. We might, we might disagree on the underlying issues here today, but hopefully, hopefully you'll agree with this amendment that if somebody leaks an opinion and does this kind of damage, that they ought to at least uh, be terminated from their job. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does the gentlelady insist on her point of order? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I think the uh, amendment is misguided, but germane. Um, the gentlelady does not insist on her on her point of order. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? We'll strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, section, uh, six, section two of the um, legislation, uh, which has to do with the code of conduct for the court, would give the court 180 days to uh, come up with its own code of ethics. And I assume that the code that the uh, Supreme Court would adopt would deal with this issue. And so rather than uh, the legislative branch putting its finger on the, on the scale and demanding that the court <laughs> would the gentleman you? put forward this language, I would submit that it's, it's more judicious to allow the court to propound its own code of conduct. Praise the Lord, I agree 100%. With Let's the go home. And time of the gentleman. And with, and with the time belongs to the and, gentleman. Uh, and with respect uh, to the issue of constitutionality of the legislative branch imposing uh, a uh, obligation to uh, submit to a code of ethics. Uh, I would point uh, my, my friends on the other side, Mr. Clint, Mr. Uh, McClintock, Mr. Biggs, to uh, 5 U.S.C. Section 101, uh, which is the Ethics Reform Act, which has been the law for decades now that the Supreme Court has tacitly uh, complied with, and uh, thus uh, there's no issue of constitutionality there. The Ethics and Government Act, 28 U.S.C., Section 455, the court submits uh, to uh, that uh, code. This is an extension of legislative authority to act uh, pursuant to uh, Article I of the Constitution. Um, and so there is no separation of powers issue. And with that, I would uh, yield you? to the gentle lady from California. I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I w agree with you. Obviously, much has been said that somehow the, co the, the legislative branch cannot legislate relative to the other branches, and you have correctly pointed out that we have done so in the past in this uh, issue area. We've also uh, done so for the executive branch. But I would just note that you know we've heard, and I'm sure... Uh, these sentiments were offered with all sincerity that uh, it would somehow be improper for the, this committee and this Congress to impose a code of ethics on the court, and the amendment does it precisely that uh, with, with some specificity. In fact, the, um, the bill before us takes a much lighter touch to the Supreme Court than the Congress has taken to other branches and lower uh, courts in the, le in the uh, judicial branch. So I think the amendment uh, is inconsistent with the prior comments made on the other side of the aisle, but also is unnecessary because the court itself can impose uh, this requirement. And I would actually say I hope they do because I think that the leaking of uh, th this draft was not the right thing. I don't know who did it, but it, it shouldn't have been done and there should be, the court should adopt procedures relative to any such future leaks. And I yield back to the gentleman with gratitude. Gentleman yields back. back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? I'd like to speak on, in support of the amendment, strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do appreciate this amendment being made. Uh, Congress does pass all kinds of uh, laws with regard to the employment of employees in the executive branch and can and has the judicial branch. So this seems entirely appropriate. It is not, um, 
it might be deemed inapplicable to the nine justices um, or the 15 if the majority gets their way, but um, it is appropriate, it is germane, it is in order, and I think it's entirely appropriate. Uh, in fact, I think we should consider criminal penalties uh, for disclosing things that should be um, completely privileged. But I've heard so many comments, the repeated reference to Judge Clarence Thomas as a hater, um, the impugning of his integrity and his intellect. He has dealt with that kind of discrimination all his life. And anybody that thinks he's a hater needs to meet him and talk to him. He is an amazing person. And if you read his book, his biography, his autobiography, some people have referred to him as not really being black. He didn't know what it was to grow up black. Oh, yes, he did. Uh, read his book and, and then write him or contact him, ask questions, because you will find out he grew up poorer than poor, but he lived for about six months, as I recall, with his mother in Atlanta. He never got over the hunger or the cold. But with his grandparents, as so many children have been raised by their grandparents, and they were in uh, Pinpoint, Georgia, I believe it was, right on the coast. They often uh, ate because uh, he picked up poke salad just weeds that grow. People know what poke salad is. So they considered that a vegetable. And they would try to find crab or something that the, uh, the water produced because his grandparents didn't make much money at all. He certainly knew discrimination, but he was so smart. He was able to get a scholarship to Holy Cross had thoughts of being a priest. This was a person, this was a boy of integrity with a will to excel, and he did. Uh, he went to uh, Holy Cross and ended up applying to Harvard Law School and got in, but only went for a matter of hours, as I recall, because he thought it was just too conservative. And as he described himself once, he was an angry white, I'm sorry, angry black radical liberal. And he thought Harvard was too conservative. So he dropped out and applied to Yale and found Yale to be more of his liking because it was much more liberal. But he began to notice that the liberals seemed to look down on him and have this attitude, well, if it weren't for liberals like us, you know, somebody dumb and black like you could not even get in, not realizing that he was more intelligent than they were. And that the discrimination, that the haughtiness seemed to bother him. Uh, and eventually, um, he had another one of the very few conservatives talking to him. He noticed liberals only wanted to talk to him about sports and oppression of black people, but the few conservatives would talk to him, wanted his opinion on all kinds of things, and that began a transition into realizing, as he said, government is not really the solution. Uh, government can be too oppressive, and it completely changed his life. He is a brilliant okay. man, he has one of the most contagious laughs you can ever hear. Okay. He is not a hater, and I would encourage the passage of this amendment, and I would encourage people, go find out about the real Justice Clarence Thomas, one of the greatest men ever on the street. Gentlemen's Supreme time has expired. Go back. Now recognize uh, Mr. Jones for five minutes. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Now recognize Mr. Cicilline for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So first of all, I just want to say it's been kind of interesting to hear all the um, 
concern about criticizing justices of the Supreme Court um, and the criticism of Democrats for raising their voices in criticism as if this has never happened before. This has happened throughout the history of our country. And in fact, members of this very committee, Mr. Jordan tweeted on October 19th, the falsehood that Democrats are trying to steal the election and Chief Justice Roberts is letting them do it. Sounds like a criticism to me. Mr. Gohmert, on June 26, 2005, said the justices had sold their souls when they upheld the Affordable Care Act. Sounds like criticism and bullying of the court to me. Mr. Biggs accused Chief Justice Roberts of continuing to side against the rule of law. So let's forget all this phony outrage about criticizing justices of the Supreme Court. You've all done it. It's happened throughout our history, so let's set that aside. This is a bill about imposing a requirement that the Supreme Court bring some transparency, some ethical standards, and some greater conformity to what, what everyone else in the federal government does. Comply with some set of rules that make certain that you don't have a conflict of interest, that you're not being influenced improperly by an external person or organization. This is basic good government. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. But of course, what can't be avoided and I'm sorry he's not here, Mr. Roy, who said, everyone gets the joke, this is about Roe versus Wade. Let me tell you one group that doesn't get the joke. The millions of Americans who are gonna be denied the freedom to make their own healthcare decisions, that are gonna be forced, some of these individuals, to carry to term a child that is the product of a rape or of incest, if a state decides to do that because that individual will have no protection or no right to make healthcare decisions. So that, those, that, those folks don't get the joke. They think this is deadly serious. And this is the court reversing a decision that recognized fundamentally that human beings have the freedom and the right to make decisions about their own bodies and medical decisions about their own healthcare. That's fundamental to the dignity of a human being. And what is particularly worrying is that that same principle applies to your right to decide who you're going to marry, right to privacy, a whole number of issues. And so this decision is alarming and not a joke because it is an effort to roll back freedoms that Americans have enjoyed for generations. And this was a decision made by the Supreme Court and reaffirmed, in many instances, over 50 years, settled law in this country. And although everyone keeps trying to dismiss what the, the, the Supreme Court justice has said during their confirmation hearings, stare decisis isn't just a word. There's a reason we have it. It's because there's an understanding when a law is settled and been fully embraced by the American people, that absent rare examples, and the examples are when we're marching more towards greater freedom and greater human dignity and greater equality. But that's the march of our country. This is a march in the, a different direction. So well, the we, can, you. We, can, we, can dis, we can disagree, and we do disagree strong about the court's expected decision in Roe. It's, it does violence to women. It does violence to stare decisis. It does violence to the right of people to make decisions about their own health care. It, 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 it intrudes on one of the most fundamental decisions that people make about their own bodies. And of course, there's strong disagreement about that. But what we shouldn't have any disagreement about is what this bill is about, that the Supreme Court ought to operate in a way that the American people can have confidence that they're making decisions based on the law and the facts before them, and not influenced by any improper influences. Organizations that are sending them on fancy trips, people that are litigating that have financial interest before the court that, 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 that may affect the judge's judgment. So disclosing those things the way that everybody else who makes important decisions in the federal government is required to do is one simple way to restore the public's confidence that they in fact are a body worthy of our respect. This shouldn't be controversial. So set aside the disagreements on some of these other important issues. Hopefully we can demonstrate to the American people we all agree that transparency, 
and ensuring that decisions are made based on the law and the facts and not improper external views, and there's no conflicts of interest, is something we can all agree on. Pass this bill, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, who seeks recognition? I do. For what purpose does Mr. Jordan seek recognition? Uh, to strike last word. Jones and I'll be quick and be happy to yield to one of, my, one of my colleagues, but there is a big difference between criticizing a court decision after it's been made. There you go. Then, uh, then leaking a draft and protesting at the people, the justices' home while they're debating and trying to make a decision. Huge difference. You, trying to conflate them is ridiculous. Everyone, you've all criticized decisions of the court. We've certainly done it. After they make a decision, of course you can criticize them. That's what citizens do. But, but leaking a document for the sole purpose of intimidating the court, going to the justices' homes and protesting, that is a, that is a huge difference. Huge difference. So the gentleman who spoke just before is, is completely wrong in trying to conflate those, those two issues. Be happy to yield to but the gentleman from Louisiana, and then, then I'll yield to North Carolina. I thank the gentleman from Ohio, and, and I do want to answer the uh, question, and, and what you said is exactly right, and that is precisely why Congress has codified the prohibition against this activity, 18 U.S. Code, Section 1507. Quote, whoever with the intent of interfering with, obstructing, or impeding the administration of justice, or with the intent of influencing any judge in discharge of his duty, pickets or parades in or near, their homes, you get, you know what? You get up to a year in prison for that. You know why? Because there's a very big difference between free speech, criticizing an opinion of the court or a particular justice, and trying to impede the administration of justice. This is like, this isn't apples to apples. This is, this is night and day, two totally different things. I want to know, you know, I'm really curious about this, uh, Mr. Jordan. I wonder why the president, no one in the administration, in fact, none of our Democrat colleagues here will condemn these, these activities outside, these intimidation tactics outside of the, the homes of the justices. You know why? Because they agree with it. Yep. They like this. Yep. They want to encourage more of it. In fact, that's what the president has implied over the last 24 hours or so. They want, they want to spur this along. You know why? Because they're trying to change, they're trying to intimidate these justices and change their minds so that they'll flip their vote and not decide to overturn Roe. Hey, facts are facts. We're, we're trying to present them as plainly as we can today, and that is exactly what's going on. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and it's time today for us to stop this madness in its tracks. That's why this amendment is so important. If somebody leaks, they, they need to lose their job. I yield back to Ms. Jordan. I'd be happy to yield to the uh, gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman from Ohio. You know, there's another distinction. It, absolutely. It, there's, it is, uh, there's a difference between criticizing a Supreme Court opinion or a justice who has written one after it is done and before it occurs in an attempt to intimidate. That's an important distinction, but it's not the only one that's at play here. Uh, it's perfectly fine to, to uh, criticize uh, decisions of the court and judges, but, the, but the, what we're talking about are attacks on the institution of the court as a response to a decision you do not like. Well said. So it is that when you do not like a decision or you do not like how the court has become composed by the processes you speak, as one of our members did today, of justices being accomplices to political figures. You speak of justices, go back and say justices, sitting justices are credibly accused of sexual misconduct. They've been confirmed. They're on the court. They're not been impeached. But you seek to delegitimize them. You say that, uh, you use this, this notion about justices having deceived or lied their way onto the court. That's an attack on the legitimacy, of, the legitimacy of the court itself, and it's a smear because it's not true, and everybody understands who's making the accusation that it's not true. Packing the court is an attack on the institution of the court. Yep. Yep. That is what that is. I understand. Look, look back in the day when, uh, when Dred Scott was overturned, Democrats didn't like that decision. And when Brown versus Board of Education overturned Plessy, Democrats didn't like that decision. Criticize it if you want. But even those Democrats didn't go and try to undermine the institution, the essential institution of our constitutional system, the court itself. Mm -hmm. That is what is going on here today. That is what this hearing and its timing and its purpose goes hand in hand with the attack last week on the deliberative process of the court yep. by undertaking as comment after comment after comment on the majority side 
has indicated, an attack on the institution itself, delegitimizing it, attempting to delegitimize it. I would love to hear on the majority side, someone take on the impeccable logic of that draft opinion that has leaked. I haven't heard one member do that. What will the gentleman yield? On the three seconds I have left, I'd be glad to. <laughs> Time of the gentleman has expired. Good job, Dan. What purpose does uh, Ms. Jackson Lee seek recognition? Just strike the last word. And ladies recognized. I, I seek to um, appreciate uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle, uh, but take issue with a lot of the lack of clarity in their chronological uh, historical uh, representation of those of us who first came to this country as slaves and then uh, were subjected to the enormity of uh, Supreme Court decisions that um, wanted to confirm uh, our inequality. Uh, ultimately, of course, the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, and then ultimately the 15th Amendment uh, generated uh, some fairness. Plessy versus Ferguson uh, was 1896. Uh, it came after the 14th Amendment, which said that no citizen should be denied immunities and privileges and due process. So that court had to stretch itself to find a way to support Jim Crow laws. Brown versus Board of Education recognized the 14th Amendment was part of the Constitution and sought to remedy the injustice of Plessy versus Ferguson, remedy the injustice of such. It sought to improve our lives, to correct our lives. In the instance of the leaked opinion, Roe v. Wade, we do have people who are on both sides of that question. But there is a Ninth Amendment, and in fact, Roe v. Wade does speak to uh, the rights of women. And so this eliminating of Roe v. Wade is taking away rights, quite different from analyzing Brown to Plessy versus Ferguson. And it is quite different in the racial history, and this deals with the rights of global women in the United States. I don't believe uh, that this amendment, although I'm sure the gentleman has a good intent, uh, is at this point relevant to this legislation because the investigation proceeds and I have confidence that the procedures in the court, their police system, their law enforcement system will provide the remedy that is necessary. But my friends on the other side of the aisle want to give the impression of who might have leaked it. We don't have that answer. We don't have the answer as someone for Roe v. Wade or someone against Roe v. Wade. But my friends want to suggest it might be someone for to stir up the people. You cannot stir up the people by a leak, but you can stir them up by truth. And that opinion evidences a complete crushing of the rights of women and human rights of those women and the right to make their own decision. Putting that aside, the peaceful protest is not to be equated, I believe, with the statute that was read because the justices are going to make decisions as we have seen potentially by this leak on their interpretation of the law. And so what we have before us is a bill that I hope can pass with Republican and Democratic support. It has now been skewed to attribute it to impressions about this court. My personal opinion, this Trump court has done a disservice to settle law. And the comparison to Brown v. versus Board of Education is absolutely incorrect. They fixed a problem. This court, with their decision, will make a problem. And it will be a serious problem. It'll be a detrimental problem. It'll be a devastating problem. It'll be a deadly problem. For women who will have to be forced into back alleys and rooms again. So I believe that we should pass this legislation uh, and I will generate, if it's enough, to Mr. Johnson. I, I thank you so very much. And I will just say, I will just say uh, that uh, this legislation 
should draw only unanimous support because it seems unseemly that we would have the highest court in the land that will be subject to the frailties of potential ethical concerns. I hope we will pass this legislation. I yield back. The lady yields back. For what purpose is Mr. Big seek recognition? Move straight the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I support Mr. Johnson's proposed amendment. If you're going to regulate the ethics of the United States Supreme Court, which I don't believe we have authority to do, then this certainly should be an issue that um, sh you can direct the Supreme Court on, if you believe that. But I heard two, two of my colleagues across the aisle um, really lay waste to their own logic. Because both of them said that, in effect, they trust the Supreme Court to police themselves. I, our, our last speaker just said she trusted the Supreme Court to police itself. When adjudicating the, gentleman the leaker, not right now, when adjudicating and looking for and investigating for the leaker. But the underlying bill suggests that you don't trust them on any additional ethical considerations. That, to me, is logically fallacious. And that is why it is so problematic that you wouldn't ad adopt this amendment. Because this amendment, if you believe it, and I don't believe it, I don't believe that you've got authority. I don't believe we have authority to, to impose ethical regulations on the United States Supreme Court. I, our corrective's measures by the Constitution are not, not what was that, uh, uh, the, the section cited by my, my colleague across the aisle earlier, that's, that's dealing with the executive branch. Not the judicial branch, good grief. Not true. Um, not true. Not true. Not true, okay, well, you're wrong. Five U.S.C. You're not true 101 back. So here's the way to, we're gonna do this. The judiciary I've got the floor, the recusal, you don't have it. The recusal statute. I've got the floor, the, you don't have it. I'd like the 20 to, seconds back. The time belongs to Mr. Biggs. I'd like the 20 seconds back from him interrupting um, in that most officious manner. Because the reality of this is, we don't have authority to regulate the ethics of the United States Supreme Court unless we're going to haul them in for impeachment. That's what we have. And even, even my colleague from Maryland earlier said, well, yeah, we also can limit the jurisdiction. But that's not for the Supreme Court. That's for the lower courts. And that's what he, he conceded that. That's where we are on this, on this odd odd maneuver that we're doing today in an, uh, a strange time. With that, I'm going to yield to the, my colleague from, from uh, Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Thank the gentleman. I'd ask the, ask the uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, your, your opinion on this. Just think about it. You don't have to answer audibly, but I'm wondering if Senator Chuck Schumer uh, should be convicted. I think he should. Let me read you the statute and then his comments. 18 U.S.C. 1507 provides in relevant part, quote, Whoever, with the intent of influencing any judge in the discharge of his duty, pickets, parades, or resorts to any other demonstration in or near a building occupied or used by that judge shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than one year or both. Here's what he did in March 2020. Senator Chuck Schumer threatened conservative justices on the steps of the court where they were working. He said, quote, I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you have released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. You won't know what hit you if you go forward with these awful decisions. Hmm. On its face, that seems to violate the federal statute. I, whoever, with the intent of influencing any judge, resorts to a demonstration in the build, near the building where the judge is working, is supposed to go to jail. Democrat leader of the Senate has blatantly violated federal law, but we won't hear anything about that from the DOJ or local prosecutors. We won't hear any. No one, is even, no one here is even condemn that kind of language, open threats. I mean, this is a threat of, it could be implied to be physical violence against each, what does that mean? Release the whirlwind, you'll pay the price, you won't know what hits you. The leader of the Democrats in the Senate, 
I cannot believe that my colleagues in here will not call that out. This is leading to all sorts of chaos, and this is why people are going to their houses and, and threatening violence and all the rest. It's out of control. If we don't pass this amendment, if you guys don't vote for this, my friends, it means that you don't believe this is important. You don't think this is a, a danger to our institution. Some of you have implied that you do, so vote for the amendment. If somebody leaks and begins and creates and causes all this chaos, they need to be disciplined. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. There are a series of votes on the floor, so the committee will stand in recess uh, until immediately after the last vote.
One, two, three, four, five. Check, check. but it's working.
Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great, can thank you. Hear you. Me? Yep, thanks.
The uh, committee will come to order. When the committee recessed, we were about to take a vote on the Johnson of Louisiana Amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Yeah, we'll take roll. Uh, roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch. Ms. Bass. Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Cicilline. No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swabo. Mr. Liu. Mr. Raskin. Ms. Dryapol. Ms. Dryapol votes no. Ms. Dimmings. No. Ms. Dimmings, you'll have to turn your camera on. Ms. Dimmings votes no. Ms. Dimmings votes no. Mr. Correa. Ms. Scanlon. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia. Yeah. And so for inventory roadless areas, that would be Mr. Nagoose. No. Ms. Right, Bernie. So Mr. Nagoose votes no. Ms. McBath. Mr. Stanton. Ms. Dean. Dean votes no. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar. No. Ms. Escobar votes no. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Ms. Ross. Ms. Bush. Jones votes no. Mr. Jones votes no. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Gomert. Mr. Isa. Mr. Buck. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes yes. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe? Mr. Tiffany? Tiffany, aye. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey? Mr. Roy? Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop? Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Fishbach? Aye. Ms. Fishbach votes aye. Ms. Sparts? Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes yes. Mr. Benz votes yes. 
Mr. Owens. If you see me, let me know. If you don't see me. Ms. Ross? Thank you. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Ross votes no. How am I ready? Mr. Oh, Chairman, how am, I how am I recorded? Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass, you recorded as no. I mean, sorry, Ms. Bass, you were not recorded. Oh, yes. No, you had it right. <laughs> Ms. Bass votes no. no. How am I recorded? Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Garcia of Texas. Mr. Stanton, you are not recorded. Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Ms. Garcia, Garcia, you are not recorded. Garcia votes no. Ms. Garcia votes no. Mr. Shabbat. Who recorded? Mr. Shabbat. Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Lou. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Correa, how am I recorded? Mr. Correa. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Correa, you are not recorded. Correa votes no. Mr. Correa votes no. Mr. Liu. Mr. Chairman, how is, how is McBath recorded? Mr. Liu, you are not recorded. Liu votes no. Mr. Liu votes no. Ms. McBath? How am I recorded, sir? Ms. McBath, you are not recorded. McBath votes no. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Raskin? Mr. Raskin, you need to unmute. Raskin votes no. Mr. Raskin votes no. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. We got Nagus. Mr. Nagus? Are there any other members who wish to be recorded who haven't been recorded? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 10 ayes and 19 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman. For what, for what purpose is the gentlelady seek recognition? Uh, just a point of personal privilege, if I may. Um, I, Mr. Bishop had an amendment that I argued was not germane, and I based that on the advice I got from the parliamentarian, and I've now been advised that they have revised that advice based on the House parliamentarian, so I wish to offer my apologies to Mr. Bishop. My argument was made in good faith based on the advice that I received, and I thank the uh, gentleman for recognizing me. Are there any further amendments to the amendment to the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bishop. My, my amendment remains at the desk previously ruled uh, out of order, and so now I understand it's in order. It is indeed. And uh, I look for the court, for the chairman to indicate how to proceed. I'm glad to well, speak the to the amendment. Well, the gentleman will, the clerk will report the amendment. All right. <clears throat> amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7647 offered by Mr. Bishop. Page two, after without line 17. A, without objection, the amendment will be considered as read, and the gentleman is uh, recognized for five minutes to explain the amendment. I thank the chairman, and uh, I will refresh, refresh everybody because I spoke to it briefly before it was ruled out of order. Uh, and, and it, you know, that Mr. Johnson's amendment just defeated was objected to, or, or uh, folks uh, opposed it on the ground that it was specific. He said that if uh, someone in the court's employ uh, were involved leaking, as has now occurred, leaking uh, a, an internal deliberation uh, document, a, a, a draft opinion as we've seen, then that person should be fired. And the objection was that the, uh, uh, we shouldn't be specific about what the court should provide in its rules. Um, I will say that that objection is inconsistent with the bill as it stands because the bill already does contain particulars as to the rules the court is supposed to adopt. It's required to have the counselor supposed to adopt subject to the chief justice's approval rules, specifically requiring the disclosure of gifts and, and uh, 
and the income of the justices and so forth as would be required by the standing rules of the House and Senate um, ethics committees. So I don't, I don't understand why that's an objection on anybody's part, uh, but, it, but my, my amendment is, is sort of covers the same ground but avoids that problem. It simply says that the rules that uh, this bill proposes to require of the court uh, will specifically speak to um, uh, the issue of disclosure of non-public court documents, including draft opinions and other court documents reflecting confidential deliberations. And, uh, uh, and, and, it's, uh, and again, we'll, it'll speak to that. It'll address and prevent the unauthorized disclosure of those items. And, of course, for the reasons of the institutional significance of the court and protecting its institutional uh, integrity, it seems obvious why that would be important to include, a very simple amendment to accomplish that. Uh, I suppose it would also be appropriate since the issue, uh, since the original ruling, uh, and I appreciate uh, Ms. Lofkin's uh, point of personal privilege on the issue, uh, I, it does seem to me strange that um, something otherwise germane would become not germane because it included a, a finding, but um, so I'm glad that got sorted out. But just quickly to review the findings that are here, um, they, they trace the fact that the, they say the integrity and legitimacy of the Supreme Court is critical and essential to our democracy. I don't know that that should be uh, something that, I mean, it seems like more and more these days that is a point in contention, but I don't know why it should be. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it does say um, uh, judicial ethics reform proposals such as a code of conduct for the court will not save the court from progressives campaign to underline, undermine the legitimacy of the court's proceedings. Uh, will not save the court from personal attacks and smear campaigns against conservative justices. And we've seen that unfortunately today in the form of uh, these, these smears suggesting, and, and unfortunately the, the Speaker of the House and the leader of the majority in the Senate, Democrat majority in the Senate, have both followed the same course, which they all know well is not accurate. It's not correct. Every, it, that, where, that suggests that justices have, uh, have engaged in deception to find their way to the court. It, that's, it's simply false uh, to say that, and, and the contentions, again, are attacks on the court's integrity. Um, the, uh, the findings also note that a constitutional scholar has said this leak of, an, of a draft opinion was an unspeakably unethical act. And certainly, I can't find any basis to disagree with that and would hope that everyone on uh, the majority would agree as well. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, there is, a, there is a consistency between these attacks. And it's not, as Mr. Cicilline discussed, uh, suggested earlier in the day, uh, a matter of criticizing opinion, an opinion or criticizing a justice or even a majority of justices for their work. In fact, the problem that I have is we don't contend with the draft opinion's logic. We merely attack, or those in the majority have merely attacked the court. So uh, it is time to move away from that, and we ought to cover that in this uh, bill if it is to be marked up and passed from this committee. So that's what my amendment does, and with that, uh, I'll yield, yield back. The, gen the gentleman yields back. Uh, I recognize myself in opposition uh, to the amendment uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, we obviously uh, disagree with uh, some of the findings uh, uh, on page two of the bill, uh, that the Democrats seek to delegitimize the court and that uh, judicial ethics reform is covered by, uh, are, are colored by democratic partisan politics. Uh, we disagree with that, obviously. In addition to which, the amendment, of a nature, the amendment in the nature of a substitute um, uh, makes, uh, 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 makes the redundant. Uh, the, the court is allowed to, do, uh, to promulgate a code of conduct and to include non-public uh, uh, documents if they want to. We leave that to the court, and the uh, second half of the amendment is therefore redundant. On these grounds, I oppose the amendment and urge my colleagues to do the same. Are there any further comments on, are there any further discussion on the amendment? There's no further discussion on the amendment. 
The, uh, question. the occur question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 In the opinion no. Of the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? Ms. Bass? No. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Jeffries? <coughs> Mr. Cicilline? No. Mr. Cicilline votes no. Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jayapal? No. Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Stimmings? No. Ms. Stimmings votes no. Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Garcia? Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? McBath votes no. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? Dean votes no. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones votes no. Ms. Ross? Ross, no. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Aye. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Isa? Mr. Buck? Mr. Gates? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Tiffany? Tiffany, aye. Mr. Tiffany votes aye. Mr. Massey? Mr. Roy? Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop? Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Fishbach? Aye. Ms. Fishbach votes aye. Ms. Sparts? Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes aye. Mr. Benz votes aye. Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cohen, you're muted. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Cohen, Mr. you're Cohen muted. Mr. Cohen votes no. No. Mr. Cohen votes no. Ms. Escobar? Mr. Chairman? Ms. Escobar? Es How am I recorded? Ms. Escobar, you are not recorded. 
Escobar votes no. Ms. Escobar votes no. Ms. Mr. Ms. Chairman, Ms. Corey Bush. Bush, how am I recorded? Ms. Bush, you are not recorded. Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Chairman, how is Mr. Liu recorded? Mr. Liu, you are not recorded. Liu votes no. Mr. Liu votes no. Mr. Gomert over there. Mr. Gomert, you voted already. Are there any uh, members of the committee who have? Ms. Scanlon. Ms. Ms. Scanlon? Yes. Sorry, Scanlon votes no. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? Ms. Garcia votes no. Ms. Garcia votes no. Uh, Mr. Gomert? Is Mr. Gomert? I've already voted aye. Mr. Okay. Gomert is recorded as aye. Thank you, though, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Uh, are there any members who wish to vote who haven't who have who wish to be recorded who haven't been recorded? Clerk, rule report. Mr. Chairman, there are 12 ayes and 22 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments in the for what purpose does Mr. Big seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. We will report the amendment. I reserve, I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7647 offered by Mr. Biggs of Arizona, page 12, after line 17, insert the following. Section 10, improper reliance. A, in general, chapter 190 of part 6 of Title 28, United States Code, is amended by adding at the end the following. Section 5002, prohibiting reliance on international law. No case or controversy before a federal court may be decided based on a court's reliance on any international law that contradicts the laws of the United States. B, clerical amendment. The table of sections for chapter 190 of part six of title 28 United States code is amended by adding at the end the following. 5002, prohibiting reliance on international law. The gentleman is recognized uh, for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I've listened assiduously to the comments made today by those who support the imposition of an ethics regime on the United States Supreme Court, I, I took down at least four items of, that were mentioned as rash, rationale for their position. One would be you want to make sure that there's public trust of the judiciary. Number two, someone mentioned to safeguard the litigants. Number three, to avoid judicial lobbying. And none, number four, to make sure that judges are not subject to outside influences. Those, are, those seem like worthy, worthy goals to me. Um, and so I contemplated um, the use of of influences outside normal stare decisis statutory regime in the United States. And I, I remembered the, the Roper case, the uh, Roper v. Simmons case, and there have been others. I remembered Supreme Court Justice uh, Senator Dale Connor from my own home state was the first person to cite um, an international decision, a, an actual foreign 
uh, uh, tribunal uh, as a rationale for holding in her case, in a case that she had, uh, had uh, written an opinion for. And if you're trying to avoid uh, outside influences, one thing I would, I would think would be critical is that you would make sure that you also didn't use outside legal sources that have no business being considered in the U.S. court of law. So what this amendment does is, is it harkens back to the Roper case, where the holding was based on citations of foreign law, international law, and the opinion of the world community. Now, why is that so interesting? Well, for one thing, the world community doesn't share the same uh, uh, norms that America does. So here's an example. When deciding cases regarding controversial uh, values such as speech, free speech, America has a broader interpretation and norm of, what, of, of that value of free speech. In fact, we view it as a, an inherent right, not as one bestowed by the state, but an inherent right from God that can't be uh, reduced or limited uh, constitutionally. That's unusual in the world community. So if, if our, uh, if our um, Supreme Court is relying on the uh, opinion of the world community, then that becomes a problem. Having practiced international law at multilateral institutions, I can tell you, I'll give you another example. In the International Criminal Court in 1998, when I was there in the formation of the International Criminal Court and I was working there lobbying on issues, there was a, a term called forced pregnancy. That would become an international crime. What's forced pregnancy? That's a pro-life pro point of view. That is a restriction in any way on abortion. That is now part of international law. That's not the United States of America's norm. So if we're going to get to this point where you're going to impose ethical standards because one of the reasons is you want to not be subject, you don't have judges who are subject to outside influences, you should also begin considering whether they're relying on outside influences, such as international law, and the way that you create international law, in many respects, is put language in to codify, and that, as long as that language is there, it codifies an international norm and becomes international law. That's not the way we do it. It's unacceptable to us, and we should not permit that uh, to be considered. Thus, this amendment simply adds to the code that you are trying to impose upon our Supreme Court justices with this rather simple, rather homely attempt to um, make sure we codify our norms and not the international norms. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentlelady insist on a point of order? I do, Mr. Chairman. The um, amendment does not have a nexus to the underlying bill, which is about ethical conduct among the, uh, the court, but actually goes directly and focuses completely on the substance and basis for their rulings. Therefore, I don't believe it is germane to the underlying bill. Does the gentleman want to be heard on the point of order? I, I do, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I respect the, uh, the, the gentlelady's opinion on this, but you are talking about the rationale for this underlying bill. And I'll re reiterate what you said it was. Incre increase or maintain public trust of the judiciary. Reliance on United States law and not other aspects of law uh, would safeguard that. You wanted to safeguard the litigants. Having the predictability of U.S. law as opposed to incorporating foreign law would safeguard litigants. Uh, judicial lobbying, preventing in encroachment of international law, rules, and norms on our U.S. Supreme Court's decision-making and adjudicative process would prevent lobbying uh, outside of the normal uh, hearing and briefing process. And then finally, 
to prevent our judges from being subject to outside influences, eliminating those outside influences seems to me to have an ethical nexus to the underlying bill, and thus I would uh, urge the gentlelady to uh, reconsider her. Would, would the gentleman yield? Yes, of course. I just would like to note that as um, on matters of germaneness, I always re rely on the advice of the parliamentarian, and I recall that that was equally true when uh, your side of the aisle was in the majority. So, um, and they rely on the advice of the parliamentarian of the House. So I just wanted to let you know that, and I thank you for yielding. Thank you. Well, then, you might yield. I, I, I just want to, I'm curious then, did you come? The time of the, the gentleman, the time of the gentleman has expired, and the chair is uh, prepared to rule on the point of order. In the opinion of the chair, the point of order is well taken in that the bill deals with ethics, recusal, and transparency, and the amendment uh, has nothing to do with ethics, recusal, and transparency, and therefore is beyond the scope of the bill and is therefore not germane. I'd, I'd re appeal the, the ruling of the chair. Move to table. Move to the move, motion to table is not debatable. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The, no, the ayes have it. Request a roll call. A, a roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lane. Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson of Georgia? Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Deutsch? Aye. Mr. Deutsch votes aye. Ms. Bass? Aye. Aye. Ms. Pass, you will have to turn your camera on. Um, I Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Cicilline. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Mr. Raskin. No on the motion to table. Mr. Raskin votes. Aye in the motion to table, Mr. Raskin. I'm sorry, aye on the motion to table. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Jayapal. Aye. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Ms. Dimmings. Aye. Ms. Dimmings votes aye. Mr. Correa? Aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Ms. Scanlon? Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Ms. Garcia? Mr. Nagoose? Aye. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath? Aye. Got to write a paper on it. Ms. McBath votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Ms. Stanton votes aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Ms. Dean. Dean votes aye. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ross votes aye. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Bush votes aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Shabbat. No. Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Gomert. 
No. Mr. Gomert votes no. Mr. Isa? No. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Buck? Mr. Gates? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Stubbe? No. Mr. Stubbe votes no. Mr. Tiffany? Tiffany, no. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Fishbach? No. Ms. Fishbach votes no. Ms. Sparts? Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes no. Ms. Garcia? Am I recorded, Mr. Chairman? Ms. Garcia, you are not recorded. Uh, Ms. Bass, how am I recorded? Where was the chairman's vote? Uh, uh, the chairman voted aye. Garcia of Texas votes aye. Ms. Garcia chairman, votes how aye. Am I recorded? Ms. Bass? Um, am I recorded? Yes. Uh, Bass votes aye. Ms. Bass votes aye. Ms. Demings? Ms. Demings voted aye. Are there, any, are there any members who wish to be recorded who haven't been recorded? The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 19 ayes and 14 noes. The uh, motion to table is agreed to. What purpose does Mr. Bishop seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. I agree report the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I reserve order. a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7647, offered by Mr. Bishop of North Carolina, strike section 7. The, without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The, the uh, gentleman will explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is very straightforward. The clerk, in fact, read the entire amendment. It is to strike section seven from the bill. Here's why. Section seven requires any party that files an amicus brief in any court of the United States, including the Supreme Court, uh, must or, or is, is, shall be required to disclose its contributors. See, many times, these amicus briefs for people who may be watching at home or otherwise don't know, it is a constant feature of the appellate courts in the United States that parties who are interested in the issue, but not parties to the case, file friend of the court briefs, making arguments to the court of the reasons that it should go one way or the other on the issues before it. And those are called amicus briefs or amicus briefs and these are people, who, so these are organizations, frequently charitable organizations, organizations created in part for the purpose of advancing particular issues, and they are advocating in court that a decision come out one way or the other. This provision, Section 7, would require in any such case that the contributors or anybody that contributed 3% or more of the annual gross revenue of the amicus party, the party filing the brief, would have to, they'd have to be identified publicly and, uh, and their names listed in the amicus brief. Here's the problem with that. It's unconstitutional. Um, 
And here are a couple of places where the United States Supreme Court has so decided. In 1958, Democrats in Alabama tried to force the NAACP to disclose its contributors and its members. And the Supreme Court said in that 1958 opinion, it is hardly a novel perception that compelled disclosure of affiliation with groups engaged in advocacy may constitute as effective a restraint on freedom of association as other forms of government action previously held unconstitutional. This court has recognized the vital relationship between freedom to associate and privacy in one's associations. When referring to the varied forms of governmental action which might interfere with freedom of assembly, the court previously said a requirement that adherents of particular faiths or political parties where identifying armbands, for example, is obviously of this nature. Compelled disclosure of membership in an organization engaged in advocacy of particular beliefs is of the same order. Inviolability of privacy in group association may, in many circumstances, be indispensable to the preservation of freedom of association, particularly where a group espouses dissident beliefs. Now, that was Democrats of 1958 that were seeking to force that disclosure at that time. The more things change, the more they stay the same. In uh, California, Democrats tried to force people who were contributors to charities to systematically disclose their donors. And just last year in July, the United States Supreme Court and the Americans, in the Americans uh, for Prosperity versus Bonta reminded Democrats what the Constitution requires. They said, well, I mean, in that case, they were talking about, you know, the contributors are to organizations who often were advocating religious freedom, free speech, family values, and, of course, they wanted to expose whoever would be advocating for that. And uh, they said, the court said there, the petitioners here, for example, introduced evidence that they and their supporters have been subjected to bomb threats, protests, stalking, and physical violence. It almost sounds like the advocacy outside justices' houses in, now in the United States. Such risks are heightened in the 21st century and seem to grow with each passing year as anyone with access to a computer can compile a wealth of information about anyone else, including such sensitive details as a person's home address or the school attended by his children. The court concluded, we are left to conclude in this case, that the Attorney General of California, Mr. Becerra, who's now in the uh, administration, his disclosure requirement imposes a widespread burden on donors' associational rights. And this burden cannot be justified on the ground that the regime is narrowly tailored to investigating charitable wrongdoing or that the state's interest in administrative convenience is sufficiently important. We therefore hold that the upfront collection of this information is facially unconstitutional because it fails exacting scrutiny. So the same problem exists with this bill in Section 7. Se deleting Section 7 will eliminate at least that constitutional problem. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does the, general, does the uh, gentleman insist on his point of order? I withdraw the point of order and uh, ask to uh, move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would oppose this, uh, this uh, amendment, uh, and I would point out that uh, this is not a case like the Alabama NAACP case that the gentleman cited, which is uh, requiring the uh, submission or, uh, or um, disclosure of the names of uh, members of an organization. And I would also point out that the racists Democrats who tried to make that happen in Alabama back in 57, 58 would be members of the Republican Party to, today. Um, <laughs> and uh, I would, uh, I would uh, uh, submit that. Uh, Will the gentleman yield? Uh, sure. Can you name any of those uh, Democrats who oppose that who, have, who are now Republicans? No, I, I said back in 58, uh, they were Democrats, but today they would be Republicans. With the gentleman yield they, for another? They would not feel comfortable in the in the Democratic Party of today. Would, would the would gentleman feel, yield for? They would feel home and at ease in the Republican Party. Today. Would the gentleman would, would yield gentleman, for another question? Sure. Uh, how about the Democrats in California who uh, just last year were pursuing um, the disclosure of 
con contributors to charitable organizations in violation of their well, associational I mean, rights. Would they be, have they changed for the Republican yeah, Party? Yeah, that was a case that uh, involved the IRS uh, seeking the names of uh, people who contributed to, uh, to so-called charities that were uh, not really charities. And right, so but it was, it was, was would the gentleman yield, please? Reclaiming my time, uh, you know, this is not about racism. This is not. Would the gentleman yield, please? This is not about uh, politics. This is about. Uh, imposing on a Supreme Court that has refused and failed to do so a requirement that it recuse in certain situations and that it report uh, certain things uh, with respect to amicus briefs. People who uh, you say have an uh, interest in the issues, frequently charitable organizations like the Koch brothers, uh, they have an issue that is economic that they want the court to rule in their favor on. And so what they do is wine and dine justices. Uh, you know, I mean, back in uh, 2016, a Supreme Court justice failed to recuse in a major patent case despite owning shares in one party's parent company. And that same year, a different justice attended a $500 per plate dinner in Texas with finance, legal, and oil executives. Another uh, justice that same year omitted from her financial disclosure report the fact that a public university paid for as many as 11 rooms in one of the state's fanciest hotels for her, her security detail, and some family friends. And none of these justices uh, were Justice Thomas. But Justice Thomas, on the other hand, is the poster child why we need uh, uh, to pass the CERT Act today. Uh, long laundry list of will the gentleman things lead, like will the, will the gentleman yield? No, I won't. Accepting private plane rides and gifts, including a Bible once owned by Frederick Douglass, valued at $19,000 from a financier, Harlan Crow, who had donated $500,000 to help Jenny Thomas establish Liberty Consulting, in 2011, uh, a platform that she's used to lobby against laws like Obamacare that were before the same court that her husband sat on and ruled on. It gave $175,000 to a library in Savannah to name a wing after the uh, library after Clarence Thomas and then raised millions of dollars to build a museum in Clarence Thomas's hometown of Pinpoint, Georgia. Uh, Clarence Thomas attended uh, Coke Industries backed retreat in Palm Springs, California at a time when Coke was bankrolling several litigants with cases before the Supreme Court. And that's what they do with these amicus briefs. These so-called friends of with, court with are, actually, are actually entities with business before the court, with interest before the court, and they want the court to rule in their favor. And so I ask my colleagues to stand in opposition to this uh, uh, ill-intentioned uh, uh, amendment, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? What purpose does Mr. Owen seek recognition? What do I seek for? Um, I'd like to strike the word, last word. Gentleman is recognized. Yeah, I, I just want to make a comment real quick. As we get into a topic uh, dealing with justices, how easy it is for the other side to, to, to drift into a call of racism. And I, I'd like to push back on that whenever I can, because no, the, the Democrats of 1958 are the same party that's been responsible for 40% of the black American uh, deaths and abortions. 40% of black Americans today are not that here because of the Democratic, Democratic push for abortion for particularly minority people. Democratic Party is responsible for the illiteracy in every single urban community around here. I think it's time for us also to, to recognize how the Justice Thomas, yield, uh, Justice the Thomas, for a moment? Pardon? Let them just sit in the What justice. did you mean by illiteracy? When 75% of the black boys in the state of California in, 19, in 2017 cannot read and write, that's called illiteracy. And you go to Baltimore, we have zero proficiency in math, that's called illiteracy. Any place there's an urban community, you find illiteracy. And what bothers me when you have black Americans that are successful, 
how easy it is to demean us. Clarence Thomas is a great example of what can happen when you go from nowhere to the top of our society, respected by those who understand his, 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 uh, his thought process, the way it works. We have put down to every single chance you guys, every single chance the other side gets to put him down. You'll do so. It seems that that's the way that it's the theme of any black conservative that wants to speak up for the American way. And actually, I think it's demeaning. I think it's time for us to stop that mess. Let's talk about the policies, if you want to talk about policies. Let's well, stop demeaning the, the people succeeding in this with, country. With the and gentleman have to be black, yield? but don't have to, to think the way you do. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Do you think it's proper for a judge to <laughs> accept a private plane ride? I reclaim, I reclaim 19, my time. I reclaim my time. Bible I reclaim my time. Somebody with I reclaim my time. Court. I think it's time for us to stop. Instead of putting down those who succeed in this country, that gives our kids a chance to see that the American dream is alive and well for everybody. Let's stop the process of because you don't like his ideology, because he's conservative, because he's successful, because you can tell the young people that he can do it just like he did, and I'm not going to yield anymore, okay? <clears throat> um, it's, it's, it's time for us to recognize that we give our young people hope, and I'm, I'm really sick and tired of every chance we get an, an opportunity like this that this comes up where some kind of way there's an attack on the Republican Party that, by the way, is showing more success across the board no matter what the color, creed, and, or, or, or race might be. You, you adhere to Republican conservative values of faith, family, free market, and education, and they will succeed. And that's what we're finding here. I think that's, what it, that's what's a threat right now for the Democratic Party. That's why we're losing. That's why you're losing the Hispanics and the blacks, because they want hope, and they're sick and tired of being demeaned and put down and, and their hope being taken away from them. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? What purpose does Mr. Johnson seek recognition? Strike less word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's just obviously not enough for Washington Democrats to bully the justices of the Supreme Court, which we detailed here earlier this afternoon. But now you want to bully American citizens who just wish to have their voices and views considered by the Supreme Court. I don't know, uh, Mr. Johnson, if you have ever filed an amicus brief at the court. I filed a countless number of them and did this for 20 years. And I represented a lot of amici, a lot of parties who were in good faith. I mean, lots of different types of organizations across the spectrum, and, and they deserve to have their voices heard. But with these draconian restrictions, you're going to chill their free speech. And I think that's the intent. I think the intent here is to silence the voices you disagree with. You, you don't want these voices in the court. You want to prevent them. What is this? I mean, I, I just have a quick question. On uh, line 13, um, on page 10 of the bill, it says, uh, the Director of Administrative Office of the United States Court shall conduct an annual audit to ensure compliance with this section. Is this suggesting that you're going to audit uh, organizations that file amicus briefs? Would the gentleman yield? I will, yeah. Yes, it does. It means that we oh, will, it, it means that uh, there will be oversight of what kind of uh, uh, oversight the Supreme Court is doing over itself. Wow. And okay, we, that, thank we you. We do have oversight responsibility. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, let, let's go dig into the finances of all the uh, amic all, all the, the uh, nonprofit organizations that we disagree with. I thought the Disinformation Governance Board was dystopian and, and Orwellian. This is crazy. I mean, this is crazy. This would change the entire landscape of, of, uh, of the law in our country, and it would, it would, it would prevent people from bringing their voices to the court to be duly considered. I, 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 this is dramatic. We ought to oppose it with every fiber of our being. I yield to Mr. Bishop. I thank uh, Mr. Johnson. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, I would think that an amendment that, op that reveals and lays the reasons for it that opens uh, or makes clear that there is a blatant constitutional violation, violation of people's constitutional rights to associate under the First Amendment that pointing that out would be received with open arms instead of attacked. Uh, I'm, a point that I didn't quite understand when I made the point that Democrats in 1958, uh, well, that the court had correct Democrats in 1958 and the same correction had to be made just last year to Democrats trying to force the disclosure of voluntary contributors and members in charitable organizations. I didn't say anything about race. I don't know why Mr. Johnson went there either, Mr. Owens. But the question that I guess I have, one question that occurs to me is, if Democrats 
Mr. Johnson said those Democrats would be Republicans today, the ones in 1958. Here's something I always wonder about, by the way, is why don't you change the name of the Democratic Party to avoid the confusion? <laughs> Never occurs. that You take down statues and, and, um, and rip people's names off of buildings all the time, Abraham Lincoln, whatever, but you never think that party where all those old Republicans were, <laughs> well, they switched. Never take that down. Uh, you know, this is a very serious issue, though, and I think you said, Mr. Johnson, if I understood, part of your response was that this, you distinguished the California law that the Supreme Court just struck down last year from what you propose to pass here by saying this is not, doesn't require disclosure. But it, Mr. No, Johnson pointed out the, disclosure Mr. Johnson, of membership blew, list. it's my time, sir. Said. It's my time. Mr. Johnson pointed out uh, that um, it has a provision to audit, but if you go to the previous <laughs> page, at the, near the beginning of section seven, it wants to stick a new code section in the United States Code, disclosures relating to amicus activities, a, subsection A, disclosure. And then it goes down below that and says you gotta disclose the name of any person who contributed not less than 3% of the uh, uh, annual revenue of one of these amicus parties, usually nonprofits, or contributed more than $100,000. It's exactly what was done before. Maybe, I don't know if Mr. Johnson would yielded to you for an answer to this question, Mr. Johnson of Georgia, but the question I'd like to have answered is, what is the compelling interest of the United States government would the gentleman yield? that would be served by a, in a narrowly tailored way by forcing the disclosure of the identities of these contributors in the exact way that was ruled unconstitutional in the NAACP case in 1958 in Alabama and the one in California just last year? I don't yes, know. Yield. Would the gentleman yield? yield? Yes, sir. Yes, when uh, the Koch brothers funds 35 different organizations that then submit amicus briefs on a particular issue, and all of these briefs are calculated uh, to achieve the same result. They are like a one, two, three, four, five punch, and it's all from one individual or one uh, well, George Soros contributes uh, 10 or 100 the time of the more gentleman more than, than has George expired. Soros needs to the be time exposed of the okay. for time amicus briefs. And the time of the, the gentleman the expired. judges need to know the who it is that's trying to influence them. The time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, I now recognize Mr. myself uh, for five minutes um, in opposition to the amendment. The bill uh, recognizes that Americans are rightly worried that dark money interests are trying to capture the Supreme Court in order to advance a radical agenda aimed at protecting the ultra-wealthy and undermining the fundamental rights of everybody else. Too often, these interests work behind the scenes using front groups who hide their funding sources to file coordinated amicus briefs. These same groups pour money into lobbying campaigns in order to support, in support of the justices they want on the bench. The bill simply requires parties and amicus filers to disclose their financial connections to the justices, and it also requires amicus filers to disclose their major funders. This makes eminent sense so that the people of the United States can know who, in fact, is funding uh, the amicus briefs and uh, the viewpoints advanced in front of the uh, Supreme Court. Will the chairman yield? I, no, I will not yield. Um, in addition to which, I should like to say on a, on a separate question that's been raised, and that is about the De Republican and Democratic parties, though I don't think this is really uh, uh, terribly relevant to the amendment, but the fact is it was stated uh, by people on both sides of the aisle uh, about the identity of the Republican and Democratic parties. Now, the fact is the Democratic Party changed. The racist Democratic Party of the 19th century and of the early 20th century changed because of the Civil Rights Act. When the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1965, the uh, racist Democrats reacted against that, and because Senator Goldwater opposed the Civil Rights Act, the racist Democrats became Republicans. And you can see this in the careers of people like Strom Thurmond, who began as a Democrat and ended up as a Republican, and um, uh, uh, George Wallace, the same. And the fact is that the parties changed. So Abraham Lincoln, were he alive today, would be a Democrat. 
<coughs> uh, because the Republican Party, which started out as an anti-racist, anti-slavery party, That's crazy. It, it changed also. And today, the people who take the anti-racist view are known as Democrats. Um, so that's, that, now that's just a history lesson. It's not um, of great importance to the worth of the amendment, but I thought I had to correct the history. And uh, the amendment ought to be opposed because it is, uh, 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 it is destructive of the purpose of the bill, which is salutary, which is to enable people to know who is funding uh, amicus briefs and who is, funding, uh, who is funding amicus briefs, on whose behalf they're filed, uh, who are the real parties and interests. And I yield back. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, who Mr. else Chairman. seeks, does anyone else seek recognition? Yes. Yes. What purpose does the gentleman from Ohio seek to, recognition? To, to rebut some of the crazy things you just said. The um, gentleman uh, strike the last word? I do. Strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized. The Democrat Party sure has changed because the Democrat Party used to believe in the First Amendment and free speech. That's the big change. I mean, th think about it. Disclose your donors so we can dox them. Disclose your donors so we can cancel them. Disclose your donors, your contributors, so we can protest at their homes. That's what this, everyone knows what this is about because we're watching it unfold as we speak. There are people at Supreme Court Justice Homes protesting as we speak. Barry Weiss had, this, Barry Weiss had a great term. When she, Barry Weiss, not on the right, actually center left, resigned from the New York Times because she said, if you engage in wrong speak, wrong think today, the mob, the cancel culture mob will come after you. And she used a great term. She said, you will face the digital Thunderdome. That's what this amendment's about. Putting people in the Thunderdome so all the left can go after them, intimidate them. This is all, of, Mr. Johnson was right. This is about intimidation. This is about chilling free speech. And it's so consistent with what we've seen from the left over the last year and a half. Just a few months ago, we sat in this room, actually it was across the way, with, uh, with the Attorney General, and we found out they were targeting parents. We just sent a letter to Mr. Garland today. We, we had a whistleblower come forward. Whistleblower come forward over two dozen cases where they have targeted moms and dads. And now, oh, now you file an amicus brief, and there's some people who supported that effort. The left's going to get a hold of their names. They're going to be at their homes protesting. They're going to they're do exactly what the IRS did 10 years ago to conservative groups. The IRS was sending out letters to conservative groups. Do you pray at your meeting? Who are your supporters? Do you have a pastor? I mean, this is craziness. I mean, yeah. Think about in two weeks what we've seen from the left. In just two weeks, this is a scary two weeks. Two weeks ago, we learned there's a disinformation governance board formed at the Department of Homeland Security, run by Nina Jankowitz, who has all kinds of crazy ideas. Last week, there's a leak at the Supreme Court of a draft opinion, and protesters are at people's homes, and today we have a bill that says, disclose your donors. This is as scary as it, as scary as, this is a, the gentleman from North Carolina is, is right on target. It is a great amendment. We should, at a minimum, adopt this to safeguard where the Democrat Party used to be, which was in support of the First Amendment, not chilling free speech, but embracing the First Amendment free speech. And I'll yield to the gentleman from North Carolina and then to California. I thank, uh, I thank the gentleman. And uh, you know, I, it's interesting. The chairman has attempted to <laughs> do this, this uh, fiction about the party switching places. But again, what we've got here avoids all that because you're doing the same things. Yep. You did it in 1958 to the NAACP. You did it last year in California to uh, people who were contributing to charities there. The Supreme Court both times said you're, you, are tr uh, you are steamrolling people's First Amendment right of association. Can't do it. And what are you doing? Same Democratic Party doing the same thing in Section 7 of the bill right here. And Mr. Johnson, I asked him, or got Mr. Johnson of Louisiana to yield to Mr. Johnson of Georgia to say, what is your compelling governmental interest? And the answer was, we don't like rich people. <laughs> we don't like them exercising their constitutional rights to speak. <laughs> we don't want them to do that. They disagree with us. I wonder whether anybody, anybody knows how amicus briefs work. It's not like it's a poll that if, they, they, if somebody goes out and, and writes several of amicus briefs and sends them in, that those, get, those somehow win the day because they're more than the others. It's, it's purely a question of whether arguments get made. 
And you want the court to get the benefit of all the arguments that are apt and, and might have an effect on their, on their decision. So there's, again, what is the, what is the advantage? How, Mr. Chair, the chairman wouldn't engage in a colloquy about it for obvious reasons. This must be humiliating for you to be doing the same thing you did in 1958. Yep. Exact same thing. And you talk, <laughs> and the only defense you have is some fiction about somehow all the Democrats became Republicans and all the Republicans became Democrats. So when you were trundling over people's rights back in 1958, that was really the Republicans even though you're doing it last year and you're doing it again today. You have no answer. You have no answer at all. Um, and I yield back to the gentleman in case the other fellow wanted no, no to. Time yield back. The gentleman Mr. yields back. Is he recognition? Oh, what purpose does Mr. McClintock seek recognition? Uh, this time I will move to strike the last word. I, just strike it dead. I just wanted to share with the chairman one of my favorite uh, quotes from Abraham Lincoln, who addressed the very question that the chair just raised. It was in his reply to Douglas at Alton in October of 1858. He said, that is the real question. That is the question that will continue in this country when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. It is the eternal struggle between these two principles, right and wrong, throughout the world, they are the same two principles that stood face to face from the beginning of time and will ever continue to struggle. The one is the common right of humanity. The other is the divine right of kings. It is the same principle in whatever shape it develops itself. It is the same spirit that says, you work and toil and make bread, and I will eat it. No matter what shape it comes, whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race, it is the same tyrannical principle. And with that, I yield to my friend from Texas. Would the gentleman yield? Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I will perplex you by saying that I totally agree with the words of Mr. Lincoln as, as you quoted them. <laughs> I yield to Mr. Wright. Uh, well, I, I thank the gentleman from California, uh, and I would like to associate myself with his remarks, but I'm not nearly eloquent enough to, to associate <laughs> to myself with that? those remarks. <laughs> Lincoln. Um, but, but I'm uh, in awe of your ability to do that. Um, I, I, would, I would note that the <clears throat> gentleman from Ohio, I, I think, made uh, the cogent points that need to be made, as my friend from North Carolina did. Uh, and and I, I just want to pick up on something that the gentleman from Ohio said about we know what this is all about. And, and this is what I was getting at before about <clears throat> the purpose of this. The purpose of this is exposing and targeting. That's what it's about. And it's in violation of the principles that the gentleman is articulating uh, in the spirit and the letter of the First Amendment and what free speech and what our ability to petition government and our ability to have voice that is to the heart of our republic. And that's what this is about. It's about targeting individuals, targeting people for their beliefs. And nothing is more fundamental. It's not like, at the end of the day, many or any Supreme Court opinion is turning on an amicus brief. But the right of the people to present their views and be able to present the law and to present what they think to the highest court in the land is so utterly fundamental to have this committee, this body, the People's House, target that to try to expose people so that we can see precisely what is happening at the homes of Supreme Court justices right now happen to those who may want to fund something filed at the court. And that's the purpose of doing it. And we all know that. And it's being sanctioned and promoted not just by this body, but by the administration, by the president, and by his own spokesperson, which we saw unfolding when White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said on Tuesday, quote, I know that there's an outrage right now, I guess, about protests that have been peaceful to date, and we certainly do continue to encourage that outside judges' homes, and that's the president's position. So the president of the United States 
through his spokesperson is sanctioning and encouraging that activity, which, which of course is in the case of actually going in front of justices' homes, a violation of statute. Now, I suppose we could have a robust debate about that statute and its implications for First Amendment protected speech, and we could have a debate about that. I'm happy to have that discussion. But it's very clear in the statute that it would be in violation of that statute in the purpose of which is to intimidate justices, which begs the very question of the leaks that we discussed earlier. And that is, at the end of the day, what this is about. That criminal offense, 18 United States Code 1507, picketing or parading, whoever with the intent or interfering with, obstructing or impeding the administration of justice, or with the intent of influencing any judge, juror, witness, or court officer, um, and uh, uh, pickets or parades in or near a building, housing, a court of the United States, or in or near a building or residence occupied or used by such judge. That's what we're talking about. I yield back. Good job. Gentleman yields back. Mr. What, Chair. For what? For what purpose does Mr. Big seek recognition? Move we'll straight the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I thank the chairman for for recognizing me. I want to um, remind people just where we, how far we've come in in many hours today. We had the debate this morning. We 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 voted for umpteen hours in a in a meat locker. Uh, we've come back here and we've. We've continued on with a series of amendments. The nub of everything that has taken place with this bill and the debate today has revealed uh, something that I have argued for a long time, and that is the inherent authoritarianism of the left. This bill, um, the game was up on early when the gentleman from New York said, yeah, you gotta pass this bill, but it's not near enough because what you have to do is you have to pack the Supreme Court to put the people who voted or, or will vote to support the Alito decision have got to be relegated to the minority in perpetuity. In other words, you can never be satisfied with a Supreme Court that might rule against the leftist position. You can never do it. If for some reason the Re Republicans got it again and then, and then they were able to fill and regain the majority, we'd have to pack it again because the attitude was we can never be in the minority. And part of what keeps the authoritarian values of the left is when you can first ostracize, then harass, harangue, remove from society if possible, threaten and intimidate, cajole, cancel, dox, any who have a view that is heterodox to leftist orthodoxy. That's what this bill is, is all about. That's what this particular provision is about. The, the gentleman from North Carolina's amendment provides at least some substance to, to say, well, you know, if you're going to provide some kind of amicus brief, some kind of interaction with the Supreme Court, and you're not the named litigants, but you have an interest and you put together people to actually hear your voice at the United States Supreme Court, this body, my friends across the aisle, want to have the capacity to shame, to dox, to ostracize, to basically cast out of society these people those people who, who might have, again, some kind of heterodox position. And, that's, and it, it, it just boggles the mind to hear the arguments. And they've been um, all, over the, all over the park 
Um, I mean, this, this notion that somehow um, uh, there was a, a wholesale uh, changing from Democrats to Republicans, which must have meant that Republicans switched over to Democrats because otherwise you'd have this problem. It, again, it's a logical uh, fallacy, as I, as I mentioned earlier on a previous amendment that we were arguing about. Well, I, my position is very simple. simple. This amendment takes a horrific bill and makes it only really, really bad. And that's why I support this amendment, and I think it's something that we should be supporting. And with that, I yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. I thank the gentleman from Arizona, and I'm, as I listen to Mr. Biggs, uh, I wonder whether you would yield to the chairman, you know, I, I, for an answer to this question, if it's, there's time. I, Mr. Johnson tried and, and uh, swung and missed at articulating a legitimate a, a, and a compelling governmental interest that would survive strict scrutiny by the Supreme Court for the reasons for forcing the disclosure of donors. I wonder whether you'd yield to the chairman in the event, because he spoke to this as well, in the event he can articulate such an interest. I would yield to the chairman if he would desire. He apparently doesn't desire. <laughs> I agree. It would be an impossible task, and I can understand why I did not undertake it. Mr. Biggs, thank you very much. I yield back to you. The gentleman yields back. He seeks recognition. For what purpose does Mr. Roy seek recognition? We would strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. So I used up a little bit of time from the gentleman from California a minute ago to, to make a point, and, and it uh, reminded me of an um, article that I had read earlier this week from a lawyer friend of mine um, uh, expanding on this point that I was talking about with respect to what the White House Pre -se Press Secretary Ms. Saki had said and with respect to the criminal offense that I outlined uh, that is 18 U.S.C., uh, 1507. And, and the point that the, the author makes is if you talk about this parading and picketing, they are not inherently violent acts. And I've heard a lot of talk today about the peaceful uh, protests as they've been um, uh, characterized with Fire respect bombings. to going out in front of the <laughs> justices' houses and, of course, not wanting to talk about uh, the targeting of um, pregnancy centers and, and places that are trying to foster a pro-life environment. Um, but it, it, it is important to point out that these, these parading and picketing are not inherently violent acts. They are acts of political pressure. And court cases are supposed to be decided based on law, not political pressure, he writes. And this is common sense. Um, because otherwise, we're, we're going down the road of, of, of uh, you know, for example, obstruction of justice if, if the crowds were to interfere or so forth. And here's, I think, what's, what's important. We've got currently the Biden Justice Department is actively prosecuting scores of people for parading at the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Now, that is set aside others that day that were engaged in violent activity, that there are individuals who have been prosecuted solely for their presence of parading at the Capitol. Now, the reason the you is, I'm gonna, let me continue just here, and then I, if I have a little time, then I'll, I'll yield. It, that, uh, that they did not commit any violent acts has made no difference to the prosecutors and the FBI. Now, the reason is, was because they viewed this as having a significant impact on what was occurring at Congress. Okay, so okay, we get, that's that's something that can be debated and discussed. But the point is that was a non-violent activity, parading, sitting here doing this. But yet now, the president and his White House spokesperson takes an entirely contradictory stance in suggesting that well, there are peaceful protests going on in front of the houses of justices, and of course, we're putting aside the non, I'm putting aside the violent protests going on in pro-life clinics around the country. But just to focus on the uh, characterized as peaceful protests going on in front of the houses of justices that is in clear violation of a statute, clear violation of a statute for the very expressed purpose of influencing the justices, which is the whole point, right? The, so the, the, at the contradiction between what we're seeing out of the Biden administration, the Department of Justice, and going after People at the Capitol, and, I, and I'm not trying to open that debate up. I'm saying that is 
acknowledged in the very fact that they were being prosecuted only for parading and nonviolent acts, because they were disrupting a proceeding is what they were trying to go down that road in prosecution. Not debating the merits of that. I'm saying it is entirely contradictory for that president in this Department of Justice to now turn around and say, oh yeah, even though there's a blatant violation of a statute and individuals that are out there in front of Supreme Court justices' houses for the very specific purpose of trying to influence the court's opinion, tied all the way back to the leaks, by the way, notwithstanding the rank speculation, to use the words of my friend from North Carolina, that was offered earlier about <laughs> why and, or who may have leaked those, uh, the, the opinion. The fact is it was leaked. The fact is there is now an enormous amount of pressure being placed on Supreme Court justices, and it is a fact that it violates federal law. And there's not a whole lot of discussion going on about that. But here we are today, completely ignoring all of that and saying, let's target individuals, let's open up for targeting entities, individuals, people for wanting to pit petition essentially or argue a case, make, make a point, make a point <laughs> and defend themselves in the highest court in the land. I think that is something that is extraordinary and is worthy of note. And with that, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose is Mr. Ben Seeger recognition? Uh, let's, try, let's try the last word, Mr. Chair. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I hate to take away uh, from the flights of questionable logic that we've been listening to uh, this evening, but I do want to draw attention to actually the numbers of amicus briefs that are filed just before the Supreme Court. Last year was 900 plus more, 900 amicus briefs. Now, that doesn't tell the whole story though when you compare it to what this bill calls out. It says you must list the name of any person who contributed. Well, that means anybody on the brief. And there's any number of folks on these briefs. In fact, sometimes members of Congress join into these amicus briefs. Would the gentleman by, yield? By the hundreds, no. And I would also go to the next page, which suggests, as we've already heard, the audit. The Director of Administrative Office of the United States Court shall conduct an annual audit to ensure compliance with... Does that mean, Mr. Chair, is it must that every congressperson I can answer who the joins question. an amicus brief is going to be subjected to an audit? I can the answer, answer is that yes, question. of course. And, the, and, the, that, and that, I just want to call out that if, I'm if only If you yield, about, I can answer that uh, question well, actually, and clear up no, your misperception. No, I'm, I'm not going to yield, uh, not at this point until I finish my, my thoughts. Uh, this 900 amicus briefs is only the United States Supreme Court. This bill applies to all federal courts. And each person on the amicus brief, because that is, is the way I take it, contributed to the preparation or submission. That means all of those folks, Mr. Chair. And so I just want to call out, first of all, I, I wonder why this is in this bill, this section that's, that, the, that the amendment suggests should be stricken, because the court itself is supposed to write the rules of procedure and then submit them to us and we have seven months to give the thumbs up or thumbs down. This didn't come from the Supreme Court, and yet it applies. So I would suggest again, for all the reasons we overheard, uh, support for this amendment. With that, uh, I will yield to Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, the disclosures related to the amicus activities that are covered under Section 7 uh, would have to do with any person that files an amicus brief in a court of the United States, the name of the person who contributed to the preparation of the submission of the document, who contributed not less than 3% of the annual, of the gross annual revenue of the amicus or an affiliate of the amicus for the previous calendar year if the amicus is not an individual or who contributed more than $100,000 to the amicus or an affiliate of the amicus in the previous calendar year. So those are the, uh, those are the persons whose names would have to be listed. These are big dollar uh, contributors, and it's, so, it's generally Mr. just Mr. one Mr. entity like Coke. Mr. Johnson, like Mr. Johnson, Coke I'm reclaiming my time, Coke, Mr. Johnson. Who would be behind Mr. Johnson, these reclaiming the time. I just, I just would suggest you go down to line 23 and look at the word or. Did not end. On what page? On page uh, nine. And so what, what the, the section you just read it's not the word end, it's the word or. That's what I and said. What that means I just H read a, the statute. Yes, you did. But you're trying to suggest that it's only those people that contribute over $100,000. Well, 
No, I it's, not, I that's didn't. what you just said, and it does not. It applies to anyone as or, subsection. I said, I said or. So 3% contributed 3% or $100,000 uh, to the amicus or the affiliate. That's a lot of money. Mr. Johnson, reclaiming my influence. time, Mr. Johnson, I, you, you are incorrect in your analysis and incorrect in your language. If you wanted it to read the way you are suggesting it should, it should have been written with the word and, A, and, or, and then that, that, would, have, that would have meant that A, B, and C were read as one. But you so didn't write it, it that way. You put in the word or. That means we look at each one of those, and that would be the foundation for the report and the audit. So I'm trying to suggest, uh, and with that, I yield to the gentleman from North Carolina. Following uh, Mr. Benson's point, I thank you for yielding. Um, what, is, what is the point anyway? If we're talking about constitutional rights, are you saying you're selective about whose constitutional rights you want to trample underfoot? Is that the point? Did the gentleman for yield? The language, again, it, it just serves to, to, not at all. It serves to go back to that language. And it, let's, let's not listen to you. Let's listen to the United States Supreme Court of 1958. Inviolability, uh, compelled disclosure of membership in an organization engaged in advocacy of particular beliefs is of the same order, in other words, unconstitutional. Inviolability of privacy and group association may in many circumstances be indispensable to preservation of freedom of association. Time of the gentleman has expired. Doesn't matter who they are. Time of the That's gentleman constitutional has right. The time of the gentleman has expired. Who seeks recognition? Then in that case, the question occurs on the amendment. Uh, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. 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 In the, opinion, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. <clears throat> roll call vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler. No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren. No. Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Mr. Raskin? Ms. Jayapal? Ms. Jayapal votes no. Oh, this is Bass. How am Ms. I recorded? Ms. Demings. Ms. Demings votes no. Ms. Demings votes no. Mr. Correa. Ms. Mr. Correa. Ms. Scanlon. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? Have you write your name on this card? Ms. Garcia? Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Nagus? No. Mr. Nagus votes no. Someone's mic is not uh, muted. Ms. McBath? McBath votes no. Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? Stanton votes no. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones votes no. Ms. Ross? Ross. Yeah, this country, we owe that to our own Ms. Ross votes no. How am I recorded? Ms. Bush? How am I recorded? 
to demand answers. Mr. Chairman, the Zoom is not in order. When it is at the hands yeah. of our We will return to members uh, after all the members have been called. Ms. Bush. Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Shabat. Aye. Mr. Shabat votes aye. Mr. Gomert. Aye. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Isa. Uh, I'm not speaking. Aye. aye. Mr. Isa votes aye. Mr. Buck. Mr. Mr. Gates. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe. Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Tiffany. Mr. Massey. Mr. Massey votes aye. Mr. Roy. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Fishbach. So is this a, has he said this uh, aye. Ms. Fishbach votes aye. Ms. Sparts. Mr. Aye. Ms. Sparts, you'll have to turn your camera on. Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Benz. Mr. Benz votes aye. Mr. Owens. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Jackson Lee. But um, but it's such an. I'm voting. Um, how did the chairman vote? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The chairman voted no. How did the chairman? I'm uh, voting no. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Ms. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded, Mr. Cicilline? Mr. Cicilline, you are not recorded. No. Mr. Cicilline, How is votes Raskin no. recorded? Mr. Raskin, you Mr. are not Chairman, recorded. Mr. Chairman, have I recorded Garcia? Mr. Raskin, you are Raskin not recorded. Votes no. Mr. Raskin votes Raskin no. Votes no. Ms. Garcia? How is Garcia recorded? Ms. Garcia, Mr. Chairman, you are, I vote no. Ms. Ms. Garcia votes no. Ms. Bass? Bass? How am I recorded? Ms. Bass, Bass you are not no. recorded. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Correa? Mr. Correa, you are not recorded. Correa votes no. Mr. Correa votes no. Are there any other members who have not been recorded who wish to be recorded? Clerk a report. Mr. Chairman, there are 15 ayes and 20 noes. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. Uh, for what purpose does Mr. Bishop seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. Who can report the amendment? I reserve a point of order. Point of order is reserved. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 7647, offered by Mr. Bishop of North Carolina. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and the gentleman is uh, recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment also is quite simple. I, I haven't been able to uh, gain the interest of the majority uh, concerning, you know, eliminating a piece of their bill that would trample constitutional rights. I haven't been able to get anybody interested in... Uh, making sure the court attends to, if you're going to impose rules on the court, that the rules see to it that um, uh, information about the court's deliberative process is protected from public disclosure in a way that undermines the court's legitimacy. Couldn't get any buyers on that one. But let's try one more. Uh, this, um, this amendment defers uh, the effectiveness of the bill, makes the effective date of the bill uh, the date that the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation submits to Congress a report on the publication of 
information, personal information that is restricted by law under a provision of the Federal Criminal Code, Title 18, Section 119, about justices of the Supreme Court on the internet, which resulted in the harassment of justices. So if you look at that code section, uh, it, is, uh, it says, whoever knowingly makes restricted personal information about a covered person or a member of the immediate family of that covered person available, publicly available, with the intent to threaten, intimidate, or incite the commission of a crime of violence against that covered person, uh, that's a crime. And, and all those terms, of course, are defined. Restricted personal information includes the home address of a covered person. A covered person is an officer of the United States or any court, uh, a judge. And, um, and, and if, so, if a person does that, they're subject to, do, they should be prosecuted. And uh, I don't know whether the FBI is doing anything, but of course it came, it was, it was, it was widely published that there were uh, Twitter, uh, people tweeting out the personal home addresses of justices of the United States Supreme Court. Just like the leak of the draft opinion was unprecedented in the history of the court, I, as far as I know, I've never heard of the personal addresses of United States Supreme Court justices being published uh, out there on the internet with an obvious purpose to drive intimidation and harassment of those judges. It's a violation of law. And we ought to definitely make sure that we attend to that. Surely, the Democratic majority will not also turn a blind eye to that dangerous situation in the way the Biden administration did for days after that information was released on the internet. We had Jen Psaki who would refuse to say anything about it. Oh, people are upset is her answer to this unlawful conduct. You did not see the Attorney General, Mr. Garland, send out a memo for investigations nationwide of who might be sending out information like that, even though it's clearly a federal crime. He didn't think that was as important as it was to go out and target parents who were protesting at school board meetings, for example, and labeling them with threat tags in the counterterrorism databases. But surely we're going to do this here. This, this is something we couldn't possibly fail to, to deal with because um, we cannot abide it would be just like those findings to the amendment that I offered that were declined by the majority, the findings about institutional attacks on the Supreme Court, to turn a blind eye to the publication of information on the internet which is designed, obviously designed, to facilitate and encourage intimidation and harassment of the highest ranking members of the United States judiciary under the Constitution to bring a mob to their houses. And that has happened. We cannot abide that. Even this majority cannot possibly abide that. And so this amendment very simply will say this law becomes effective after the FBI reports to this Congress. Who did that? Who did that? The country needs to know. They need to be held to account. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Does the gentlelady insist on a point of no, order? No, I withdraw my point of order. Point of order is not insisted upon. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. Um, the bill deals with the actions of justices with respect to ethics, integrity, and corruption. Uh, the amendment doesn't deal with that at all. It has nothing to do with the bill. I therefore oppose it. I urge its, uh, uh, or my colleagues to oppose it as well, uh, because it doesn't deal with the subject matter of the bill. I yield back. Is it germane? Yes, it's germane. It's germane, but it doesn't deal with the subject matter. Uh, who seeks recognition? For our purposes, Mr. Roy, seek recognition. Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I would note. Um, my gen gentleman, the friend, uh, Mr. Jones, on the other side of the aisle earlier laid bare the entire point of this entire exercise when he said that it's not enough to do what this bill does. It will only be enough 
once the court is packed and this current majority is relegated to the minority in a packed court. So to the chairman, I would say that when we say that, well, this isn't necessary or relevant to the underlying bill, I'd say, well, we know what the point of the exercise actually is based on what our colleagues on the other side of the aisle specifically said today. And what the gentleman from North Carolina is saying is all of this is about targeting and harassing. All of this is purposely directed, whether it's at Justice Thomas and his wife, Jenny, which has been raised multiple times today. Again, I point out, as I pointed out earlier today, when people raise questions about Elena Kagan and whether or not she should recuse herself from Obamacare litigation, the immediate allegations were then made against Jenny Thomas for having publicly opposed Obamacare. Would the gentleman yield? I yield to the chairman briefly. Uh, I think uh, uh, Justice Thomas should have recused himself, and I think Justice Kagan should have recused herself. Well. It's interesting, and I appreciate the chairman's comments. It's interesting because there was many conflicting views at the time uh, about that point. Uh, and Justice Kagan, of course, did not recuse herself, and of course, neither did Justice Thomas. My point is that what was raised up at the and they time- they were both wrong. Well, well I mean, one can argue that. But what, what was raised at the time, it was a question, though, of Justice Kagan, who at the time had been the solicitor of the United States and had been a part of discussions, strategies, which she minimized and said that weren't relevant, that she should have recused herself because she was a solicitor of the United States. Whereas the argument that was then brought out, my point being here in the context of this, it was a political attack on Jenny Thomas because Jenny Thomas has views and is engaged in public discourse to affect public policy, as many of us were. I was not a member of the Congress at the time and had publicly opposed Obamacare. Uh, and she did the same, but yet because she's the wife of a Supreme Court justice, she's brought out and then raised and somehow as a reason for uh, equating Justices Kagan and Justice Thomas at the time. So here we are again, and Justice Thomas's wife, Jenny, has trotted back out. And back to the point, this is all laid bare by what the gentleman, Mr. Jones, said earlier that this isn't about the end of us having some sort of discussion about what the ethic, ethics and the structure of the court ought to be and what they ought to do, putting in the context what the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock said, how we weigh separation of powers, what rules should exist, et cetera. It's not having a give and take discussion about that and the courts generally and broadly. It's a specific action raised by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle directed at Justice Thomas and his wife, Jenny. That's been repeated over and over and over again today. Now the gentleman from North Carolina is saying, in the context of all of this, we know the Supreme Court justices have been targeted in violation of law, and that we simply want to know what actually occurred, who did that, and let's put that in this. I mean, we're going to have a robust debate about how we're politicizing the court. Well, then let's have a full, robust debate about how we're politicizing the court, targeting justices, having people go at their homes, having their, uh, their addresses put out, doxing justices in order to try to intimidate them in the context of a leak. I mean, this is the House Judiciary Committee. And we're in the wake of a leak of a Supreme Court opinion, and now people at the homes of justices of the United States Supreme Court. And now we've got a bill before us in the name of transparency and ethics is being used as a ruse for what it really is all about, which is targeting justices and politicizing the court. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, who seeks recognition? Question occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. I'll go down to the, uh, the car. Mr. Nadler? No. Mr. Nadler votes no. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Lofgren votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Ms. Jackson Lee votes no. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Johnson of Georgia? No. 
Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes no. Mr. Deutsch? No. Mr. Deutsch votes no. Ms. Bass? No. Ms. Bass votes no. Mr. Jeffries? Mr. Cicilline? Mr. Swalwell? Mr. Liu? Mr. Raskin? Ms. Jayapal? Ms. Jayapal votes no. Ms. Dimmings? Mr. Correa? No. Mr. Correa votes no. Ms. Scanlon? Ms. Dimmings votes no. Ms. Dimmings votes no. Oh. Ms. Scanlon, Scanlon votes, no. votes no as well. Ms. Scanlon votes no. Ms. Garcia? Cicilline votes no. Garcia votes no. Mr. Cicilline Good votes no. Ms. Garcia <laughs> votes no. Mr. Nagus? Nagus votes no. Mr. Nagus votes no. Ms. McBath? <laughs> McBath votes no. <laughs> Ms. McBath votes no. Mr. Stanton? I don't know that they get that. Stanton votes no. Cicilline's got to think so. Mr. Stanton votes no. Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean? Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Dean votes no. Ms. Escobar? Yeah. That... Mr. Jones? Ms. Ross? Ross votes no. Ms. Ross votes no. Ms. Bush? Bush votes no. Ms. Bush votes no. Mr. Jordan? Uh, yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Shabbat? Aye. Mr. Shabbat votes aye. Mr. Gomert? Mr. Isa? Mr. Buck? Mr. Gates? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes aye. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes aye. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes aye. Mr. Stubbe? Yes. Mr. Stubbe votes yes. Mr. Tiffany? Mr. Massey? Mr. Massey votes yes. Mr. Roy? Aye. Mr. Roy votes aye. Mr. Bishop? Aye. Mr. Bishop votes aye. Ms. Fishbach? Aye. Ms. Fishbach votes aye. Ms. Sparts? Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Fitzgerald votes aye. Mr. Bence? Mr. Bence votes aye. Mr. Owens? Mr. Raskin? How am I recorded? Mr. Raskin votes no. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Jackson Lee, you recorded as no. Thanks. Someone's mic recorded. is not Horns. muted. Mr. Gomert, you are not recorded. Mr. Gomert votes aye. Mr. Owens, you are not recorded. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Jones, you are not recorded. Jones votes no. Mr. Jones votes no. Are there any members who uh, wish to be recorded who have not been recorded? Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 14 ayes and 20 noes. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. For our purposes, Mr. Bishop seek recognition. To strike the last word on the underlying bill. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've come a long way. There's been a lot of discussion here, but I think there's something yet to be said to frame where we are with this bill, 
with the leak on the Supreme Court, with the mobs outside justices' houses seeking to intimidate them. Um, it is part of a pattern, and um, it is a continuing pattern. It's not done, it's not nearly done yet. In fact, I understand this committee has announced that next week there will be a hearing in the House Judiciary Committee on the Dobbs case that is pending before the United States Supreme Court. This, this body, the, the Democrat majority is deciding to conduct a hearing while the committee is not in order. Members should mute. Is going to conduct a hearing on top of the leak, on top of this hearing, which was aimed, as Mr. Roy aptly summarized, at intimidating Justice Thomas, retaliating against him. And they're going to have another hearing. I wonder if that's ever been done before. When, when a hearing, when, it, when a matter is, is pending on the court's calendar for a, a, a decision to be ended, uh, issued before the end of the term, and this extraordinary circumstance, of course, you couldn't have precedent for a hearing after an opinion, draft opinion's been leaked, because that's never been done before. But that's what we're going to see. We're going to see yet another, and it's going to continue. All of these, in, no institutional norm will be respected by the Democrat majority. Whether it's the Democrat majority of 1958, or the Democrat majority in California now, or the Democrat majority here, power, winning. Remember what Lindsey Graham said at the conclusion of the Kavanaugh hearings? You just want power, and you will do anything, anything at all. So you're not concerned about justices' personal dresses being leaked. You're glad to pack the court. You, you can't be embarrassed about it. I mean, FDR, it was recognized to be corrupt by Democrats in his time. Not today. Not today. It takes us back to, and, and by the way, it's not limited to the Supreme Court. I, I, I can't remember, I can't even count the number of times I've heard the majority say they didn't move to defund the police. Mr. Jones earlier today was talking about Republicans being reluctant to support police. But it was Mr. Jones who said, in June of 2020, we must dismantle white supremacy in all aspects of our society. And that means moving away from funding, moving funding away from police departments. That was Mr. Jones. There's another one equally good. Mr. Jones said that. But that's where we are in this country. And there's only one answer to this body's participation by its majority at the highest levels. They warn, the, the Senate majority leader said, we're warning you, you won't know what hit you, justices of the Supreme Court, because you're trying to protect our democracy. Undoubtedly, that's what it is. You're working hard to protect our democracy. With that, I yield to the gentleman from Ohio. In that event, anyone else seeking recognition? I'll take it. Give it to Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Go ahead, go ahead, Andy. Mr. Biggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and thank the gentleman for yielding. With all that we've heard in the last couple of hours, uh, magnifying what was heard earlier in the day, I renew, I renew uh, the call from Mr. Issa and ask that un unanimous consent to add his bill, 7705, to the agenda and consider the bill which deals with protecting the members of the U.S. Supreme Court. And I call for that again right now. I don't hear an objection. Thank you. Let's add it to the agenda. Let's do it. Yes. Very good. Thank you. I I've asked for time to... to, to I asked for unanimous consent. There was no objection. What was the UC request? Well, let's go. What was the UC request? Yeah. What was the request? What was the UC request? Okay. 
to add H.R. 7705 to the agenda and consider the bill? No, no I object. It's not a UC request. Yeah, that is I object. I object. Okay. Yeah, the objection wasn't timely, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I object. I, I would. Uh, I would challenge the chair. I think I, I'm You're challengeable. I'm asserting that. You see, request You're, objected. You, That's that. I think you challenge. How long? How long after the call for it do you get to object? Is it? Could you mail it in tomorrow or something? I. I don't know. Can you object to Mr. Gates's request a couple of meetings ago at this point to put the uh, Hunter Biden laptop in the record? It's at the reasonable discretion of the chair. Chair objected in a timely manner in the judgment of the chair. Does anyone else seek recognition? And that, what purpose does Mr. Owen seek recognition? Strike last word, please. Gentleman is recognized. I'd like to uh, give my time over to uh, the chair. I, 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 member. I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding. I want to pick up where the, the gentleman from North Carolina was. Walking, he, he talked about a pattern. Um, just, again, think about the history here. A year ago, the chairman of this committee, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, introduced a bill to pack the court. And that bill didn't add one justice, didn't add two justices, didn't add three, it added four justices. Now, why would they pick four? Anyone know why they might pick four justices? Because they, it, it, it's packing the court. They want four liberal justices to, to dominate then a 7-6, 13-member court. So a year ago, they introduced a bill to pack the court, adding four associate justices to the United States Supreme Court. Two weeks ago, they had a hearing where they trashed Justice Thomas, went after Justice Thomas. Last week, someone, probably on the left, who knows, probably on the left, though, leaks a draft decision of the Supreme Court. It's the first time it's happened. First time it's certainly happened in my lifetime. leaks a draft decision of a court. Then this week, we have a bill that would require disclosure of anyone who files an amicus brief with the court so they can go after, your, go after donors, contributors, go after people, dox them, cancel them, whatever they're gonna do, protest in front of their house. And next week, we're gonna have a hearing on the same subject that was the issue of the draft opinion, a case pending in front of the court. And all while that's going on, as we speak tonight, they're protesting in front of Supreme Court justices' home. That's the history. That's what's happened. So when, when Mr. Bishop from North Carolina talks about a pattern, it is definitely a pattern to intimidate a history of intimidation of the highest court in the land. That's what's going on. And oh, during all that, we also find out the Justice Department's targeting parents. Whistleblower came forward and over two dozen parents, the counterterrorism measures of our Justice Department, of the FBI, used against moms and dads. No wonder Americans have had it. No wonder they're fed up. No wonder they're concerned. And this is the committee that's supposed to be on the lookout for this kind of ridiculous stuff. Not to be supportive of it, but to try to stop it. And we had good amendment after good amendment that the majority voted down. That's the history. And that's scary. And again, it started a year ago. I remember we were in this room when we learned that the chairman was going to have a press conference. It was like 2 in the morning. Remember, Mr. Johnson and I, a number of us spoke about it. Press conference the next day on a bill to pack the court. This is all about that. All about intimidating the United States Supreme Court. And as Mr. Bishop just pointed out, intimidating them while they're in the, in the, in the middle of making a decision on a critical case about the sanctity of human life. I would yield to the. I would yield back to the gentleman from to, uh, to Utah. To yield to the man from Texas. I, I appreciate uh, the uh, the ranking member, and I appreciate the gentleman from Utah. Uh, I would say that I, I associate myself with remarks from the gentleman from Ohio as a point that I was going to make. I want to add to it that in addition to this being about power and about intimidation, which is clear throughout everything we've seen today. I want to point out, pick up on something that one of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, when she pushed back and said, "Oh, this isn't about opposing a black justice." No, no, she's right. It was about opposing a black conservative justice. That's what it was about. It was about opposing Janice Rogers Brown when that was uh, politically expedient for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle 19 years ago. But it was also about 
in this situation where we had a leaked memo that was very clear, the exact words of the Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Dick Durbin, the words were specific, that Miguel Estrada was dangerous because he is Latino. Yep. That was the word in the memo. That's the exact phrase, the exact quote in the memo. We know it, I was on the Senate Judiciary, I knew it, I was a staffer, we knew exactly what happened, but yet my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, Democrats at the time, they wanted to sweep that aside. They don't wanna talk about that leak, right? I mean, all they wanted to talk about then was that being a leak and that we couldn't talk about the substance of the leak. Did the gentleman yield? That was it, now I'm gonna go ahead and finish my point to say that is what is so clear, that it is about race, and it is about not, in, not having an Hispanic conservative like Miguel Estrada on the court, and they went to, and no lengths were too much to take down Miguel Estrada and try to ruin his career, ruin his life, and now they want to target Justice Thomas and Jenny Thomas, two of the greatest Americans that I know. I yield back. The gentleman uh, yields, yields back. Uh, who seeks recognition? In that case? Mr. Chair. Ms. Fishbach. Mr. Chair. Ms. Fishbach. Mr. Chair, I, yes, Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word, and I would yield my recognized. time to Ranking Member. Jordan. Would yield my time to Ranking Member Jordan. I thank the gentle lady for yielding. I would yield to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. It, well, Ms. Fishbach, I would ask you to yield to the gentleman from Arizona, if you would, please. Thank you, uh, and Mr. Chair, I would yield to the gentleman from Arizona. I thank the gentle lady for yielding. How how dangerous has this committee become? Yeah. Really, I mean. I talk about this all the time. I see the weaponization of the left of virtually every institution in this country. But this committee is also being weaponized. You're seeing it today. Good point. When the gentleman spoke this morning and revealed the purpose of this hearing on this bill, this bill not being enough, it's not going to go nearly as far as they want, but they want to pack the court. And what do they mean by packing the court? Well, if it's conservatives, then packing the court is... Um, you know, adding conservatives to the majority. But if it's Democrats, it is actually increasing the number of members on the Supreme Court so that the majority who might be uh, uh, not, not antithetical to their viewpoint are now become relegated to the minority. But in the meantime, all, I mean, we've, 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 we've talked a lot about the protest. We, we've forgotten about the violent protests at the, the crisis uh, birth, birth centers. But, but when this committee now schedules a hearing on a bill based on a leaked draft memo, in the middle of their deliberations, while they're kicking it around, we don't even know what the numbers are. But somehow we're going to get it together next week with this, this whole gallery will be filled with people who are, you know, oh, we gotta have the, we gotta stop the overthrow of Roe v. Wade. This committee becomes a weapon to intimidate the very process the last vestige of due process, that's what this committee's doing. And people say, oh, well, you know what? Uh, we're concerned about, about their approval, you know, the, the public trust in them. You know who, who's trusted far less than the United States Supreme Court? We are. This is the institution that should be trying to recover trust, and you don't recover trust by sticking your nose in the middle of the Supreme Court deliberations on a very important bill, or any bill for, for that matter. But that's what this committee's doing. This committee has become dangerous, it's become weaponized, and I urge some real rethinking from, from uh, the leadership of this committee, because we cannot, we cannot do this. That is not what this is for. We can have fierce debates back and forth. That's healthy for America. It is healthy. The Americans deserve that. The people we represent deserve that. But when you interfere with the institution of the United States Supreme Court because you don't like the outcome of a decision that I didn't like in 1973, 
What a difference. What a difference. Let's not weaponize this committee. And uh, I yield back to uh, Ms. Fishbach. Ms. Fishbach, would you yield to the gentleman from Louisiana? Mr. Chair, I yield uh, the re remainder of my time to the gentleman from Louisiana. Yeah, real quickly, it's, it's dangerous and it is weaponized because we're going against the basic foundations of the country, the principles of separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary. And I was just looking at this statute again that's been referenced all day, 18 U.S. Code 1507. It criminalizes the actions of anyone, it says whosoever, anyone acting with the intent of interfering with, obstructing, or impeding the administration of justice or with the intent of influencing any judge in discharge of his duty. The, 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 the spirit of that and the letter of that law is that they want to prevent any citizen, any common citizen from trying to influence a judge. Here we are, the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> My gosh, the other branch of government with jurisdiction over the courts bullying the courts into submission so that they will rule in your favor. It's, it, I mean, it's truly surreal. The founders, the framers of the Constitution could not have imagined a scenario like this. It is surreal. This hearing next week, is, it, this is going to be an unprecedented moment in American history, and it's a shameful one. We're part of history, but it's a shameful page in history. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentlelady's time, time, time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Call the vote. Reporting quorum being in that case, uh, in that case, the question occurs on the amendment, nature of a substitute. This will be followed immediately by a vote on final passage of the bill. All those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to. Reporting quorum being present, the question is on the motion to report the bill H.R. 7647 is amended. Favorably to the House. Those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. No. The ayes have it. No. The, bill, the bill is ordered to report it. Just a couple minutes. The recorded vote has been requested, and the clerk will call aye. the roll. Mr. Nadler. Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Cohen. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Aye. Mr. Johnson of Georgia votes aye. Mr. Deutsch. Aye. Why is this Mr. Deutsch happening? votes aye. Ms. Bass. Aye. Aye. Ms. Bass, you have to turn your camera on. I can't find my camera. <laughs> um, so we're there. Keep happening. Mr. Jeffries. Mr. Cicilline. Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Swalwell. Mr. Liu. Will remote members please mute unless you are voting? Thank you. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin votes aye. Ms. Jaipal. Ms. Jayapal votes aye. Ms. Dimmings. Aye. I'm here. Ms. Dimmings votes aye. Mr. Correa. Take a Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon votes aye. Ms. Garcia. Garcia votes aye. Ms. Garcia votes aye. Mr. Nagoose. Aye. Mr. Nagoose votes aye. Ms. McBath. McBath votes aye. Ms. McBath votes aye. Mr. Stanton. Stanton votes aye. Mr. Stanton votes aye. Ms. Dean. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Dean votes aye. Ms. Escobar. Mr. Jones. Aye. Mr. Jones votes aye. Ms. Ross. Ross votes aye. Ms. Ross votes aye. Ms. Bush. Bush votes aye. Ms. Bush votes aye. Mr. Jordan. 
Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Shabbat? No. Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Gomert? No. Mr. Gomert votes no. Mr. Isa? No. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Buck? Mr. Gates? Mr. Johnson of Louisiana? No. Mr. Johnson of Louisiana votes no. Mr. Biggs? Mr. Biggs votes no. Mr. McClintock? Mr. McClintock votes no. Mr. Stubbe? No. Mr. Stubbe votes no. Mr. Tiffany? Tiffany, no. Mr. Tiffany votes no. Mr. Massey? No. Mr. Massey votes no. Mr. Roy? No. Mr. Roy votes no. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop votes no. Ms. Fishbach? No. Ms. Fishbach votes no. Ms. Sparts? Mr. Fitzgerald? Mr. Fitzgerald votes no. Mr. Benz? Mr. Benz votes no. Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes no. How am I recorded? Ms. Bass? How am I recorded? Ms. Bass? Ms. Bass, you were not recorded. Bass votes no. Ms. Bass votes no. How am I recorded? Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Ms. Jackson Lee, you recorded as I. This is final passage. This is final passage? Yes. This is final I'm passage. sorry, Bass votes I. Ms. Bass votes I. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Ms. Escobar, you are not recorded. Uh, Escobar votes I. Ms. Escobar votes I. Mr. Chair, how is Lou recorded? Mr. Lou, you are not recorded. Lou votes I. Mr. Liu votes aye. Ms. Garcia? You're, you're muted. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Correa? Oh, I've already voted, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Correa, you are not recorded. Correa votes aye. Mr. Correa votes aye. Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, I had voted earlier. Was it not recorded? Ms. Garcia, you recorded as I. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any members who wish to be recorded who haven't been reported? Uh, recorded? A quick report. Mr. Chairman, there are 22 ayes and 16 noes. The ayes have it, and the bill is, am is ordered reported favorably to the House. And the bill is amended as ordered reported favorably to the House. Members will have two days to submit views. Without objection, the bill will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute, incorporating all adopted amendments, and staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes. Pursuant to notice, I now call up H.R. 6577, the Real Courts Rule of Law Act of 2022 for purposes of markup. I move that the committee report the bill favorably to the House. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 6577, to establish under Article 1 of the Constitution. That objection, the bill is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. H.R. 6577, the Real Courts Rule of Law Act of 2022, would take the much needed step of moving the immigration court system out from under the authority of the Department of Justice and establishing a new and independent Article 1 court. Currently, the U.S. immigration court system is administered by the Executive Office for Immigration Review, also known as EOR, an agency housed under the, under the Department of Justice. Unfortunately, since its founding in 1983, EOR has struggled as a judicial body because it lacks independence from the executive branch. Immigration judges are appointed by the Attorney General and considered attorneys under the control of the Justice Department. As a result, our immigration court system is highly susceptible to political interference from whoever is in charge of the Department of Justice. This interference, which has occurred under administrations of both parties, casts a shadow over the ability of our immigration judges to serve as neutral arbiters 
when it comes to making life-changing immigration decisions affecting the people who come before them. Currently, what cases immigration judges hear, how often they grant continuances, and the type of relief they can offer are all controlled by the Department of Justice. If that was not enough, an attorney general can also take any decision with which they do not agree and certify to themselves to change or shape through a process known as self-certification. This process has been used sparingly, and had been used sparingly until the Trump administration, which used it a record 17 times in only a four-year span to further its extreme anti-immigrant agenda. Our country deserves an immigration court system that works, not one where immigration judges are used as pawns in our immigration policy arguments. That is why I was pleased to join Subcommittee Chair Lofgren in introducing the Real Courts Rules of Law Act of 2022, which moves our nation's immigration courts into a new independent Article I structure. By creating an independent immigration court system, we would finally restore much needed faith and confidence in the decisions made by our immigration courts. And immigration judges would finally have full control of their dockets, which would result in more efficient and fair adjudication of cases. Under this legislation, judges would be chosen by an independent merits panel of an appeals court that is filled with judges confirmed by the U.S. Senate. And perhaps most importantly, the Attorney General would no longer be able to interfere and meddle in immigration court cases or make policy. Although challenges would still remain even after the creation of an independent immigration court, including a record-long backlog of, in cases, this legislation would take important strides towards a more just and efficient system. I would like to thank our Immigration and Citizenship Subcommittee Chair Zoe Lofgren for her leadership and steadfast commitment to this issue. I appreciate all of her efforts in introducing the Real Courts Rules of Law Act, and I urge all my colleagues to support this important legislation. I now recognize uh, Mr. Johnson for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm, I'm really, I am astounded. I don't know if you guys on this side of you are hearing what the chairman just said. But he literally just said, let me quote him, he said, the, the American people deserve an immigration court that works. How about a border that works? I mean, we have a crisis on the southern border, and the Democrats' response is pathetic. Rather than securing the border, the Democrats on this committee are focused on the judges adjudicating immigration cases. This is like having leaking pipes and thinking the answer is to buy more mops rather than fix the leaks. We've already doubled the number of judges since 2016 and hasn't made a dent in the backlog of immigration cases. There's no reason to believe that moving immigration judges from the executive branch to the judiciary would do anything but prolong trials and delay deportations. This legislation is a piece of the Democrats' soft on crime, open borders agenda that every American can see with their own eyes. And what good will this reform do when the Biden administration's failure to secure the border will only continue to add cases to the backlog? U.S. Customs and Border Protection has encountered over 2.5 million illegal aliens along the southwest border since Joe Biden became president. Border Patrol agents continue to encounter large groups of illegal aliens, and this administration continues to release them into the U.S. We had a large group of former top officials with Border Patrol and Customs address us in the Republican conference this morning, and what they told us would send a shudder down the spines of every American if they heard it. Of course, what we're seeing now is nothing compared to what we're going to see very soon, because President Biden's decision to undo Title 42 this month is going to completely open the floodgates at the worst possible time. Nobody believes Democrats want to stop illegal immigration. They don't want to stop this crisis because they could. They're choosing not to. As we pointed out in this very committee, this is intentional. And let's be clear, proponents claim this bill will reform the immigration court. You know who the immigration court won't affect? The more than 600,000 gotaways who evaded being apprehended since Joe Biden became president. That's 600,000 people that we cannot trace. We don't know who they are. We don't know where they are. We don't know what crimes they've committed other than illegal entry. And to make matters worse, it is typically ICE's job to track those folks down and arrest them and, and, uh, and, and enforce the law, but President Biden's effectively dismantled ICE's interior enforcement, as we know. This committee needs to get serious about securing the border and getting illegal immigration. This crisis is not even a crisis anymore. It's a catastrophe. We have to get it under control. Instead, the Democrats' priority is to consider legislation that inserts the politically charged Senate confirmation process into immigration courts. 
none of this is going to do anything to secure the border or reduce the immigration case backlog. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. I now recognize myself for purposes of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute, H.R. 6. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and shall be considered as base text for purposes of amendment. I will recognize myself to explain the amendment. This amendment in the nature of a substitute makes two substantive changes along with a number of technical changes. As originally drafted during the transition to an Article I court, H.R. 6577 allowed the President to appoint all the, quote, immigration appeals judges, unquote, who would oversee the new, quote, trial division of interim immigration trial judges. However, the ANS amends the transition to bring the bill in line with recent Supreme Court precedent, which requires Article I court decisions to be directly reviewable by a Senate-confirmed official. The ANS now requires that three Senate-confirmed appeals judges are in place for the transition period to begin. This change will ensure that decisions by immigration trial judges who are not Senate-confirmed are reviewable by a Senate-confirmed judge on day one of the new Article I court. This change also required conforming amendments in Section 6 of the bill, such as transitioning all the current immigration court judges to be interim immigration trial judges. The second substantive change relates to appeals. Under the current immigration court system, if the Board of Immigration Appeals rules against the government, the government does not have the right to appeal. As originally drafted, H.R. 6577 maintained this approach, but it is inconsistent with the goal of establishing a fair and independent immigration court. The, uh, the ANS specifically amends the legislation to allow the government to appeal to a federal court, circuit court of appeals. At the same time, it was important that this approach does no harm. That is why the amendment adds appointed counsel for individuals in cases where the government appeals an appellate division decision if such individuals cannot afford counsel. With regard to the technical changes, they are all minor and designed to ensure that the legislation is implemented as intended. For example, it raises the mandatory retirement age from 70 to 80. A mandatory retirement age is also included in other Article I courts, such as the United States Tax Court. I urge all members to support the amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman? For what purpose does the gentlelady from California uh, to seek strike government? the last word? Gentlelady is recognized. Uh, thank you. I think this evening the Judiciary Committee is beginning this important step forward to restore confidence and due process to the immigration court system. As has been mentioned, the immigration courts have been housed in the executive branch under the Department of Justice. Unfortunately, this has led to many decades of meddling by both administrations, both parties, and that's undermined public trust in the system. Over the last two years, the Immigration and Citizenship Subcommittee has examined this issue, holding multiple hearings. I've also, uh, as the author of the bill, reached out over the past several years to experts both in the courts, in the bar, and academically uh, to uh, learn more about how we might restore independence and due process to this system. We've heard from immigration judges uh, who say that despite their best efforts, they are saddled with crushing caseloads. They struggle to deliver just and timely decisions that are free from political influence. We've also discussed how the Attorney General's broad authority to reshape immigration policy through a procedural mechanism known as self-certification has created whiplash for judges, attorneys, and policy makers. This self-certification gives the Attorney General unilateral power uh, to create new law or modify long-standing precedent by reconsidering decisions issued by the Board of Immigration Appeals. Uh, this self-certification process has been used by uh, all administrations in recent times, actually going back to the Eisenhower administration, and has been more uh, frequently used in the near past. Um, what it really does is to say that the Attorney General can insert politics into the decision. He's not in the courtroom. He didn't see the facts apply to the law, apply to the law, but he can change the outcome. 
I believe uh, that this falls short of what people believe when they walk into court. They believe that the facts and the law will be applied to their case uh, independently and without political bias. And I think this law, which I inter introduced with uh, Chairman Nadler and uh, Congressman Johnson earlier this year, will provide a solution. The bill would move the immigration court system out from under DOJ and create a new independent court consistent with Article I of the Constitution. This is similar to what the Congress has done to adjudicate matters involving specialized areas of federal law, such as the U.S. Tax Court and the U.S. Court of Veterans' Appeals. Both of those courts began as components of agencies with little separation from those responsible for executive leadership before Congress found it necessary to ensure their independence. Uh, creating an Article I court uh, will help uh, the court function as other courts do, where judges have the flexibility and resources to conduct full and fair hearings, due process is held in the highest regard, and parties on both sides have faith in the outcome of the case. The Attorney General would no longer have the ability to certify cases to himself or herself and make law unilaterally. Multiple nonpartisan organizations, including the American Bar Association, the Federal Bar Association, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and the National Association of Immigration Judges, all agree that an Article I immigration court is the proper path forward. I would note uh, that this bill is not intended to solve every issue or every problem uh, or challenge that faces our country when it comes to immigration. I would hope and assert, however, that it's always the right time to pursue due process. It's always the right time to pursue a court system uh, that meets the standards of being apolitical, uh, that can be held out and believed to be just, and who will apply the law uh, carefully, apolitically, according to the facts before it. And so, Mr. Chairman, I hope that we can proceed uh, with this bill, and I thank you for uh, recognizing me and yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. McClintock seek recognition? Uh, to speak on the motion. Gentlemen, recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is one of the more insidious parts of the Democrats' open borders agenda. It would remove immigration enforcement from the Department of Justice and create an independent court system. Independent. Independent of whom exactly? Well, independent of the will of the voters. This from the same people who tell us democracy is under attack. Enforcement of our immigration laws is quintessentially an executive function. It's under the control of voters through the person they elect as president. In a democracy, we get the government we vote for. Unfortunately, when the American people voted for Joe Biden, the Democrats, they ended up voting for their open border policies. Perhaps they regret that now. Well, they'll have the opportunity to change those policies in the next two elections. The Democrats here know that, and they want to lock in these open border policies regardless of what voters may prefer. Now, just since the Democrats took office, they've deliberately admitted over a million unvetted illegal border crossers into the country. That's roughly the population of Montana. And that doesn't account for the 750,000 gotaways who've evaded the Border Patrol while it's been overwhelmed by this incursion. That's roughly the size of Vermont. And by lifting Title 42 restrictions, we expect as many as 18,000 a day will be admitted. That's like adding a new state of Alaska to the population every 40 days. Well, now they're here, what do you, how, how do you legalize them? Well, you set up your own court system beyond the reach of the next president to change. That is, beyond the will of the voters. Now, we're told this is necessary to reduce the backlog of millions of applicants, but we have the backlog precisely because of their open border policies. President Trump dramatically increased the case completion rate by instituting reforms that included completion goals and reform of, of continuance abuses. Biden reversed all of these policies. This measure would make it impossible for the next president to restore them. 
Moving the same backlog of cases from the Department of Justice to a new Article I system is not going to magically fix these problems. And here's another irony. The bill requires the Judicial Conference of the United States to oversee aspects of the immigration courts. Now, the Judicial Conference of the United States is opposed to the establishment of an Article I immigration court administered uh, in this manner. It has raised concerns about the ability to, quote, handle the high volume of immigration cases, what effect removing attorney general discretion over the adjudication of immigration cases would have on the adjudication process, and possible constitutional administrative concerns, unquote. In fact, I'd ask unanimous consent to, for their entire statement to be entered in the record. Without objection. The uh, merit selection panel created in this bill seems to give the immigration bar and immigration academics a lot of power and influence over who becomes an immigration judge or appellate immigration judge. But that's the whole point, isn't it? Also, removing the immigration courts from the executive branch creates serious separation of powers implications because the executive branch is responsible for ensuring that immigration enforcement is consistent with our foreign policy. The real solution is, uh, to reducing the, the, the backlog is a secure border, including effective implementation of programs such as the migrant protection protocols and applying mandatory detention laws as intended by Congress. If aliens know that they will be detained once they are illegally entering the United States, as opposed to simply being let free, they're not going to come, because the cartels don't give refunds. But the fine point of the matter is this. We won't see our borders secured until the people responsible for this crisis are turned out of office. They know it. And that's why they're working desperately to insulate their policies from the voters. Next year, a Republican majority will produce laws to restore our nation's sovereignty. That will include changes to U.S. law to raise the credible fear standard, prevent other abuses of our asylum law, fix the Flora Settlement Agreement, which requires release of families after 20 days, and amend U.S. law so that unaccompanied alien children from non-contiguous countries can be immediately returned to their homes, just as those from contiguous countries. When fewer cases are being filed, the backlog will be reduced. I oppose H.R. 6577, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does Ms. Escobar seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to Representative Lofgren for this uh, very important, long overdue piece of legislation. Let's be clear. The extreme MAGA party does not want to fix our immigration system. It's been nearly 30 years since Congress passed any kind of immigration reform. And the last chance that America had to address immigration reform, well, it was in 2013 when the US Senate passed bipartisan immigration reform. That reform would not just have modernized our immigration laws, but it would have allocated an historic amount of funding to border security, but it got derailed. Why? It got derailed because the Tea Party Republicans in the House, those same members who are now the so-called Freedom Caucus, they derailed it. Ever since then, the same cast of characters, in fact, some of those same cast of characters are still in Congress today. Some of them are still on this committee today and they've added new ones. They continue to stand in the way of any kind of reform to our outdated and broken immigration system. There should be absolutely nothing controversial about allowing judges the independence they need in order to function fairly. In fact, if my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to see a more efficient and professional system that moves the backlog and more effectively adjudicates cases, then they would support this legislation. If they want to solve some of our country's greatest immigration challenges, if they want to fix systems that all Americans believe are broken, they will support this legislation. But if their only interest is to rail and scream about the border, spread xenophobic myths to keep our country divided, and they hope to keep themselves in office, then we know that they will do everything possible to prevent reform and maintain the status quo. 
The challenges that we face at the border and in our immigration system, they aren't new. In fact, under the last administration, we saw the very same challenges and we tried it their way. In fact, Donald Trump did everything possible to be as cruel as possible and it didn't work. It didn't stop migration. It didn't deter it. It didn't slow it down and they know it. When they had control of the White House, the Senate and the House of Representatives, we saw the same challenge. Did they fix it? Did they address it? No. And what's the, bit, the main difference between them and us? House Democrats are trying to address these challenges. We're actually bringing up reforms and laws that we know will work. Hopefully Americans watching at home see that Republicans today are all about performing. They're not about governing. The louder they yell, they think the more that they can convince you. I'm proud to support this legislation and I hope that the American public can clearly see who's working to really solve our challenges and who is standing in the way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, uh, the gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Roy seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. The only performance is this entire charade put on by Democrats in this committee that they give a wit about what's actually happening at the border of the United States. That they give a wit about migrants. You want to see where the while hell in we the, are? While in the false name of compassion. What is the order? Can we have order in the committee, Mr. Chairman? For the goodness someone has gracious. Should mute, someone should mute their microphone. People take their pajamas off and get the frig back in their job. I mean, <laughs> good grief. I mean, seriously. I mean, I took a little aside here. This is absurd. I mean, you know, you had COVID, and here we are. We got people hanging out at home, like talking to half their conversation, turning their TV on. It's an absolute abomination. This is the way we're operating a committee. It's shameful. It's almost as shameful as the absurdity that I just heard about performance, right? It's a performance, right? I'm well aware because I've seen the scoffing, I've seen the eye rolling by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I sat here and watched the Secretary of Homeland Security look straight at us and lie that we have operational control of the border when we have no such thing. And this entire bill, this entire piece of legislation is designed to, quote, solve a problem which is created by the very people advancing it. Having judges on the back end processing the very claims that they're encouraging in violation of our law, both the spirit and the letter, in violation of the law to detain individuals while they're supposed to be dealt with, in direct contradiction of the entire premise of having operational control of a border. And meanwhile, migrants die. Just now, a video that was posted just a little bit ago of a parent going across the Rio Grande, almost going under, almost drowning with a literally weeks old newborn above the water. This is compassion. The mobile morgues, the body trailers in South Texas, that's, that's compassion. And the solution being offered are more judges or changing the judicial structure in order to, in the words of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been talking about it, streamline and improve the processing. But in fact, what you're doing is blatantly encouraging more people to come in violation of our laws that say secure the border and where there is an exception for consideration of a legitimate asylum claim with credible fear, make a determination. My colleagues prefer to flood the zone purposely, knowing that the vast majority of the claimants do not have credible fear, overwhelm the system, and then come up with a fraudulent patch to the system by saying, let's just move judges to another location. Let's call them something else. And then let's pat ourselves on the back for processing more individuals. While they all end up getting abused by cartels for profit, and my colleagues on their side of the aisle sit there and say, oh, we're the ones engaging in performance. The entire Democratic Party is one great big performance, a performance based on race baiting and lies. That's what the Democratic Party is reduced to. We saw it all day this afternoon with this bogus attack on Clarence Thomas, this bogus attack right now 
on our very system of justice and having a border that's secure and an immigration system that works by now trying to punt to some sort of absurd structural change in our courts. But we'll do nothing as the secretary sat here and smirked at us, smirked at this body, claiming operational control when there's no such thing. And to listen to my colleagues say, oh, yeah, no, there was no impact by the previous administration's policies. It's absolutely blatantly absurd. The numbers were a fraction of what they are now because we were actually enforcing the law. The law as written, the law as anybody with a first grade education can be able to see requires that we detain, requires that we have operational control of the border. Instead of having border patrol agents amount to nothing more than processing agents and babysitters at a handful of parts while dangerous individuals, including 42 people on terrorist watch lists, come into the United States and almost 500 gang members, 700,000 gotaways. Performance, the entire Democratic Party is a performance, and it's a shame. We've had Democrats stand up for secure borders in the past, and now they walk away. The time of the gentleman has back. expired. Uh, for what purpose does Ms. Uh, Scanlon seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady's recognized. Thank you. Before coming to Congress, I spent decades working on immigration cases and with our immigration system, one of only a handful of members of Congress to have actually worked in that system. And like our colleagues across the aisle, I've actually traveled to the border and spoken with government agents and advocates to gain a clearer understanding of the facts on the ground. Although unlike many of our colleagues across the aisle, I didn't feel it necessary to wear camo or engage in cosplay when I did so. But I do know from firsthand experience that our immigration system has been underfunded and dysfunctional for decades. But the actions of the former administration to politicize and dismantle our immigration system compounded pre-existing problems, and nowhere more so than in its efforts to eliminate due process protections and undermine the independence of our immigration courts. The former administration implemented rules to restrict immigration judges' independent authority, imposed unreasonable case quotas, circumvented hiring processes to appoint more partisan judges, and took cases away from judges that Jeff Sessions and Stephen Miller felt were too sympathetic to the immigrants asserting legal rights before those judges. Although the United States has always derived its moral authority and international stature from being a nation of laws, these efforts to constrain immigration judges impacted their ability to apply the law and ensure due process in American courts. Nowhere was this politicization more evident than when the Sessions Department of Justice intervened in a deportation case before an immigration judge in Philadelphia after he ordered a short continuance to ensure that a juvenile who was facing deportation could actually be located and notified that his court date had been scheduled. The Sessions DOJ reassigned the case to a judge who ordered deportation without ever locating the child or allowing him to present his case. While this may seem an extreme event, it was not. And it is important that we insulate our legal proceedings from the corrosive effects of judicial, uh, I'm sorry, of executive overreach. Politicizing immigration courts is a direct affront to the due process that our justice system promises and the ideals upon which our country was founded. It's an affront to the beacon of the Statue of Liberty, which welcomes those fleeing persecution and lifts the lamp of liberty. Therefore, it is more important than ever that we support the Real Courts Rules of Law Act of 2022, which would establish an independent immigration court and prevent this inappropriate politicization of the immigration court system. I thank Chairwoman Lofgren for bringing this bill forward and look forward to supporting it as it moves to the floor. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Shabbat seek recognition? Move strike last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. S Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, as we've discussed multiple times uh, in this committee, 
uh, the Biden administration, through its lax immigration policies, has created an absolute catastrophe at our southern border. Their policy uh, is essentially inviting individuals uh, from other countries, uh, really from all over the world now. It's not just from a, uh, they, they may be coming in at the southern border, but they can be coming in from any part of the world. And we know some of them are literally dozens of them on the terrorist watch list. And they cross our border, uh, they get free stuff, uh, free food, uh, free housing, free health care, uh, free education, uh, free transportation um, from where they're at to the location of their choice, essentially, except, of course, back to the country of their origin. That's one place under this administration they won't be sent because they're going to stay uh, in this country. And as we discovered during the previous testimony um, on, on this legislation, they're going to get free cell phones uh, as well. Um, the time spent marking up this bill would have been much better spent uh, addressing the absolute chaos at that border and the lack of enforcement uh, by this administration. Um, and some of the things that have been said by some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I mean, I understand uh, that people get caught up in, in the debate, uh, but, to, but to talk about, um, to talk about uh, supposedly extreme, uh, the extreme MAGA party, it's, it's not extreme at all to want to have control of your borders. After all, we're a sovereign nation. We have the right uh, to determine who comes into this country and who doesn't. And most of us on, on, the, on our side of the aisle are pro-immigration. We're very pro-immigration, pro-legal immigration. It's the illegal immigration uh, that we object to. Um, and, you know, we had my Horkus in here recently, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, and some of the things that he said were, were breathtaking um, as well. Uh, for example, to stay with a, a straight face that this administration has uh, operational control of the southern border, there's no way you could say they have control of the southern border, unless control just means come on in, uh, we'll put you on a bus or a plane. We'll ship you off to some other place uh, in the country. If that's operational uh, control, I can't. I can't, just can't imagine um, what that is. Um, and in addition, I think one of the things that the American people are, are so upset about about this particular topic is when we're talking about all the free stuff that's being provided to people that have come into our country illegally. It's the American taxpayer who's putting the bill for all this. And, and this is the same American taxpayer that right now is seeing over 8% uh, inflation. Again, because of the, the policies of this, uh, of this administration. And it, it's just absolutely in, incredible um, to me that this is continuing. Uh, and, and I do think there's gonna be a reckoning. There's absolutely gonna be a reckoning because being a sovereign nation, we have the right to determine who's going to come here, as I as I said, and right now, under the lack of enforcement uh, from this administration, our laws are just being completely uh, flaunted. Um, and, and essentially, this legislation, in my view, is, is really window dressing. Um, it's it's rearranging the deck chairs on on the Titanic. The Titanic being uh, this administration's border control, or really lack thereof. It, it's absolutely embarrassing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, how about uh, yielding to the man from Arizona, Mr. Shabbat, would you yield to me? I'd be happy to yield the gentleman. Thank you. I, I, got, a, I got a kick here uh, when, when uh, one of the members on the other side said, made a reference to people watching this at home. Well, the only people watching this at home are Democrat members of this committee. <laughs> and it's doubtful even that they're watching this, this hearing. The, the problem that you have here is Biden's extreme anti-American open border agenda. And when uh, the gentlelady from California talked about a, a court system that can take cases apolitically, this doesn't fix that. And when you think, I think of the last bill, where they're intent, intending to politicize the current case that has drawn so much attention. And with that, I'm out of time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. back. For what purpose does Ms. Garcia seek recognition? 
Mr. Chairman, I move to uh, strike the last word. Ten ladies recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and thank you to the bill sponsor, Ms. Lafren, for bringing this very important issue, uh, one that really is not about window dressing, but is to address and make solutions to address a growing concern. The current structure of the immigration courts undermines due process and creates significant barriers to a fair day in court. As a former judge myself, this is truly unconscionable. Existing federal law provides and sustains an immigration court system that is arbitrary, influenced by political strong arming, and with limited resources to deliver fair, timely, and well thought judgments. The unfairness of the immigration courts weighs heavily, especially in my district, where many of my constituents in Houston, where we see immigration judges denying approximately 98% of petitions for asylum, as opposed to our friends in districts in New York with a denial rate as low as 5%. Somebody please just tell me how that's fair. How is this truly equal before the law? And how can such disparities exist? So this is not about window dressing. It's about addressing real problems. Some 1.5 million cases are backlogged in immigration courts across the country. I'll repeat that, 1.5 million. 98,000 of those are in Houston area courts. Explain to my constituents and those people in my area who are wondering what the hell is going on. So as we prepare to reform our immigration system to accommodate our nation's most pressing needs, we must ensure that our immigration court system embodies our core values of fairness, an opportunity to be heard and adherence to the rule of law. Because quite frankly, whether or not my colleagues want to admit it, they talk about being about the rule of law. And in this case, the rule of law and the law says simply that people have a right to exert a claim of asylum. They must follow the law and make sure that the process works and it's fair. That's all that this bill addresses. And I thank again the, the bill sponsor and I would yield the remainder of my time if she needs it to address any other issues that have come before us uh, prior to my remarks. I'm, thank you. General lady yields back. For what purpose does Mr. Johnson uh, seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> it's late. It's almost 10 o'clock. I don't know. I think we've been at this for about 10 hours, and it's been a long day. We had a 22-vote series. Not complaining, just explaining why we're all a little bit haggard. But I tell you what, it's the issue that's really got us worn out. And, and I, I just genuinely wanted to ask a question of my colleagues here, because both of you are here in good faith, and I, and I respect you as individuals. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question of what my constituents asked me. Could the Democrats in charge, and certainly Democrats here with jurisdiction over the border, could they really be in favor of an open border? And I, I, I'm asking you honestly and in good faith. What yeah. is the purpose? Well, I, the would gentleman, I would love to hear your explanation on this. I personally, and I think I speak for most of my party, I believe that um, we ought to have an orderly system uh, where uh, people who enter the United States do so uh, in an approved manner. Uh, and that we have a system, including the court system, that is orderly and well administered. Um, I think part of that is having a system that works, uh, that <clears throat> is functional, which is far from the existing legal system. And we have, and we have been um, unsuccessful, even though we've come close from time to time, in actually updating the immigration laws. I mean, we're basically following the structure <clears throat> that was devised in 1965, and it does not well meet the needs of American business or American families, and that has contributed to the disorder, well, well, which I think all of us would like to fix. I appreciate it. I, I gotta move quick because I don't have that much time, but isn't having a secure border the first and essential component to having a system that works?
I'll tell you this, we now spend more on immigration enforcement than all other federal law enforcement combined. Well, it's not and being used to secure Demo the border. Democrats have voted for that repeatedly, as have Republicans. I don't mean to say it's only Democrats <clears throat> who have voted for that money for enforcement. But Ms. Ms. Locker, have, I, I, gotta, I gotta use my time. I appreciate I that, but I mean, clearly, asked, whatever the so investment is, it. it is not securing the border. Can I ask, Mr. Chairman, you're from New York. Thanks to New York City's council, uh, Beginning January 9th, 2023, more than 800,000 non-citizens will be eligible to vote in municipal elections in New York. Is that, do you agree with that policy? No, nor, uh, non-citizens will not be eligible to, to vote in New York. They never have been, well, they, they were prior, in the 19th century eligible to vote in New York. Well, no, no this and is a recent action. It was just no, passed in December. No, that, that, that is not correct. Uh, non-citizens, uh, have not been eligible to vote in New York or, for, as far as I know, in any other state uh, since the 19th century. That's not true. The New York City Council voted in December to allow this. It begins January 9, 2023. Cities in Vermont and Maryland already allow this, and similar measures are under consideration in Illinois, Maine, and, and uh, Massachusetts right now. If the gentleman will yield? Yes. Uh, I believe those are um, considerations of allowing votes in municipal elections only. Right, but, but th th thank you, that's the point. <laughs> Everybody wants to know at home, why would they allow this? Guys, they're allowing it because they're gonna turn them into voters. They already are doing this in New York City, largest city in America, and this is the plan of our friends on this side to turn all the illegals into voters. That's it, folks. That's what's going on. That's the game. That's why the border's open. That's why they've dropped it. Look, I, I respect Ms. Lofgren and all her work in this arena. Yes, I'll, I'll yield, Mr. Chairman. I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. As a New Yorker, I would love to think that New York is the entire country, but it is not. <laughs> it is not, and consideration is being given to uh, uh, permitting uh, non-citizens to vote in New York, and I believe in, uh, in uh, the capital city of Vermont. I forget which that is. Uh, but it, as, lo, as much as I'd like to believe it, New York and Vermont are not the entire country. But Mr. Chairman, that's the whole point. The, this is what's going on, folks, at home. If you're trying to figure this out, if you're scratching your heads, you're seeing the video, you see droves of people, 2.4 million people coming over the border illegally, the president allowing, the Democrats in charge of Congress are allowing it, the deal is they're gonna turn them into voters. You just heard it. They don't have any problem with that, they celebrate it. Here's the deal, we have a problem with it, the Constitution has a problem with it, American elections should be decided by American citizens. That's it. That's what, that's what this is about. That's why we're jumping up and down and screaming, my friends on the video who are commenting about this. That's why we're so upset, because our constituents are, 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 are frightened that we are losing our country. We're losing our security, we're losing our sovereignty, because we're gonna allow people from 160 different countries around the world to come in here and decide our elections. That's it, here it is on record, you all heard it. I'm out of time, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, who seeks recognition? I do. What purpose does Mr. Bishop seek recognition? I'd like the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Um, you know, I, I guess the thing that strikes me is the folks who said in the majority in favor of this bill that it's about the rule of law. But think about the, where, how the rule of law is applying or not applying in the situation we're talking about. You have millions of people entering the country without a legal entitlement to do so, primarily on the pretext that they have an asylum claim to be adjudicated, that everyone knows by virtue of experience, maybe 15% will succeed. And so you see this, all this deluge and people coming in, massive resources, you talk about resources on immigration, Ms. Lofgren, they're expended facilitating the inrush of people whose right to be here has not been established. And those people come in and they stay essentially permanently because the system, the way it rolls out in the removal proceedings, once you have the administrations, the Democratic administrations over time say we're not going to set any priority. You know, like Matt Gates made the point, you've got a million two who have a final order of, of removal. They've had all their rights adjudicated. They're supposed to be removed and they will never be removed. It is a, a multi-year, multi-decade, continuous process of sabotage of the rule of law. It's not that it's, 
you know, this idea, immigration system is broken. We need to fix it by, letting, by making everybody legal who comes in at any numbers without any control. That would fix it, according to the majority's view. It would not fix it. It is, and I know that it was one of the things very striking to me a, week, a few weeks ago, Mr. McClintock had the, had the temerity to say something about the desire to assimilate migrants, and the majority went berserk. Most people, you know, five or ten people spoke about how outrageous it would be that they be assimilated. And I, I think you're putting your own twist on what that means. The question is, do you want the conditions in Mexico and in El Salvador, Honduras, and the, do you want those to prevail here? I, I, you know, even the question of voters, I, I, that, the question is, is if you have sufficient numbers come in, without any control or any process that you are importing those conditions to be the conditions of the United States. Why, why would that be the objective? I do not know. But, when you're, and, but I think those who talk about now taking the situation as bogged down as it is and overwhelmed by design, this takes it another step in the direction of hopelessly bogged down. No one has, the one thing that has been said is you'll take the executive branch, which under the Constitution has, it's, it's, you know, it's, is it the apogee or perigee? Which one's the highest? Apogee, I think. The apogee of power of the, of the federal, of the executive branch is in dealing with foreign policy, including immigration, circumstances under which people will enter. Mr. Biggs made that point, I think. But you want to say that, well, we can't, that's meddling for the executive branch to be involved in any kind of decisional process about the implementation of this in the way it's been done, including the use of the, by the Attorney General of, uh, of um, Certification Authority. Uh, since Lyndon Johnson, every president's done it. Presidents have administered this law. The solution that's proposed will bog it down more. So you've talked about that one objective to, to, to strip away that, quote, meddling but not one point has been made about how this will expedite, how this will clear the backlog, how it will speed up the removal of people who enter the country illegally. Um, I just, you know, that, that, that is what I just, you, you, can, you can say many things. You can say um, you want the borders to be open, that you want the border to be erased. You believe that will be good for mankind. You believe it's reparations or whatever it is that, that, that uh, ideologically drives you to that point. You cannot say it is because you favor the rule of law because it takes you farther away from the, from the laws that exist, the INA, from being enforced according to its terms. That seems to be the single-minded objective at every point of every step taken and I would say, I don't, I mean, I don't see this law, this bill becoming law. It's not going to get through the Senate, thank goodness. And, um, and heaven help us. I hope that there will be somebody who comes to power who wants the law to prevail. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? To strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. I agree with my friend from... Louisiana, that it's been a very long day and unnecessarily one of the members on their side of the aisle called for 22 votes, not because the bills were important and deserved a floor vote, but I guess to 